미쳤는데요? 와. 내가 빌드 존슨을 존슨 그 이상의 것을 만들어 왔습니다. 잘한다라는 표현을 너무 경이롭기도 했는데. 취재. 뭐라도. 아. 한명으로 쓰러지지 않습니다. 이 취재. 짜임새 있고 더 현실성 있는 그러면서 스킬을 높은 새로운 빌드를 보여주는 모형들입니다. 시네마틱을 시네마틱일 뿐. Semi-finals. Gumiho. Dark. Africa TV. Freak Up Studio. Live. 2023. Hey, GSL Season 2. Hey, I feel amazing. This is it. We are here in the round of four, and then, of course, the finals of season two of the GSL. Uh, three Terrans, one Zerg, no Protosses unless you're counting casters. So, <laughs> yeah, please man. have Protoss representation in somehow here. Yeah, we'll see if Dark can make it through. It's been a very Terran-dominated year, the GSL, so far in season one. We had an all-Terran top four here in season two. Three Terrans and one Zerg. Dark, the only non-Terran player able to break it into the semifinals so far this year, which is crazy to me. Yeah, and again, GSL has been, for many, many years, uh, a tournament where Zergs tended to come out on top. Uh, Terrans, at times, would would rise to the top. Protosses did have their moments, absolutely, but um, right now, and, and for this whole year, really, it's been a story about Terrans. Now, if there was a, a, a Zerg who could advance, I would say Dark is our guy. He's only got one matchup to prep for. At the same time, though, the three Terrans we have are very different and very scary. Yeah, it seems like viewer prediction. Almost half of all viewers expect Mara to walk away with his seventh GSL championship trophy. It's a lot on the line, man, but Maru, he's been looking to be in great form. He's won, I think, back-to-back -back GSL Code S's, just looking absolutely incredible. You know, might have another Terran champion. I think the odds are we will. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think, look, Maru, if you had to pick somebody, he's a very safe bet, right? He's won the most GSLs. He's been the most consistent over time. He's not really struggled in the matchup TVT, although we did see in the finals of IEM. Uh, with Oliveira that I don't know what happened there, yeah. but it seemed like Oliveira basically solved him, at least for that evening. Um, but against other Korean Terrans, he hasn't had so much of a hard time. Um, but the other two Terrans, Gumiho and Kira, have really brought it to the next level, are really approaching the game uh, in their own way. And Dark has proven time and time again that if given enough time, he can cobble together a style that's going to be able to compete with that. Now, uh, this GSL and probably all the GSLs from here on out, will not be possible without viewer support. Absolutely, crowdfunding really makes the world of StarCraft Esports go around, not just here at the GSL, but around the world as we have raised $26,974 in total. That's across Patreon and Africa TV. If you guys want to contribute up to $30,000, all of that goes 100% to the players, to the prize pool. Anything in excess of that, it rolls over to the next season, the next GSL. That's right. And this is really the way, you know, not just of GSL here, but of, you know, everything I think to come in, in content is, you know, um, reliance on viewership support. Um, and so your support is appreciated. Um, you can also go to, whether it's Patreon or Afrika TV with star balloons there, uh, it's appreciated. So here's what our bracket is looking like now. Um, you can see here, Gumiho versus Dark is how we're gonna begin the evening. Uh, we're going to move after that to Cure versus Morrow. Take the winner of the two uh, of each of those best of fives and then move on to a best of seven finals. 
Yeah, and it should be a very action-packed day. We have the GSL Season 1 rematch in match number two this evening, and then Gumiho facing off against the only Zerg, Dark. You know, most of the time I would say, I would look at this stat sheet and I'd be like, okay, Dark is probably going to be favored here, but Gumiho has been looking so good. In this season in particular, he just looks absolutely solid in TBT and TBZ. He's coming through with these unpredictable builds. His mechanics seem solid. His decision-making is even baffling opponents like Maru occasionally. And with how successful it's able to work, and I just can't wait to get into this action. We are going to have an interview now with each of these players. Uh, it'll be conducted by Castro Park. He says, hello, boys. They say hello. Firstly, Gumiho. In the last match in the round of eight, you were unable to come to the studio due to the flooding here in Korea. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So I was a little bit caught off guard when I got to the train station and I realized, oh, all the, um, the trains are closed. I booked my ticket one day earlier. Uh, in the fight itself, I think I played pretty well. I was comfortable being at home. Uh, he mentions it's going to be much more fair today. Uh, so anyways, going up against Dark, I've lost, I think, a dozen games versus him. From the previous matchup, I think I've had a little bit of time uh, to try to uh, come up with something, so I think my playing's gone well. Over to you, Dark. What are you thinking about being surrounded by Terrans? I think Terran have at least more than 300 builds. So he'll have to pick five out of those 300 builds. <laughs> Are you saying there's slim chances you'll make it to the finals? Yeah, I think my chances are low. But your head-to-head -head record is far superior to Gumiho's. What are you talking about? Well, I would say that the previous scores are irrelevant. My record against him has been pretty good, but right now it's, he's Terran. Um, it changes the game entirely. So you said today is the day you're going to defeat Dark Umiho, as long as your builds pan out. Any thoughts on that? So. I'm not as confident facing off against Dark. When Dark evaluates me that way, and he's whining like this, he's normally not a player who, who com complains like that. So I'm a little caught off guard to see him talking like that. Dark, you're the leader of Zerg. Is it really that hard to play against Terran? This is just the beginning, I'm telling you. <laughs> this is just 10% of my ability to whine. Let's talk about TVZ balance for a second. What are your thoughts on the matchup in general, Kumiho? <laughs> Zergs are being babies and whining. It's not that hard. I was watching the Africa TV's Champions Cup. This balance is not that much for Zerg. I don't know why they're complaining so much. And we, before we, anyways, before we wrap this interview, any um, thoughts, closing thoughts, excuse me. Gumi has already started uh, his mind game with the builds on these maps, but I'm not going to fall for that. Anyways, I'm going to focus on my game and bring my very best. And Gumiho, any words to the fans or to Dark? I've worked really hard. Although my opponent's Dark, I do want to say he's such a great Zerg player. I hope I can execute my strats uh, as planned. Cheer for me. All right, good luck. They say thank you. And we're back. 
Wow. Spicy interview right there. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I do want to point out, like, you know, this is, you know, the first time in almost a decade Zerks aren't crushing, and they're like, you know, mm -hmm. the tears are real. But, yeah. um, he, you know, I, it's like I see both sides of it. I really do, right? I mean, Zerg have won so many GSLs, uh, and it does seem like overall, I'd say in the last, let's take the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. Last four years, five years. It's been a lot of Zerg domination from a wide range of Zergs. And they, even the ones that aren't right at the top, there's been plenty of Zergs to kind of fill in the cracks. Uh, with the few Protosses and Terrans we've had. But 2023 is a whole new era of Terran. Real Terran domination. Terrans playing in very different styles. Terrans um, getting really complex mid games and, and creating opportunities we didn't really see in the game before. I mean, this is what makes RTS, in my opinion, the best genre of games is that the game itself ages like a fine wine. Uh, there's more we learn about it. There's new things to discover and, and new ways to transform yourself as a player. Uh, I don't think this is going to be easy for Dark, and I rarely say that. Uh, anytime he's in the, the round of four, I've watched this guy cast uh, and survive so many different players and so many so many different scenarios and maps. But I'll tell you, man, the Terrans today, and especially this one, Gumiho, he's his own breed of Terran. It's very hard to even practice against somebody to prep for this. And Gumiho has shown he's got a very, very wide range of play styles. I think he has the widest range of any Terran player that we have here in the GSL by a lot. This guy yeah, can go by him and go special, mech. I'd say. It does feel that way. And he's in such great form right now. I feel like if this one is going to go Dark's way, it's going to go all the way to map number five. 2023 GSL Season 2. KZ Gaming, Dark. No way. No way. <laughs> Look at this waypoint oh taste. Oh, my list. God. I mean, there are a couple different Serious. scouting patterns that you it, can take with that Overlord. <laughs> this time he moved his Overlord <laughs> like it's a giant knight on a chessboard. <laughs> He's moving in a big <laughs> yeah, L right yeah. across the map. Straight to the barracks. Yeah. And he is not going to reveal to Gumiho that he's aware of this either. So Gumiho right now, he doesn't know, but he will very soon. That Dark has scouted this out. And look how this is timed out where the drones are going to come right when it's like, well, you're never going to finish this barracks. Yeah, there there is a very tight angle, which I think the SCV has been able to. Oh, no, they actually no. can go behind that. You can go behind oh, those no. uh, into the trees. It's so <laughs> th this is literally the worst thing that can happen as a proxy because the fact that you delayed it that much mm -hmm. uh, means the second barracks has started that much later. Really good read here by Dark. We've seen in other games, I think not even just in this matchup, I think we've seen some Protoss' hide stuff in that area, that that's like a really tempting proxy spot. And so the fact that he made his knight uh, chess move with the Overlord mm -hmm. down to scout through there and then beeline across the map, that's a big punish. So we're going to see uh, Gumiho basically trying to recover here. I don't know that Dark has to necessarily go for a punish. Uh, one might look at this and see that the barracks is canceled and think, well, you need to, like, uh, parlay this into an attack. I don't think you necessarily do. I think you can just drone up uh, more comfortably and know that the threat of Reapers is is later, even if that's of, of all the threats that could happen, and it is going to be that. But squeezing out a few extra drones and defending a little bit later is going to be nice. Yeah, it's such a smart play by Dark there, too. I think it was Ryung versus Solar where we saw a similar proxy on this map. Exactly, and Solar went for a different scouting pattern and was able to find that barracks. Now Gumiho decides to mix it up from what Ryung did earlier on at the GSL. Wasn't able to get any luck with it, though. Just immediately scouted by that first Overlord coming up from Dark. So Dark, off to a great start, but Gumiho, he's already begun the second Factory Tasteless. We're going to get a taste of mech here in game number one. Yeah, and this is a cool recovery play. Notice that he's got... Oh, closing up! He's got the factory <laughs> on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So he's showing that he has uh, factory tech up, but the fact that the second factory 
is tucked inside the main is kind of a cool little touch to the build because you know seeing one factory that's not shocking that's not crazy right uh there's plenty of games where you can get a factory up especially after the the proxy racks is killed right you need to swallow mm -hmm. in immediately with something but the idea that this can kind of cover for a mech play is pretty smart yeah it's really cool and i wonder exactly what kind of mech gumiho is going to bring out with this one i believe a tech lab has wow. now started and with the barracks flying like this Especially against Gumiho, I think Dark now has a very clear idea of what he should be suspicious about. Hey, this is a pretty good pull away, because the only way to kill that now is to have the barracks fly out even further, and how far mm -hmm. do you want to actually go? Yeah. Oh, Dark coming into the natural. Does see that Hellions are popping out. Blue He's Flame has started here, and a Siege Tank too, so it's not going to be Battle Mech. Yeah. We don't usually see Blue Flame He's start this a, early. He's going to do a TVP push from StarCraft 1, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what this is. It's going to be tanks and Hellions. He's going to throw down He's some mines. He's going tanks, yeah. <laughs> get some spider mines in your set. Um, so, uh, I, I don't feel like I've seen quite this variation in a while, man. Yeah, like, I, I haven't I don't, seen. I can't think of a game, in, like at least in this year, the year before, where it's like tanks and um, Blue Flame Hellion. Doesn't look like it's necessarily a commitment because the third command center starts up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think this is anything that's going to line up for a push. This is just Gumiho going to be, this is going to be Gumiho trying to get some harassment done with these Hellions with Blue Flame as that makes it a lot more difficult for the Zerg player to actually navigate the harassment effectively and not take too much economic damage. And behind that, just, you know, kind of play defensively back at home, adding in siege tanks, adding in that third command center. And it should be a nice long game. And Dark doesn't know exactly what he's setting up for right now. He's setting some spore crawlers on each expansion, not just the main and the third, but the natural as well. So he's trying to prepare for every circumstance, but really it's going to come down to whether these first Hellions are able to find much damage. And Aspire, actually, the tech now coming out from Dark. Now, Gumiho, he is already beginning his third factory and an armory. So, you know, Thors, they are in the cards here. Yeah. Those could be mixed in very easily here by Gumiho. Yeah, it seems like the Hellions are really just more for, um, you know, trying to mow down creep and, and keep the Zerg controlled here. But oh. yeah, the, oh, he's going to dive in. And yeah, we'll see what damage Gumiho is able to find. Actually playing this very conservatively. A lot of respect shown for Dark as he came in there at that angle. Gets two drone kills and pops right back out. Does not want to overextend and lose map control here. He's going to swing up here once more. Uh, he hasn't really seen much of the tech. I mean, you could spot a Banelings Nest. It doesn't tell you anything. And again, um, the big play is going to be the Spire tech. Now, you might be saying, um, well, Spire tech has been pretty typical in this matchup, even when they don't mech. So is it really that much of a surprise? I don't know. We don't see it as much against, you know, me mech is sort of a weird approach. Um, we'll have to see how truly ready Terran is. I don't see turrets down here. And again, Gumiho's mech has always been sort of its own brand of mech. I think he has a very good read on what Dark is doing, even though he hasn't scouted it exactly, though, because he's already started two Thors extremely early tasteless. We almost never see this, and some missile turrets are being constructed in the main base of Terran as well, so when these Mutalisks come across the map, they're going to have a lot of anti-air to deal with. I would be surprised if they got very much done at all. Yeah, this is going to be really interesting. Um, I, and I think you're right, State. It looks like he's actually basically ready to blind counter it. He doesn't see like anything else on the map that's a threat. And so why not just get the um, uh, the Thors out here? Is, is there any medevac? Yeah, there is. So wait, he can basically oh. board these around. So it's funny. It's like there are no turrets really, uh, or almost none. I guess there's one or two that have been made, but basically he could just move these around and wherever the threat is, he just answers it immediately. Yeah, this is a nice play coming out of Gumiho. Those shots already connecting. A lot of damage done to those Mutalisks. It seems like just Gumiho knew what was going to come, regardless of whether or not he actually scattered it. And so Dark now is going to have to make a transition. He's throwing down the Roach Warren. He's adding in three additional hatcheries. One of those already finished up. Oh. And these Bailings coming into the third base. Gumiho reacts, but a little bit late. So nine SCVs are going to fall. Yeah, big victory there from Dark. I think, one, you know, the first real engage we've had that, that's had something substantial happen. Um, Gumiho is just going to continue to crank out more and more mech here. It does look like he's going to be setting up for a push. Dark is about to go up to five bases. So Dark's getting to where he needs to be. The Mutas are shut down again, not able to get really anywhere. And the fact that Gumiho finds those lings that were about to be Banes is a good sign, too. 
Yeah, Gumiho is building his fifth and sixth Thor right now, Tasteless. He only has two Siege Tanks on the field. This is an almost exclusively Hellion Thor composition that he's running here. Very interesting take on Mech. I was not anticipating this coming in, but it's worked very well so far. Dark finally able to clean up those pesky Hellions, but I think we are in for a longer game unless Dark is able to find a way to actually break through the defenses of Terran because, you know, Gumiho is powering up with this incredibly supply efficient army composition. I mean, you think of Thors and how many resources they cost, coupled with siege tanks and the defensive structures that Gumiho has set up ho at home. I don't even know if this Roach Bust at max against a 140 supply Terran is going to be able to get too much done. Yeah, it might be going up against the wrong units. Um, so he hits the turret, uh, you know, but immediately the Thors are going to be over here. And again, every time these mutas take damage, they're so close to being killed off. That's so much damage it's coming so in. so much gas. To, you know, you lose two or three mutas. That's a lot of gas here. Um, the attack's going to come in. It seems like the spread is pretty good. I feel like I've never quite casted this comp of units fighting each other, so let's see how this goes. Yeah, attack's coming in right now. Some really nice dropship micro on the Thors so far. Only one of them has fallen as the Biles come in. Not really able to connect with a lot of these Thors. SCBs are falling in the third base, but Gumio has been able to dispatch the majority of Dark's forces on the north side. But there is a remax of 25 roaches coming. Yeah, you can see that with the medevacs, you can micro the Thors pretty nicely. Oh, well, wow. well, never mind. As I was saying that, uh, several biles connect. I actually think Dark's about to end the game here. Yeah, he might um, be. Keep I in thought... mind, factory units are made a lot slower than, than uh, Ling roaches. And there are so many red uh, Thors here. He needs to repair those Thors badly right yeah, now. Yeah, he needs to get like every SCV he has and repair that because if he loses, you know, the next four Thors, I, I think the game does in fact end. Yeah, this might just be it. GG, GG that's called. It. And I really thought Gumiho was gonna have a chance to hold on there, but those Biles were absolutely huge. I think they connected with two Thors at a time there on the top side, and their yeah. health just went from almost a full meter to down close to zero. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I, I did <laughs> I did say before the fight happens that I've never quite seen these comps fight. Like, yeah, it was interesting. Thor, and there were like a couple of hell bats on the ground and a tank here or there. Again, some Yudas and Lings and, and Roach Ravager. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's a different approach, but that doesn't mean that Dark can't come up with the answer, and that's exactly what he did. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to gauge exactly what the kill potential is there from Dark, is. He absolutely threw me off, but that was just an excellently timed push. Gumiho trying to mix things up a little bit there in game number one, going for a very Thor-heavy mech composition after his proxy two barracks did not work. We'll see what he comes out here with game number two. He said that his prep felt good, and certainly he has cooked up some very interesting builds, but yeah, what's it going to be on Royal Blood? Well, it needs to be something better, and it certainly can't be something that's spotted as quickly as that scout from Dark. That really all goes back to that scout from Dark. I don't know what the game would look like had uh, Gumiho Strat um, panned out, but it would not have been like the game we just saw, for sure. ESL Season 2. KZ Gaming, Dark. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Look where the Overlord's <laughs> going! Oh no! Look at that rally point. Oh my god. We'll take some serious balls to try this twice, but you know, this is a crazy backfire. And look, you know, I bet Dark's gonna pull away immediately. Uh huh. It's gonna just be the same reaction, I think, from the from the previous time go. and for the vision range here on this overlord, that's gonna be an easy scout. Does he pull Dark. Away in time? Oh actually did he? Oh he's pulling the three drones, so I think Gumiho might yeah. actually be able to barely glimpse that overlord. <laughs> crazy this is happening twice in a row, and crazy that well, hold on. Does, it's getting scouted does instantly the barracks once again. actually finish? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's he can't be stopped. It should. Okay. Well, 
Okay, we do have a different game here. I thought initially. <laughs> Thank I guess goodness. The, I guess the placement of the barracks, it's very deliberate, right? It's far enough away that even if you spot a three drones, drones, excuse me, can, um, you know, just end the, the rush entirely. Yeah, it is a significant further distance than previously. And actually, look at this back at home. It's even a different follow-up. Keep in mind that in game number one, it seemed like Gumiho was really gunning to go for this two barracks opening. But here in game number two, immediately following this up with a factory. So perhaps Reaper Hellion coming out very early here for Gumiho. Bunker Rush as well. This is an interesting opening. And that Dark has been extremely good at holding these rushes. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times these rushes, it's not really about ending the game outright. It's about... Um, you know, crippling the Zerg enough to where it's a very, very difficult mid-game into late game. Uh, pretty good oh. surrounds. All right, it does manage to get <laughs> down. I was going to say, if he could actually get the damage off and kill that, that would have really messed up the rush entirely. We've got a queen about to hatch here uh, as a natural, and that's going to make it impossible for the um, Reapers to have too much sustain. Yeah, Reaper's probably not going to get too much more done. And um, I like that play by Gumiho throwing down the barracks. Or not the barracks, excuse me, the bunker at the natural expansion and then canceling it. I think that he was trying to throw Dark off and make it difficult for Dark to gauge exactly how committed this was going to be on the ground. And perhaps be a lower tech push, right, with Reapers and, you know, just amping up the pressure in that way. But instead, Hellion follow up here from Gumiho. So he forced a couple more lings out from Dark than perhaps Dark would have liked to make because he had a respect the potential for that rush. And now back at home, Gumiho going for a third command center. Okay, so Ooh. we have the, um, oh no, not actually the first drone kill here. The Hellions, the Reaper, doing a decent amount of damage. The Queen does have a little bit of sustain. The Orange Queen is microed away. The Reaper, which soaked a lot of the damage up. Okay, first drone kill. Soon to be maybe second drone kill, let's see. Dark's okay. doing a good job of blocking that ramp, and now with so many of these units just oh. falling right here. The zoning by the links is that was so sick. clutch. Yeah. Only one Reaper is going to survive. Is Gumiho maybe a little bit over ambitious? I'm sorry, was it dive? Like maybe one or two drones were killed back there, right? Two drones. So, you know, it's not a lot. Fortunately, he stops that Link from scouting. But, you know, it does seem like Dark has kind of shut this down. And he had that drone hidden down here at the third. Mm -hmm. That was long before this rush really started. But, um, <laughs> He was able to get that hatchery set up, but it was never slowed down. Fusion Core now in production, Tasteless. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, Gumiho kind of, uh -oh. well, whoa! Oh, no, traffic jam. <laughs> oh, my God. The, the Reapers started to ping pong off each other. And he's bleeding he units. Got, yeah. I got to say, um, you know, I thought each of these best of fives was going to be pretty long, as in it was going to go into, like, each one was going to be hours. Mm hmm it's possible the way that this series is looking that this could be a short one. Gumio is having a very hard time. Yeah, he really hasn't gotten too much done with these Hellions and Reapers. And part of that is Dark with Immaculate scouting both in game number one and game number two. But also just Dark's responses have been so clutch. I mean, this Reaper's gonna come back into the main base and not even get one more drone, so. Gumiho, this is kind of a tough situation for me. Invested all these resources into Hellions, into Reapers, and I mean, he doesn't have much to show for it. He got some Lings forced out from Dark, and yes, he did kill a good number of Lings, but obviously no Queen kills. I think in total he had two, maybe three drones go down over the course of this game. The third hatchery yeah. also was not very delayed by Zerg, and behind all of that, Gumiho was really slow in settling, settling up his natural expansion. So his economy is lagging behind the Zergs. And although this is not the committed all-in style of battle cruiser play that we saw from Young against Solar earlier on in GSL, it is just one starport BC into a third command center. Still, you have to wonder exactly whether Gumiho is going to be able to get too much more done here because Tempo absolutely favoring Dark right now. Yeah, and especially with battle cruiser builds, a, a lot of it is entirely hinged on Tempo. Mm -hmm. You know, the complexity of the rush, it, it is manageable at high levels, right? I like that it, that's just set of vision, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is something that if the Zerg has built up enough momentum, they can kind of deal with it. We've got some drones being killed. And you can see the battle cruiser is basically roaming at this point in time. We have the Hellions coming up. They're going to go for some drone kills. Really good split. 
Yeah, very nice split there by Dark. I like the move by Gubiho as well. He knows that he's drawn the Queens into the natural expansion, so that opens up this opportunity here, and that adds on a good number of more drone kills, going all the way up to eight now. Second battle cruiser also underway. Dark is throwing down a Spire to get some Corruptors to try and deal with this, but Gubiho, he's already transitioning out of it, back into Bio. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the Bio's not that crazy of a switch, right? I mean. I know he's gotten mech in the previous game, but a lot of times PC builds. I think that if you try to go PC into mech, you just don't get a lot done. Mm -hmm. And the Zerg can really kind of take whatever they, they want on the map here. Uh, the Roaches come in, obviously, with a siege tank there. You got to back up. Yeah, more Roaches underway. As with the second battle cruiser coming out. Okay, production does not stop. I was wondering whether Gumiho was going to go up to a third one. I would imagine this is going to be the last PC that we see, the one that's under production right now, but. But, you know, it, it really has not accumulated the kind of kills and damage we would have hoped for, mm -hmm. if we're looking at this from the Terran perspective. Um, usually, BCs come in much earlier uh, and do a lot more, and they've already taken several swings into the Zerg by the point that we're at this uh, moment in the game. <sighs> Keep in mind that when you rush into all these other units, basically anything that's not Marines, nice kills on the two queens, whenever you make anything that's not um, bot, like the, the Marine, the Medivac, all that. When you delay that, it's less of your core army later on. And so you have less muscle on the map to directly push the Zerg around. Most of what the Terran relies on, and we're seeing it here now, is this harass. If the, if the Battlecruisers stayed and fought their ground, they would be killed off. And so they're trying to roam, they're trying to take whatever hits they can. Oh my god! Okay, he's gonna get out of there in time. <laughs> You're but, traumatized for the young games earlier. I know, I know, I really, I really am. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, now with uh, Corruptors out, I mean, how much more can you get done with this? Yeah, it feels like the time where the BCs are going to have a lot of uh, utility is pretty much gone besides defensively here, right? I mean, maybe Gumiho can go for some very sneaky play since he was able to clear the Overlords up with that Viking earlier in the game. You know, try to maneuver them around the map and keep that teleport just in case the Corruptors catch them, but it's not the kind of high-impact play that's going to be really netting a lot of returns here for Terran. And you know, I was interested too that Dark, before he started those Corruptors, he queued up I think five or six Mutalisks and then had to cancel them. So maybe a little bit of indecisiveness there from Dark because he's trying to get a bit of a read on exactly what Gumiho is going for. And he got to think that with the defensive setup that Gumiho has back at home now with Yamato cannons, with missile turrets, with Marines on the ground, these Corruptors shouldn't be able to get too much damage in. You know, the battle cruisers they should be able to be repaired. They should be able to be defended here by the forces on the ground. But you notice that we're seeing defensive warps. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of a resource of its own, the warp. Oh. And so the fact that he's warping away to not die to Corruptors means that he's not going to be getting anything else done on the map. Um, and Zerg is actually about to max out again. He's going to take <laughs> out the Central Tower. This is so funny. And he yeah. actually gets away without even taking a single bit of damage. But this means this attack is going to blindside uh, Gumiho. Gumiho is rapidly growing, but Dark has finished growing. The only thing Dark wants to grow right now is Larva so he can refill and max out again in this attack. Yeah, and Gumiho might just be dead here. That's a lot yeah. of Corruptors right now, 13 in the skies. Those should be able to deal with the Battle Cruisers as the Roaches and Lings and Ravagers also come in on the ground. Biles popping the Siege Tank, that one falls. There aren't too many more Siege Tanks to be found either as the SCVs are frantically trying to repair these, SC these Battle Cruisers, but there's too much targeting coming in from the Corruptors. A BC falls. And this third base is all but forfeit, and I don't think Gumiho with his Remax is gonna be able to stabilize very well here. I mean, that's so much damage done. Yeah, I mean, this appears to be too much. The last Battlecruiser is gonna fall. Oh, hold on, maybe the SCD is actually can repair it. I stand corrected. Yeah, but, but the, the next wave, once it comes in, I'm very concerned about Gumiho right now is, he does have two factory siege tank, and that might be the saving grace, but with only one siege tank on the ground here at that third, you gotta think the splash damage there really isn't too much to be found from Terran. And once Dark comes in again, it might just be too much to hold on. So, yeah, I mean, right here, again, the tank count was thinned out. The battle cruisers, there's just one at play right now, and that may drop to zero in a second. Before it even does, GG is called Dark now. Wow. Almost done. Now, we started the show at six. Uh, you know, look, I'm not going to lie, guys. TVZ, TVT, they're long matchups. I think all these matchups coming into this tonight look pretty even on paper. Even if you were confident that maybe your favorite player was going to win, I think you'd be nuts to say a 3-0. Uh, 
We've been live for 35 minutes. Dark is smashing Gumiho. Gumiho, his his openings, which are hinged a little bit on surprise, are getting spotted. When Dark isn't able to stop them outright, it doesn't matter because Dark can stop them as they are in action. Um, and I don't know what Gumiho could do to come back. I mean, this may be a story of hubris here as, you know, the confidence of Gumiho to try the proxies twice. He's look, not looking confident, mm. by the way, right now. Uh, it's not paid off anyways, what he's tried. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to see a little bit more conservative play coming out from Gumiho here in game number three. As it's match point, Dark one map win away from booking his ticket to the grand finals. GSL season two. He sent out two SCVs. But wait, this might not necessarily be a proxy Rex. Oh my god, I think it is. Yeah, I thought Dark. maybe there was some kind of opening. Again, you know what's Gumi Ho? I, I do a lot more guessing. <laughs> yeah. You know what he's gonna do, but I thought maybe it's something where he wants to try to like <laughs> check for the hatchery right away. Like we see a lot of Protosses do versus Zerg. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Taze, if, if we build the barracks here, there's no way the yeah. overlords are going to really spot a, it. Yeah, there's just really a story of where do you hide the barracks. And we're going to get to the bottom of that before we get to the finals. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool yeah. me twice, shame on me. Fool me thrice, I didn't go to the finals of GSL. <laughs> uh, I, I hope Gumiho gets a little bit more out of this than he was able to get in game number one and game number two. Gumiho support here. Say Jettison Keem? Were they calling somebody handsome? I missed you that was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's going to do it again. My concern here is not whether or not this is found, because it can't be found unless a drone was going to scout. And the way this map is shaped, it's like too far out. You're just not going to find it. My concern is that Dark already kind of stopped what this build was already. I mean, we'll mm -hmm. see if there's a different idea at play. One thing to note is that in the interview, Dark did say it seems like Terran has over 300 builds. I kind of agree with that lately. Especially Gumiho. Gumiho absolutely has over 300 yeah, he, builds. Well, most Terrans have 300. He seems to have like 400. Mm. He seems to really kind of, um, if you can imagine it, you can do oh. it. We've got some young gamers in the audience. Welcome, guys. Are they cheering for Maru? That might be coming up pretty soon. That's right. <laughs> get this pre-show out of here and get Maru on the stage. So again, it's the Reaper coming in here. The Reaper, by the way, you know, this this is, I guess you can call it a pro I, I want your thoughts on this. I call it, sometimes we say a proxy because we see it in the middle of the map. It's not that close though. I would still just call it a proxy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's built outside your main base in an effort to try and close the distance between where it's built and the rally point, like to your opponent's right. base. But yeah, yeah, it is kind of funky. It's not quite a mock like it's not a Makarax. It's not like in the natural, right. like, <laughs> hidden behind the mineral line in 2011. But um, whoa, 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 whoa! Oh wow! I'm worried for Gumiho right now. Maybe he's able to defend this one, but uh, Dark in game number one and game number two was able to eke out a tempo advantage in both of those games. Now here in game number three, Gumiho did not commit as much. Oh my God, Roach Ward! He did not commit as much to the early game harassment. But it felt like game number one, game number two, Gumiho did not respect the aggression from Dark. He played a little bit, you know, too close for comfort. And both times he got greed checked by Dark with these max Roach pushes. And now with Dark scouting this incredibly fast third CC right after the factory. Yeah. Dark is pulling the trigger yet again. That Roach Warren's already coming down. Third hatchery is underway. But at that point, I mean, it's basically just for Larva for the reinforcing Lings, right? And Gumiho, I'm worried that he's going to be a little bit in the dark about this, and it might be a very quick 3-0. So, um, I feel like this whole series, there was a period in martial arts where, you know, they had all the different martial art forms, and they hadn't really interacted with each other, and people were like, which one's the best? Is it Tai Chi? Is it Judo? Is it... Um, and it turns out some were way better than others. I feel like that's what we're seeing right here with this, where it's like, <laughs> is it, is it, you know, Gumiho's crazy 
uh, Tai Chi moves, or is it Dark's like straight up Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Oh, this is That's, this is the oh, worst case no, scenario, by the it's way. It's Blue Flame versus Hellions. Yeah, I mean Blue Flame against a Ravager Bust. <laughs> Two factory Blue Flame against a Ravager Bust. I, it will be it will do a great job of cleaning up the lings on the ground, but what's going to be the sustain here? Oh my goodness, I'm getting heart palpitations watching that CC lift up too. I know. Gumiho just does not know. It's gonna go right under his nose. Okay, he's gonna see it at the last second. Yeah, what does he start now? now? You can hit the um, tech lab. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the worst place to be upgrading anything here. Yeah, that stim pack absolutely going to get denied. And I think the roaches should be able to work their way in between these structures as well. As the vials are slowly coming in. Rio trying to buy as much time as he can here with this repair. Siege tank about halfway done. And the I mean, Hellions, they, they're doing a good job of catching the reinforcing links. So there yeah. might be a chance here for Gumiho. That's some excellent positioning there. Yeah. Stimpak does go down. Siege Tank should be almost completed. Finally, it's out. He's going to use these repairing SCVs uh, and their positioning to try to pelt them with the corrosive vials. The tank's out. The tank is the one hope of basically stopping the rush. Wow. Well, I mean, by on. the skin of his teeth, he might be able to hold on to this. Well, but there's a lot of links coming across the map here. What are those What are those Hellions doing right now? Okay, they're right by the third base. So it seems like they got dislodged from intercepting the reinforcements. And now all these links coming in. Let's see the Blue Flame Hellions try to do work. Yeah, he's going to hit these SCVs over to the side. The Blue Flame Hellions can't really help out. There is enough Ravagers. I think he can hit it with a corrosive vial if he gets in range. Yeah, one more vial will take down that siege tank. And GG's called oh Dark with God. a 3-0. Six minutes in game number three is okay. going to break down Gumiho. What? Some this was insane round killer of four, instinct. Two story players. It was over in 41 minutes. That's insane. And that includes like us interviewing the players on the stage. Um, I, I am stunned. I am shocked. Dark, by the way. I mean, he did it to Gumiho. Can he do it tomorrow or cure? I don't see why not. That was absolutely crazy. The speed with which Dark, Dark was able to dispatch Gumiho. Every single game going for a timing attack. It felt like all these builds Gumiho went for, you know, he never got anything done early on. He go, went for greedy plays as the follow-up, and he tried three different variants on it. Every single time was taken out. I We're going to find out in the interview, but I just want to say, I do wonder if some of this came down to Gumiho's confidence. There's something about the, the set of three builds he used here that seemed to... Uh, I don't know, it seemed like not very confident, uh, especially the third CC right away that was scouted. Um, I feel like we saw much more technical Gumiho before. Absolutely. But, you know, sometimes you get two players and people would say they're roughly the same, but when, when they play against each other, one always beats the other. Yeah, man, I had high expectations for Gumiho coming into the semifinals today. I thought he might be one of those players who just emerges victorious and takes the whole thing with the yeah. form that he was showing in the round of 16 and the round of 8. Just his TBT is absolutely impeccable. His TBZ seemed quite solid as well earlier on in the tournament. But, you know, his greed absolutely did get checked there by Dark in <laughs> one of the most stunning ways possible. I mean, that was like a speed run. It was so quick. Uh, I, I kind of can't believe it. I don't think we're going to have anything that short, no matter what, going forward. No way. The other TBT <laughs> has to be closer than that. Um, and, and really, it was in every game, Dark kind of, okay, you're going to do that, catches the fist, comes back around with a killing blow, Roach Ravagers, whatever else he needed, and pulled through. We're going to go to a break. We come back the other side of the round of four. Stay tuned.
우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 칠성 사이다 제로. 
마음껏 청량하자. 청량한 순간에 언제나 칠성사이다. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토켄 하시엑스 토켄 세미 파이널스 휴 마루 아프리카 TV 프리컵 스튜디오 라이브 2023 GSL 시즌 2 Welcome back, everybody. Up next, Pure versus Maru. Uh, if you're just now joining us and you're like, wait a minute, wasn't that the second best of five? <laughs> Was I late? No, you're right on time. Uh, Gumiho got smashed by Dark. Dark killed Gumiho so fast. I don't even feel like I'm warmed up. Normally, I feel yeah. like I get a couple games in. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like I'm gelling with the broadcast. We're already done with you know, the first best of five. I don't think the second one is going to be anywhere near as short. I don't think that's possible. Uh, honestly, everything Gumiho did backfired. I think he got way too abstract. Mm -hmm. I know he's a player that does play very differently. I think he needs to maybe keep it a mix of basic and um, complex. Anyways, we have an interview now with Kira and Maro. Caster Park says, hello, Kira, hello, Maro. They say hello back. Kira, your opponent is Maro. He is the player who was... Sorry, you were the one to be the run-up last season. How are you feeling? So, my goal is today, I'm very eager to beat him. I'm glad I'm going to face him in the semifinals. I want to play today without any regrets. So, up until now... You do seem to be stronger than last season. Is this true? Uh, I would say I'm a modified version of myself from last season. I also would say I have more confidence. Kira, you don't normally talk like this when we interview you. Did you find any weaknesses in Maro's play? Is that why you're confident? I would say Maro has some weaknesses. I'd say he's weaker than last season. He's still the best, though. Maro, over to you. He mentioned you're weaker than last season. How do you evaluate yourself? I don't see any difference. I think Kier's played well recently. So I can see that confidence there. Whoever wins the semifinals. Do you think he'll be the champion of the season? If Kier wins this match, yeah, I think he will be the champion. If I win, I think that I'll be the champion. Oh, then I'm not sure, excuse me. You saw Kier's amazing micro in the quarterfinals. He asked how he evaluated that. I said I think Beyond's control is better. <laughs> the crowd goes wild on that. <laughs> you hear what Maru said? He said Beyond's micro is better. How do, you how do you respond? I would agree with this opinion. <laughs> I can't deny that. The casters are going nuts, by the way. <laughs> Do you think whoever wins the semifinals will win the season? No comment. I'm going to focus on the semifinals first. Maru right now is my biggest opponent. That's all I can think about right now. Before we wrap up this interview, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything you want to say to each other or the fans? Honestly, I think Kira's performance has been stellar. But Sorry, guys. Kira just says I want to have a great match. And I hope I can show a great match for the fans here tonight. All right. Well, this is going to be a rematch from the previous season finals where Maru defeated Kira 
four to two. Should be a excellent one. I'm looking forward to it. I feel like Cure really has improved a lot there's something, this season over last season. Yeah, there's something supernatural about Cure's play. He has, I think, um, like all the Terrans, especially this season, it does seem like there's been a uh, ballooning of more build orders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whenever you see a lot more builds come to play, it could be hard to tell, like, okay, are these builds that just haven't been sorted yet and they're going to quickly become obsolete? Or is the whole race kind of evolved in, in, in as far as the player's understanding of the tools at their disposal and the ideas that can be at play if things are executed correctly? Um, and Cure is definitely one of those players. In fact, in some ways, he has looked like the scariest Terran. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, TVP in particular just is an absolute killer in that matchup, the best in the world, I would say, by far. But even his TVT and TVZ, I mean, he wouldn't have gotten that far in the last mm -hmm. season if he wasn't totally solid. Maro even acknowledged in the interview, like, yeah, you know, um, uh, Cure does look really good. And maybe Beyond's micro is better, but Beyond has his, you know, other problems with his play that he hasn't ironed out. Other wrinkles there he's got to iron out. Um, now, the one thing about Maru is that, like, if you were to, if you had to bet on a player in any GSL, it would be, it should be Maru. Yeah, this he's, guy just wins. He just wins more, G, literally he's won more GSLs than anybody else. He has been more consistent, even when he loses. Like, I know with IEM, people, like, talk a lot about how he lost to Oliveira. He still got to the finals, guys. Mm -hmm. He still killed everybody in his past. Like he's still wildly consistent. And a lot of that is is that in these big extended best of fives or best of sevens, he's usually able to figure the player's weaknesses out over the course of those games and wrap it up with a win. Now, Cure, uh, and I've said this a few seasons in the past few years, it does seem like he's brought the best version of himself. I think this is, again, another leveled up version. This is Dragon Ball Z, okay? To keep leveling up. It never ends. Um, so I think this is a tricker one to call. Normally I would chalk this one up tomorrow, especially after the you know the last encounter these two had. Um, but you know, I also thought I had a pretty good idea of how the Gumiho Dark match was gonna look and uh Yeah. What do we know, right? <laughs> I was thinking if Dark was gonna win that series, it would have to go to game five more or less. Yeah, but the me way too. that Gumiho's been playing, but Gumiho just got absolutely clobbered there in three quick games and uh, there appears to be an issue with Maru's headset, so we're going to send one of the tech yeah. people and I believe a ref as well to see. It seems like he's not what getting the issue uh, is the white noise that they, they they pump in there very loudly. I might add. Remember when we did <laughs> Taste's land party and I I got to finally play in the booth? <laughs> yeah. Dude, playing with white noise blasting your ear is so I weird. Hate it. it. So one of the ways we make sure the players don't hear each other is white noise is pumped into the headset. If you don't mm -hmm. know what a white noise is, you can go to YouTube and type in white noise. You can hear what it sounds like. It's like the static on a TV, basically. Yeah, or maybe these gray noise or brown noise. It's, it's something, all these noises. Yeah, and it's like, it's kind of like, an, it's a hard to describe noise, but it it kind of sounds like you're on an airplane. Yeah. Like when, when, when you're, um, and you're having a conversation, but when you're in air, you actually have to be like considerably louder. It's yeah. like that. Um, and so it might be the issue with the white noise, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, they, they pump that in very loudly, and it absolutely drowns out everything besides the headphones that you have in your ear, as well as your playing. So that's what actually carries the game sound. It's not the same thing. It has the white noise that has the, the game sounds in your ears, but yeah. it is distracting. I remember the first time that I, I played in like in a LAN in Korea, and they pumped that up, and I was like, I can't hear myself think like anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like I'm the kind of guy, when I was younger, I could always play with like music. And I play with music do well. personally. Yeah. I, I prefer to do it, but I, I notice that if I play without music, I'm just so much better. And white I should noise. probably try that too. I feel like it's true with me as well. But like white noise, there's just you know, it's just even though it's ambiguous noise, like it is truly just noise. It is really distracting. And I think finally the issue's been resolved. So I guess we're getting ready to go into game number one between Cure and Maru. One of these gamers will face Dark in the GSL Finals. White noise, that's the, what they call this casting desk over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> you and me. It's you and me, man. All right, guys, we're going to go into game one in this best of five. Club NV, Cure. On side gaming, Maru. Okay. 
is a matchup that I'm very interested in seeing how Cure performs right now because obviously his TVP is godlike and he's made very big strides in his TVZ over the course of, I want to say, the past year. Yeah. Where he's really become a much more well rounded player. And even in TBZ so far, this season was able to easily dispatch his opponents. We have a proxy Rex here in the, the middle of the map. But yeah. TBT, we haven't really gotten a taste of Cure too much these days, whether it be here in GSL Season 2 or in tournaments like uh, the, the Freaka Cup that just took place. And so it's kind of a question mark for me exactly where he stands as Maru does not have the third eye that Dark does and will go roaming on past this barracks. Unscouted. Yeah, this is the second barracks proxy. The first is um, positioned in the main. So <clears throat> when you scout cross spawn, you would never suspect there's another barracks right. on the map, just based off what the intel you've gathered. There's nothing that would give this away. Yeah, and I love that play by Kira too, also patrolling this SCV on the low ground so that should Maru come up with an SCV scout, he just walks up that ramp, builds a supply depot, and then Maru really has no idea what is coming his way. And so the idea with this is you're going to get uh, a certain number of Reapers. We'll see exactly uh, when uh, or what that number is and when they come in there. Uh, and you're going to try to hit Maru while he's in the middle of his development. And sometimes you get in and you just do enough damage that things spiral out of control. Other times we do see this parried perfectly. Um, but I, again, if, if you're Maru here, you may... Oh, hold on, he mm. spots this. Okay, so he knows. He has a few seconds to react, which is, might be all the time he needs. There is not a wall in over here, so there's not really any way to just straight up deny this. Oh, but that first Reaper got focused down so quickly, and the second Reaper is not going to be able to equalize with a kill. Oh, this SCV's out here. <laughs> Seems like that was a bad control group. Yeah, there's a little bit of barroom brawl with those two SCVs going at <laughs> it, but you got to think now with a one Reaper advantage that Kira should be able to find some damage done, but I don't think this is the kind of thing that could spiral all the way into the win, right? We basically need to see if Kira can get another critical kill on any of, of these one units. I we'll mean, the, see. the Marine's an obvious target because of how slow it is. Maru just trying to buy time, waiting for that second Hellion to come out as another SCV will fall. Oh, and that's a bad spawn right there on that Marine. Just instantly gets taken out. The grenade kills the follow-up Marine, too. So. so these Reapers all leave. But, you know, he's continuing to make Reapers. Um, don't count this out yet. Obviously, yeah. we all know the Reapers regen. Doesn't mean that you can't heal back at home here for Maru either, but, you know, it requires a little bit more manual effort. And Kira's going to loop around now over to this side where the command center is making. He could actually kill this SCV. That'd be a really nice, uh, easy, yeah, easy he, kill. He can one-shot SCVs right now, so it seems like that's going to be the priority here for Cure. And so many SCVs are falling for Maru. This is massive damage. Eight SCVs this early. Maru now down into the teens. 17 workers in total to the 26 of Cure. So much damage done. But keep in mind, that was a big investment from the Blue Terran player. Maru behind all of this has been teching up. One thing with Maru, I've seen so many games where something like this happens, and then he moves across the map and kills them. I'm not saying yeah. that's going to happen here, but it, it is a funny thing where you know, it's easy to look at that attack on its, on the surface and say, wow, that's a lot of dead workers, but forget that you also sacrificed all the Reapers to do that. But this little move I really like because this mutes the potential for Maru to have that counterattack because two Reapers come in and immediately more SCVs are being killed. Yeah, there's a Cyclone at home as well too, so Maru's going to be hard-pressed to find any damage. And there's really nothing rallying out of the production buildings here for Maru. This is devastating right now. Six more SCVs falling. Oh my god, this is going to be almost as many as were killed in the initial attack. He's down to 15. Kira has double the worker count right now. Are there any more Reapers on the map? They're not, right? I don't think oh, so. Oh, sick. wow. That's wow. insult to injury. <laughs> I mean, anything you can do. Yeah, it might seem inconsequential because there's so few SCVs. Like, you don't really need to saturate the mineral line. But that's, you know, basically one more SCV kill. That's one SCV worth of idle time on that command center on the low ground when Maru desperately needs all the worker production he can get. And I don't think that Maru is really going to be able to find that window to just kill his opponent in this game. The Reapers got way too much damage done. Cure his follow-up back at home with two Cyclones into his siege tank. It is a very safe one at that. You know, Maru, he is going to move across the map and try and get something done, but with a third Cyclone underway, and a Raven as well here for Cure. 
you got to think he's going to be able to hold on against this, right? I don't know that this is going to get much done. Now, I think Maro's, you know, generally pretty good at pulling out if it's not going to work mm -hmm. and not overextending and just, like, tanking a ton of damage. But, I mean, how are you going to get into that, right? You maybe could find an angle here with this Cloak Banshee, but here's already been banking scans. He's able to get the scout on this. Actually, a ton of damage done on that Banshee yeah. already. Bit of a trade there, but there's nothing to repair that Banshee unless he lands a mule, mm -hmm. whereas the Raven can just repair a gun. Dude, Cure is really looking scary here. And he's solid. I feel like not just these early game decision makings, which absolutely worked for him in this game, but his macro is so good. It seems like he always knows which army composition to follow up, whatever pressure he dishes out, whether it be in TVT, whether it be in TVZ or TVP. It feels like he has such a good understanding of so many Terran matchups right now. And you add that into a player that was already, you know, a force to be reckoned with in previous GSLs, and you get what might be a champion. He was thwarted by Maru in the previous season. Looking to be in a very commanding position here in game number one. Man, I can't believe how uh, totally hindered Maru is here. Cure. I mean, even in TVTs where there's a lot of back and forths and kills, it's usually a few minutes and the, the player catches up in SCVs. Mm -hmm. Right now, I mean, there's still about a 20% worker lead for Cure. Yeah, Mario is 13 workers down, and that is not going to get better. He needs to get economic yeah. damage done. A lot of times you can try to play catch up, and then there are weaknesses here or there in your play that you got to kind of figure out. But honestly, this is like one where it just seems like if Mario's going to catch up, it's going to be like a long time from now. And it's going to be after he thwarts a lot of plans from Cure. And the way that Cure's looking, and not just today, but kind of this whole season, he does seem to be really on top of everything he needs to do. So if you were to like show this game to any two pro gamers right now, pretty much all pro gamers would likely tell you, no, Cure wins from here. Yeah, but Mario seems like he's going for a composition to try and slow down the game a little bit. I think he might be going in the mech. He has no bio units on the ground. He's pumping two factory siege tank right now. And he did make an engineering bay, which had me wondering for a moment, but I, I really think that's just for turrets and perhaps a sensor tower, right? So he can go for mech, but the issue when you do go for mech is that it mm. takes longer to get what you need to do what you want. And sometimes doing what you want is just defending your third base. Um, you know, with two Ravens out, that's a lot of disables. And with this much infantry, I mean, look, maybe I'm wrong about this upcoming attack. This looks really tough to hold. Yeah, Mario does have a little bit of an advantage in the sky. One more Viking. One more Raven as well, I believe. So there's a chance that he's able to hold on here with some really nice control, but Cure just coming right down. First tank gets disabled already. Really nice armor shredding turret, but that tank kind of holding on to the defense between the natural and the third base, already gets taken out. And now this is a very precarious position here for Maru. And the natural is going to get shelled. That refinery yeah. is also in danger. That supply depot is in danger. Should Cure continue to inch forward? Keep in mind that um, refineries are really important uh, when you're mecking. Oh. Okay, hold on. He's just... He's just going to come right in here, and yeah. this is what I was worried about uh, <laughs> for Maru's sake, because there's just not a lot you can do. The turret actually does quite a oh. bit of work. I'm a little bit shocked by that. This is not as bad an engagement here for Maru as I thought it was going to be, but the reinforcements now coming into the third base here for Cure. We'll have to get evacuated. That command center is going to take a lot of damage here from these Marines. SCVs get pulled, but he realizes there's too many Marines and the tank as well over here. Nearly taking out very, very weak tanks. Uh, he's going to try to come forward. I don't know that this is a wise call. The CC lives, by the way. Yeah, CC lives, but you know, the economy right now thwarted a little bit here for Maru, who's already sustained a ton of economic damage over the course of this game. And Maru, you know, he was able to make that defense work, but it was an expensive one. Uh, more tanks are alive than I thought were going to be, if I'm going to just be completely honest. Uh, I thought when he did the, the triple disable that all the tanks would die, mm -hmm. but the auto turret did seem to kind of soak the A move um, execution there, and so that allowed the two tanks to live. And um, Maru's like hanging on by a thread. Uh, he is landing that third CC, but it does seem like this is a pretty loose spot. In fact, even the gas is going to go down. He doesn't quite have enough tanks uh, where he needs them. And this next attack is going to be a headache for Maru here as well. He's going to pick up. 
no missile turrets here either. So these men are actually going to go straight into the main base. There's really no defense to speak of here. Mars going to have to transfer some siege tanks from the natural expansion here into the main. I mean, we're getting to the point where you got to think about is this is this actually going to be too much? 18 more SCVs falling, another siege tank as well. So much damage. Again, the damage is just beginning to pile on here. And although Maru survives each of these attacks, he becomes smaller in size over and over and over. Uh, it looks like we have a setup for another attack here. By the way, here on four bases, Maru barely functioning on three for the time being. I mean, yeah. 84 workers to 58. You got to think that we're reaching a breaking point very soon. I mean, even these siege tanks uncovered here, so Kira can just drop on top of them. Barely going to miss getting that siege tank. Oh, actually was able to take it out. And the damage just continues to mount here. And you got to think that very soon, these bio forces are going to be so plentiful on the ground that Kira can just come in from various angles and really break the entrenched position that Maru has been able to work himself in. 172 supply to 116, by the way. 24 worker advantage here for Kira, who's now taking his fifth base. Maru, I don't even believe he started that fourth command center just yet. Although maybe he has in the main base, just hasn't moved yeah, it. Yeah, I, I don't see it on the minimap, but mm. I mean, it's been a beat down. Yeah. Let's not pretend here. The last seven or so minutes have just been Kira kind of crushing. Um, actually, honestly, really from even the very start of the game all the way through this, I was thinking about the initial push, but the truth is the reason why the push is working is because of all um, of the uh, Reapers that did so much damage. And then the second Reaper follow attack, big drop up into the main, right where the upgrades and the infrastructure are. Yeah, and there's siege tanks here as well. So this is going to be very difficult for Mara to dislodge. That armory will get taken out. Upgrade denied. Tomorrow, you know, he's going to use this air superiority to the best of his ability, snipe these medevacs, but the drop's just continuing everywhere, Tasteless, on all these siege tanks. Um, again, you know, more tanks are living than I expected. But Maru now, I mean, he, he's rotting from the inside out here. He's losing his infrastructure. He's having to push back into his main. He does have a fourth command center, so he should be able to work back up that work account. But I mean, economically, he's just in disarray right now. I think this is the moment. Yeah, GG. Wow. I mean, Kira is playing out of his mind there in game number one. Mario, tenacious that, as ever. He won that right at thir uh, 13 minutes and 37 seconds. He's the gamer oh, god. Wow. Mario was wow, waiting, Mario was so waiting for that to GG. He's going to win the next game at 4 minutes and 20 seconds. It's going to be crazy, <laughs> Ryan. Um, then, we're gonna, then we're going to have a 69 then we're gonna minute, have six minute, <laughs> 69 minute with back nine battle. With nine seconds. It's going to be nuts. Uh, look, I, I can't believe that Cure played that well. It's not very often that you see a player like Maru kind of just get smashed by a, an opening. Not that he, you know, he lost the game outright, but he was in such bad condition that, you know, the next couple punches uh, eventually knocked Maru out. We're already going into the next game in this best of five. Remember, uh, Dark is waiting for the winner here between these two. Maru, the six-time GSL champion, is going up against Cure, who looks to be like the Terran god, the greatest iteration of Terran we've seen so far in this season. But in order to beat Maru, he has to keep bringing that game after game after game. Let's see if it happens now. 2023 GSL Season 2. Club NV, Cure. <laughs> Onside Gaming, Maru. Right. Yeah, no um, buildings in the middle of the map now. And just a little bit of variance here with Kira going for a gas first. 
opening so, Mara going for Eric's gas. Yeah, let's see uh, how this pans out. Now, um, mm. okay. It, it does seem like uh, these two should still have a pretty even game if Kier can't get the upper hand. Kier's uh, opening really paid off. I mean, he really clean house with it. The idea that you harass and pick off units up until the point where Reapers can one-shot SCVs and then just kamikaze on top of each of the SCVs is huge. Mm -hmm. And I think from that point, the game obviously was in Kier's favor, but it wasn't lost yet for Maru. It was the follow-up handful of Reapers that went in when Maru tried to push across the map and see if he can get any damage done on Kier's side of things that really just sent him into disarray. I mean, that was gotta be like 15 SCVs in total that went down over the course of those two attacks. And even for a player like Maru, that is just so much economic damage. It's very difficult to come back from this. But we'll see exactly what the game plan is here in uh, game number two. Maru going for a two barracks opening, but in his main base, Kira trying to play it nice and safe, goes for one Reaper into command center on the high ground and then a factory right there at the wall where the Reaper would come in. Meanwhile, Maru is just accumulating Reapers for the time being. He is going to be active on the map. So a bit of a role reversal, although mm -hmm. obviously the pressure is nowhere near as pronounced from Maru. Yeah, the fact that the second barracks isn't proxy just kind of slows oh, everything down a little bit. <laughs> SV is able to work its way back into a safe corner. Whoa, barracks doing 360s, you see that? <laughs> Styling yeah, on him. Not every day you'd see a barracks do a skateboard trick above the base and then land again. It's like something from a Tony Hawk Pro Skater. I know. So, um, I mean, there is pressure on the ground here. I don't think it's going to do that much just yet. Well, hold on a Ooh. second. If you leave the base with the Reapers yeah. and go out, I mean, it's just Marines here. He's only showing one Reaper, by the way. There's only one Marine as well. For Cure, and but, if Maru comes in with four Reapers. But what's back at home here for uh, Maru as well? Maybe not that much right now, but. Okay, so this is actually huge because oh. the command center's not done. That's like 99% finished. Okay, SV's getting pulled here for Maru. He's going to try and chase down these Reapers, but at the same time, doing a ton of damage in Cure's base. As Kyrgyz is waiting for the Cyclone to finish, but four, four Reapers, that's a lot of damage output. More than two. By the way, this is a real strain on both sides to try to micro this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Kyrgyz Reapers are still alive. Oh, nice surround, though, Ooh. by Maru. It was an excellent play at the end and of the day. Maru losing nine SCVs, Kyrgyz only losing eight, so a little more even than I would have thought. Yeah. I really thought Maru was going to be able to get a little bit more of an edge uh, there with four Reapers going into the main. But. Although Kier might have more initiative now mm. because he actually had units left over besides Marines when that attack was done. A Cyclone coming out here. I mean, never count out what a Cyclone can do. This is one of the weird things with TVT. Is it seems like you get a couple. All the units are kind of had these really, um, um, I don't know how to describe this, just dramatic features that allow certain fights to be won pretty handily. Mm. And the Cyclone's certainly one of those units. I mean, if you can kind of gun down a slow-moving air unit or, like in this case with the Medivac, basically pick up and uh, kill off whatever you can find, it could be a headache. I wouldn't say the units are all glass cannons, but they kind of, the way they interact makes it almost feel like they are sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, Terran in general is kind of a glass cannon race, right? Yeah, but until there's like 200, 200 pop a bio with yeah, Medivacs yeah. on top of it raining down on your base that it feels like nothing could ever die. Does he see this? He's got to. Lane coming in. Look at that Medivac. Good catch. We'll okay. to scan to take that down. Not bad, honestly. There's a Viking Ooh. and a tank over here. I like this play. We haven't seen this very much. This is really you're trying to get something done with almost nothing. Like this almost looks like it's like a campaign a map <laughs> right now where there's like a Viking and a tank. And a Cyclone too. Yeah, and a Cyclone's worked its way just around. Need the hero unit to come in here. Dude, nice, he gets out. Yeah. I mean, take all the little wins you can, right? 
So this the army supply is is quite different. It's 27 to 17. So that's a 10 supply count lead in army. Um, keep in mind, you know, two base Terran versus two base Terran. Sometimes you just kind of you find that Achilles heel and you hit him. And it seems like that's what Kira's roaming around here trying to do. He did draw the tanks back down to defend that little gully area. But now he's going to come up over here. Now, Ooh. this is where the um, uh, tech labs are. I mean, there's other infrastructure here as well, but, like, it's kind of hard to get stuff out of here. Oh, my God. Actually, Mario's going to go all the way around. Yeah, and Kira's landing the Vikings in the main base, so he's going to get some SCV picks behind all this. But we're, will Mar actually be able to break this position? Hold he's on. sieging up. I don't think this Hold is going to work, Tasteless. Oh, no. Dude, what? What? What is happening? What is going on? This yeah. can't be real. That that was not the that was not the decision to make there for Maru. And Kira I just played it just perfectly. I cannot believe and it was that tank, it was the rally tank. Yeah. My goodness. I cannot believe this is how the games are looking today. I still refuse to believe this is gonna be a 3-0. I am just <laughs> stunned. And by the way, Maro looking, you know, a little bit embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, that move just simply did not work, but it was already a difficult so, position to break out of. And uh, his opponent, Kira, also had air superiority there. So it's not like Maru could really had a lot to yeah. work with on the ground. Well, also, you know, slow Marines do not really help Soak in a push. Right. At least, you know, the Marines can get up there and try to stim and do a little bit of damage in the tanks. and. Uh, the fact the rally tank came up. When I saw the Vikings land, I thought, okay, this is going to be a fight about how many SCVs did the Vikings kill. And even though Kira loses his tanks, can Maru still play from behind economically and, and, and you know try to catch up? But instead, the tanks lived, and the Vikings that landed were still killing SCVs. And there you go. That's Kira with a 2-0 to zero lead versus Maru. Kira playing out of his mind right now. Seems like his TVT just as good as his TVP and TVZ. This guy is the complete pack here in the GSL. One map went away from meeting Dark in the finals. 2023 GSL Season 2. Club NV, Cure. <laughs> Onside Gaming, Maru. <laughs> Maru supports here. Channel your energy, child. Your energy. Support yes. him. <laughs> he, he needs, needs it. it. He needs the support. I can't believe how short the games are, by the way. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. You and I were talking, you know, when we came into the studio today, that, like, this is going to be a crazy long game because everybody's so evenly matched. The matchups themselves, statistically, are the two longest. Um, and we've had, you know, experimentation with Mech in both TVZ and TVT. And by the way, we got that experimentation. Um, we got complex games uh, on both sides, but the one-sidedness is astounding. I mean, I can't even imagine the confidence that Kira is having right now. Yeah, Kira's got to be feeling really good, especially considering the way the openings went that last game. Like, do not forget that Maru went for a two barracks opening in his main base, and he pulled Reapers up to four right. outside of the base of Kira. Kira just made two Reapers out of one barracks, expanded on the high ground, teched up behind it, had one Marine back at home. And the armies kind of moved in this way where they went around the map towards each other. Kira reached the natural expansion for Maru, and Maru then sent his four Reapers into the main base. And they traded blows, and you would think that those four Reapers coming out of Maru are going to get more damage just because it's double the count, right? But, you know, Kira with his opening, I mean, with Cyclone, with excellent control, which I'm sure we, we didn't get to fully appreciate off screen because there was so much action happening across the map. The work counts were dead even almost right after that. It was maybe a one SCV difference. And so for Maru right there going for the two barracks play and to something like that, it hurts a lot because you're expecting to get some kind of yeah. edge in the early game against that opening. And so for Kira to be able to go up in that situation where 
you know, on paper things shouldn't quite go this well for you. Right. But still they do against, let, let, let's not beat around the bush, the best Terran player of all time yes. in StarCraft too. I mean, he's got to be on Cloud9. I mean, it's 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 very interesting. And a lot of it's based off circumstantial stuff in the opening. Um, you know, I, I didn't think that necessarily Kier was going to uh, kind of find a wedge positionally and exploit it against Morrow, but I did know that he would try to look for it after mm -hmm. the SCV trade out on both sides just because he had a unit advantage and that there was a Cyclone and a, a tank on the way and a medevac out where I think I just saw Marines, two Marines that held off the Reaper attack there mm -hmm. um, on Morrow's side. I mean, the faster tech really pays off in that count because you're getting all yeah. the, the high impact units like siege tanks, like cyclones, like medevacs and Vikings out well, much earlier than your opponent. One other feature about the, the matchup in TVT is that like cyclones and Vikings, uh, especially combined with things like medevacs, Hellions, really beat Reapers and Marines in fights. Yeah. It's micro right. Like it's, it's rarely a trade. And so if you can find that right opportunity, you can do it. By the way, Maru, um, as has been in line with this year, we kind of thought he might have recovered after the last GSL, but, you know, obviously we have to go back to that loss versus Oliveira. Um, and, I mean, TVT clearly, you know, if there's a matchup that he loses in, it's versus his own race. Yeah, TVT has been one of his weak points for sure so far this year. And now... You're coming in here with this drop. I love it. Barely coming in out of vision, so almost fully unloads here into the natural expansion with these four Marines and two Reapers. Able to get some SCV damage done. Four and total go down. So it's somewhat of a trade. Four SCVs is pretty good for a drop like that. And clearly he wants to back out. I don't think that this is going to get spotted either. Or, well, not spotted, caught, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, Where's the Cloak Banshees coming out from Mara, by the way? I saw them on the production tab, but I actually don't know where that first one is. On the monitors we have here, it's sometimes hard to tell where the little where the little red dot is. I know, I know. Our <laughs> monitors are pretty small. Um, so he backs up. He, he gets in, gets his jabs uh, onto his opponent's side of the map. By the way, third command center here for Cure. Yeah, third command center for Maru as well. Maru about maybe a third of the way faster. Now, if you're Kira. both going for third command center, the game remains dicey, in my opinion, Ooh. because you're, you're not working off a lot of units. Uh, in fact, losing a, a fight if you're both on three command centers can be really bad for the guy that loses the fight because their opposing side's third command center lands, the resources come in, while the other guy might have to lift off. Wow, Maru's playing a really Banshee-heavy style here. Yeah. He decided to bank the two of them with Cloak so that he will be able to one-shot the SCVs in the main base and behind that he's also getting hyperflight rotors. Oh, and that Widow Mine moved at the most inopportune time here. Yeah, he's gonna start one shotting SCVs, already making up the losses uh, from earlier on. A cyclone chips away at the Banshee, but Oh he gets oh, it! What? I didn't think that last attack was gonna hit. I really didn't think it was gonna hit. Even the way I'm talking, I'm like, but it gets away. Uh nicely done. Another loss here for Morrow and Again, it's not just like a normal game where you lose a Banshee because he's investing into Banshees. So he wants to get value out of the Banshees with the upgrades. He's training what would have been his fourth Banshee right now. And he's adding a second factory back at home too. So Maru perhaps going mech here in game number three on match point against Cure. I gotta say, it's not the strategy I expected to see from him here in this third game. I mean, Cure has just been such a killer overall here in GSL, whether it be TVP, TVZ, or even now in TVT, are just finding timings and finding weaknesses in your opponent and just absolutely going for it. And that's one of the scariest things stylistically to go up against as a mecking Terran, but Aru fully committing. Third factory underway. I think he's starting what would have been his fifth Banshee had that earlier Banshee not fallen. Really focusing on the mech. So Kira is going to have his third CC mining, and he can use these Banshees um, and anything else. I mean, I guess he could do this with Reapers. This is more to try to get any value with these Reapers at all, as they become increasingly obsolete as the game gets further along. But with these Banshees over here, uh, use this as a pin. You can get kills, create a threat, and it's oh. basically, oh, that's for nice. their friend. They killed that for their friend. Nicely <laughs> done. I did not know that three Banshees two-shot a Cyclone, but yeah, I do now. Well, <laughs> <laughs>
That's a very sick play. With Hyper Fight Rotors, you can actually make Micro like that happen. Gets a Siege Tank, too. Yeah. All this just massive damage. I feel like I'm watching, like, Brood War Brood Mutos, Mutos or something. I was yeah. say the same thing. Like. <laughs> this is sick. He's got, like, an SCV behind, like, his mineral line with Depot's right. walling it in. <laughs> <laughs> Help them stack on top of each other. Kira going for a drop in the main base of Mara behind all this as well. Cyclones are going to come back, but Mech, notoriously slow at dealing with harassment like this, means that Mara is going to lose 10 SCVs at least. I mean, there's been oh. so many tank kills. How many tanks have been lost now? Is it four? I think it's got to be three or four, yeah. And Kira's all the way back down to one siege tank. Well, the way these Banshees kind of stack up on top of each other, it's really hard to actually, you know, force them away without anything... Other than Vikings, you know? I mean, the range just isn't there. It's so hard with, you know, Marines with their short range to actually connect with the Banshees that are so highly maneuverable. Even the Cyclones haven't been able to get it done for Cure. But now we see Cure moving across the map, and I, I'm looking at this, and I, I feel like this might not be a position he can break with the losses that he sustained on his side. I mean, too no, many siege I, I, tanks perhaps have fallen. I think the tank count alone, I mean, it, it, it did so much. There's really no way to force your way into this. Five Banshees, by the way, right now for Maru. Okay, he's going to go for the Disable. This can't work. All right, Disable's coming in on four siege tanks at the front line. Auditor is dropping as well. Two siege tanks to go down, but the Banshees on the flank yeah. were able to take down the siege tank there from Cure. You ever have a moment in a game where you like you see the initial line of tanks, you're like, so that's what he's got, huh? And yeah. You, you run and you're like, yeah. there are five more tanks behind that. I think that's what this moment is right here. Zerg players around the world are nodding their heads in unison. Like, yes, yes, yes. We, do, we do know what this is like. We do know that <laughs> feeling. So... I mean, the Banshees are going to go northbound and try to find more value. I think Cure made a mistake attacking in there. I don't think it's the end of the world. He can replenish his um, his infantry here. But, I mean, the Banshees, again, getting so many kills. You can see how abusive you can get with them, too. Yeah, Hyper Flight Rotors is such a fun upgrade. I mean, not if you're playing against it, but no. to, wa to watch it and to play it, the amount of interesting attacks you can come in with are so cool. It's like a better Oracle with the range that it has, right? Yeah, it really is, and um, it, well, hold on a second. We're gonna have another push come down. Yeah, it seems like Kira's setting up for yet another push. I feel like nothing that he's gonna do so far is gonna work, but he's got one push on the center right, one on the far left side of the map. I'm a little concerned for this. The siege tanks are just staggered in such a way that he has to back off. Doesn't sustain too much damage, able to take down a couple of buildings, and I think he really wants to slow down this fourth base here for Mario, deny him the seventh and eighth gas, eighth gas geysers, but there's no way it's gonna happen. And the siege tank count and the air superiority both favoring Mario right now. And from this position on, you kind of have to, I, I'm scratching my head and wondering what Cure is going to be able to do. Oh, oh I can't believe God. that got away. What, what is Cure gonna be able to do to actually break you know, the fortress that is Maru's base well, at this stage in the game? He's behaving like he's going to break it and it's not the case, right? Wow. So he's going to go for Sky Terran. And it immediately gets scanned by Mario. We knew that a transition was going to come, whether it be Mech or Sky Terran, but... I mean, I think Mario would just put himself in Cure's shoes. It's like, okay, what would I do in this situation? Because I have to mix it up. Drops game. the scan. The game developmentally is looking better and better here for Mario. Like, he's definitely getting to where he needs to be. That being said, TVT can be a real slog when you get into late games. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Buckle up. Be... And this is a big catch as well. I mean, he's going to completely isolate and murder this entire oh. set of units. That, that was, a, was a complete owning. That was like Gumiho versus Dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fact that he isolated that just came in and punished. A uh, pretty big catch here for Morrow. Again, things looking better and better. A win Is looking Mario more and more. Push? Well, he has so many tanks. Yeah, I mean, he has a ton, but these battle cruisers, I know he is pumping well, he's Vikings and making Thors back at home, but. Oh, this might just be a killing blow. Are BCs even in production right no, now? No, 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 he's no, no, going Vikings. Vikings. Yeah, oh, Vikings. wow. Yeah, this is. This is going to be a problem. I don't know what Kier can do. Losing siege tanks like this again. <laughs> So many siege tanks. Yeah, well, he can just kind of snake around the map and set up a position like this. And 
That you is know, so many tanks. The, the, <laughs> the one tank alone is just like not enough. There are more siege tanks. There are almost more siege tanks than marauders on the field. Now there are. Yeah. I mean, there's just no way. This can't get. This can't get beaten. Nothing on the ground can contest the force that Maru has mustered. And he's and done this by whittling away at Cure over the duration of this game. These SCVs are isolated, by the way, and that makes the 12 o'clock spot completely um, unreachable, it seems like, at least by ground here for Cure. I think we're about to see GG. I don't yeah. think there's any way to recover from this. If you lose as many tanks as Cure did this game, uh, there's just nothing that you're going to be able to do. I mean, ultimately, the, the tank is the ultimate TVT unit, right? And if you just get too many of them, that's all it's going to be. Yeah, the Thors even will be a good answer for the Liberators. The first one sieges up, immediately gets taken out. And that's GG. it, GG. Maru puts that a was... point on the board. Okay, now we got ourselves a series. Um, well, Maru pulls it off, looking very good. But here, I mean, when he's on, he's on. I think Maru had a couple moments where it, what he planned out really worked. Uh, to his favor. I think when he went for the Banshees and he started to find those tanks, it didn't matter what kind of harass Cure really had. And um, he kept finding tanks over and over and over. I mean, eventually there was probably triple, quadruple the number of tanks um, that Cure had. And from then, it doesn't really matter what you have, especially when those Thors come into play. And so we're now going to game four here. What has so far been a very speedy best of five TVT. Yeah, it's been fun, though. I love the Hyperflight Rotor play coming out of Mario. I think he made five or six Banshees that game, was able to get so much damage done. Cyclone picks, SCV picks, Siege Tank picks, even killing Marines early on in the game before they actually had the tools at their disposal to, you know, thwart those Banshees. And that was Mario really just whittling down Cure over the majority of the mid game and mustering an army that could not be beaten. Let's see if he can do it again here in game number four. 2023. GSL Season 2. Club NV Cure. Side gaming, Maru. Massive support from the audience for Maru. Yeah, they're Yankees fans down here. <laughs> <laughs> we Fairweather we, fans. We hope he wins all the GSLs. Um, all right, well, I'll tell you, I'm still a little bit more impressed with Cure. I think the Cure might have almost like the echoes of game one and game two were still there in game three were like he still pushed anyways he's like now it's my turn to come in and kill you and it was just so many tanks like he sent out the disables and lost his infantry and i think that was a real uh kind of reality check there for cure um but you know let's see what happens here in game four yeah gonna be a two barracks opening on the high ground for a cure this time around so oh, third barracks third tasteless. barracks Okay. Where's the third barracks? It's all in the main, I think. Oh, yeah, every okay. Every single rack is yeah. in the main. I'm like, that's actually a third gas over there. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a fun build. But will this SUV get in? No, that's the role of this guy here on the low ground Bop. is just to thwart that should he decide to come in. For a second, I thought Cure was going to get like the most unlucky yeah. SCV. It just stays again. back there. It just like moonwalks back towards the SCV and takes damage and dies. Oh. Uh, all right, so we, we saw Maru wasn't able to get too much done when the builds looked similar to this in, I believe it was game number two, yep. where Maru went for two barracks on the high ground, Kira went for a barracks and then a factory and an expansion on the low ground. Um, or expansion on the high ground, excuse me. And we'll see what happens this time because it is a little bit different. Kira is going for three barracks, not two. So he's investing a lot more resources in this. He will be able to have more Reavers on the ground to punish Maru's, uh, you know, high-tech pace build. But Maru, we've seen time and time again, he can be very good at defending situations like this with... The thing is, 
a small number of units. The third barracks is kind of the surprise play because mm -hmm. whenever you're dealing with these uh, reapers that are coming out, you're kind of when, when you see the, the the third one show up, you go, okay, well, I I know this balancing act. I know exactly mm -hmm. what I need to hold this. But when you end it, have the extra reaper that comes in just about, I think, with the next rally with the group. So it's not there yet. It will be with the next rally. It can suddenly snowball the game. So it's a very sneaky way to play. Yeah, this still looks like it could be a two barracks reaper play. Yeah, and two barracks is very different from three. Oh, he's trying to get that reaper. Oh, there's one reaper Ooh. on the outside. And Cure drops one. Yeah, Cure already dropped one. Oh, he micros oh! back, able to kill one more. All oh, these Hellion shots, they'll get two more Reapers. Really going blow for blow right now are Cure and Mario. I guess Cure confident that with this rally in from three barracks, he can overpower Mario. This one Reaper in their main base. The only thing that survives right now for the Red Terran player. The Reaper's starting to heal. One Hellion comes out. He merges up with the next one. Now, they're going to be coming out in pairs of three. He cancels wow. the command center. That's big. It's very big. I guess that what's cut in retrospect, it's obvious he has to cancel that. Um, and he has to cancel it fast because he has to start it again, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, the build could still do more damage. I don't think we're done. I think the moment that we see that Kier stops making Reapers in threes, we know that he's decided uh, to go to the next phase. But let's remember what happened in game one. He got to a critical amount, and he started one-shotting SCVs, suiciding the Reapers right in... Um, to where they needed to go. He's still building them three at a time. High ground here could have been a big advantage for Mara, yeah. but he's a little bit too far back as the grenade's now coming through on both sides. And Kira just gonna screw it out of this. Did uh, Kira hmm. actually lose a Reaper back there? I don't think no, he did. No, I don't think he did. It was just a little bit of damage traded on both sides. Boom, add-ons everywhere. Fun opening here. Kira definitely has the edge. See what these Banshees are able to get done. They got so much work done for Amaru in the first game. And oh, he barely glimpsed that. I don't know if Kira actually saw that, though. Yeah, that, that's a hard one to call. I mean, it's Reapers, so he's actively microing them, but it was really just a fraction of a second now coming back into the main base. Oh my god, this is such good damage oh. here. Oh my god. He can go for the jugular. That might be it. He can go for the dive here. Oh, that was so much damage done. Almost all the Reapers remaining alive here for Kira. SCP starting to fall. The Banshee. Getting damage done on Cure's side of the map, but marine production has begun here for Cure. SCB's continuing to fall here. Tasteless Reaper's falling as well. Yeah, he's just going to try to kill as many as he possibly can. Um, right now, it's 27 to 16. I mean, the Banshee's still doing some work. Yeah, the Cloak. I mean, there is a scan available here for Cure, but he has to make sure that he's able to kill it. If the Banshee gets away from the scan, it could be disastrous. And right at the last second, you're able to take it out. Yeah, he pops that Banshee. And um, I'll tell you what, if the Banshee hadn't gotten the kills it had gotten, I think Maro is already packing his bags and going home. But yeah, 12 kills equalizes this a fair bit. Really a lot of economic damage done on both sides. Yeah, so he sees those Reapers. Uh, I'm kind of surprised to see one tank and two Marines coming up. Yeah, that is, is that, an interesting choice against... I mean, we the, did kind of see Cure do this tomorrow, but I don't feel like with this map you have the same uh, geography to, you know, exploit. Yeah, and also keep in mind that Cure's army is oh, a lot bigger than what Maru had previously. No stim pack, so there isn't that much mobility, but Cure... Hmm. He scans. This is tricky. If there's another scan available, I think the Viking can just kill this. There's nothing to repair. A second Banshee's going to come up. Yeah, this is a tricky situation. Oh my Reapers god, remember again. these guys from earlier? It's a lot more SCVs going down. There's a lot of micro on both sides here. This is really tricky, actually. Uh, you know, so you can see in a moment like that, he has to stop. He has to pick up which, uh -huh. one, which side is he going to commit to. Oh, this orbital's on solo. Is he not repairing this? He is not repairing yet. Waiting until the last oh! minute. Oh my goodness, it goes down. I can't believe it. Oh my god, this game is so good. Kira's back on one command center. and All that econ economic damage he got done on Maru, it's basically meaningless now. He's so oversaturated now in the main base, and he can't even really afford to stop unit production because he's in such dire straits, he's going to distance mine from the natural. 
supply blocked as well after losing that orbital command. And eventually he's going to have Dude. to remake it, but that was just so much damage done. You know, it would have been an entirely different game if he had just repaired. I think he didn't really realize either how much damage was there or that, that the repair wasn't happening. Sometimes, you know, you think you sent, set a command and then you look back and go, okay, I guess I just didn't do that. Um, a game that seemed to be moments away from ending here with Cure Victorious. Now it seems like it's tomorrow's game to lose. Note that there's he's no not command expanding. center. Yeah, yeah, he's all in. Yeah, he is not re-expanding. Four siege tanks on the ground right now for Maru. Three Banshees as well. I mean, the Banshees are going to be very tough to deal with. Vikings don't kill air the same way Banshees kill ground. Cure has to expand. I don't think he's going to. Oh, no, he is. He finally right. is. I okay. think he recognizes the situation that he is not going to be able to break this. But now you're playing from so far behind his Cure. He backs up. Good scan here from Maru. Will he try anything with the Banshees? Try to come in and maybe kill the tank off? I mean, he could easily. There's no medevac, by the way. There's no heal on these uh, Marines. The medevac was going to try and go for a drop, but instead just going to retreat back home. Wow. It's like a heavyweight match between one these of the two guys. the sickest TVTs ever, man. No hyperflight no rotor on these Banshees, by the way, so they won't be as microbols as before, but certainly are able to get more SCV picks. Or potentially some add-ons, too. Yeah. I mean, I you take Mario. whatever you can get. Losing reactors, I mean, they take so long to remake. It's so annoying to lose these. That one didn't even get canceled. Just damage done there. I guess Cure was trying to bait out these Banshees to stay as long as possible by not going through that cancel, and he is able to get... Oh, oh what? no. Yeah, so if the if the Banshee gets out of vision, the shot actually does not connect, so was able to skirt disaster. So there. funny. Yeah. Maru's coming in once again, but this is... Oh, oh my, my goodness. Oh, my God. Execution. Oh no, meanwhile. Oh, if he doesn't get this with a scan. Oh, he's not gonna get it. Oh, he does, barely. I can't believe that one died. I mean, this is such a, an odd game. Worker count, by the way, it's... Um, Still Cure in the lead. It's Cure in the lead. I mean, not by a huge difference though. The third CC starts. Um, Upgrades right Stim. now. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say Stim like, is still on the way. For Maro. So it goes to show you how differently these two developed, even though they seem to be in kind of similar positions. Yeah, Kira already has plus one infantry weapons, but Maro now is starting 1-1 one, one back at home, whereas Kira has yet to begin armor or plus two attack. So that upgrade advantage for Kira is going to quickly go away unless he starts to reinvest resources into those technologies. And you got to think that for Kira here, he's in a really tough spot. I still keep going back to that command center getting killed. That's crazy. That's insane. I mean, canceled, yeah, that actually happens all the time. Killed, two base versus two base, CC killed, and the game's still going on. And by the way, third CC is going to be finishing here for that player who was in that position earlier. Yeah, and I don't think, does, does Mar have a third command center? I think he might not. Does he uh, have one I don't on the see high one. Ground? Oh, I think, I think I just glimpsed it. Sometimes it's oh. hard to tell if we don't get a full shot of the base. I think it's to the left of those barracks. If I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to watch. I'm waiting for Mara to make three SCVs at a time, so I just like know for sure, but he's got other plans for his minerals right this second, I guess. Yeah, okay, so there is a third command center for both players. Here, once again, seen in this position, but this time Mara is a lot of Vikings. Yeah, nice kill on the Raven. That's huge. Third CC getting shelled. You need a little bit more to spot over here right now. If you're not able to peer up in there, that's going to make uh, some opportunities for these tanks here on Morrow's uh, high ground to come in and try to do some damage of their own. Yeah, one of Kira's tanks gets taken out there. Oh. Banshee's once again coming into the natural. This is Third a base familiar is fight. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> we've seen earlier. Uh, are these Marines going to get the Banshee? It doesn't look like it. The Banshee escapes and veers up into the main. Got to say though, Kira's done a great job of trying to rebound back at home. No, he's able to pass Maru and supply now after losing that natural expansion is so critical. But part of that's also because Maru is investing in a much more, you know, well, supply efficient army here with the Vikings, with the siege tanks, Ravens, and Liberators. We've got one of these positions where, oh, I was going to say they're both going towards each other, but it seemed like uh, Kira was going to turn around. It looks like he, uh, Kira wants to try to intercept this up here. This is a pretty scary army for Maru, by the way. It's so many siege tanks again. 
with a Liberator too. He's able to force Cure to unsiege, so. I thought he was going to force him to unsiege. He's just going to lose the tank. <laughs> Oh no, and the stim now coming in. There's nothing to assist these. Well, there's a big counterattack. It's not aided with medevacs. Yeah, we're gonna have a base trade, Tasteless. Yeah, but I think this is might be, I think it's gonna be a lot better here for Maru, right? Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, the, the damage is so high. The SCVs are pulled. The SCVs getting pulled, but Maru just absolutely dominates through the natural expansion. There's defenses here in the main base for Maru as well, so Gears gonna have to contest with those. The thing is, there's so many tanks for Maru. Yeah, I mean, there's basically push through. It's like the last game, only not as dramatic. These Marines are getting a lot done. You have I to think, think with the barracks on the low ground here, eventually, like, you know, there's no medevac energy healing these Marines, and I think Maru's done it. Yeah, I think so. I think that there's the Marine count's thinned out enough. Actually, it's gone. I was going to say, you know, it's wow. low enough that anything that spawns in the barracks dies. All right, we're going to go to game five here. What, what an, an unbelievable series. set. I mean, this is just wild. I was a little scared for a moment with the first two wins there by Cure, but Maru has done an incredible job fighting back here. And Cure was, like, about to actually win. Yeah. Like, the Reapers did so much damage. Had that Command Center not been killed off, I think Cure might still be able to uh, to win here. But, you know, that's the thing about Maru. He's got that stamina. He's got that focus. GG. And now he's got that game five, as he might have a full reverse sweep versus Cure. Tremendous stuff for Maru, and really the Banshees have been such an MVP unit for him this series. Without the Banshee micro, either in game three or game four, I don't know if Maru walks away with the victory here. I don't know, man. I mean, what a, 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 what a better series than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is crazy. Well, these are two of the top Terran players in Korea, just going head to head right now. Arguably the top Terran players in the world. As Kira Look, looks a little bit, a little bit maybe. Well, I mean, he was about mm. to just walk out of here looking like a god, 3 0 in Maru, and now Maru is about to be, you know, the comeback hit here. Never count him out. You corner him, and he's only more dangerous. Yeah, Kira seems a little bit stressed right now. Well, he should be. It's the most natural thing. I think Maru might be using his break going to the restroom before he goes into game uh, five here. So we're going to have a little bit of downtime. I wish I could have taken one of those breaks and gone to the restroom tasteless. Oh, I, I gambled after the first series. I was like, oh, the second oh, one, I know. it'll probably be quick too. And now, oh now boy. I am. I need, <laughs> I need a toilet to cast from is what I need. Uh, Actually, we're just going to be casting from toilets. It's going to be the future of esports, future. I think. Caster diapers, something like that. Caster diapers. Yeah. I don't think I want to wear a diaper, though. Caster catheters. 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 You could patent that. I could. Somebody could watching is probably already going to be. Someone could take that idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, Get that one I, for free. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, man, I can't believe, like, how insanely well Maru played in that last game. Some of this, though, does come down uh, to Cure not repairing that command center. It does come down to that. I mean, he, if that command center had lifted and maybe Cure had respected this a little bit more, yeah. I don't think it would have gotten taken down. The Banshees wouldn't have been able, been able to add their DPS to the mix. The siege tank shells, they would have stopped. And I don't think Maru would actually would have been able to breach that position with just un, unupgraded Marines. Well, but, I, I get the idea of you let the, the CC soak a certain amount of damage and you keep mining from it. But the fact that he wasn't able to just repair it because I think if he can repair that, I think then in that time, um, Cure will have enough to come back and fight that that push off mm -hmm. and, and, and push through. But uh, that's not what happened, right? And so um, kind of a haunting series here for Cure. Cure almost had Maru dead yeah, with those Yeah, very close. Had that one Banshee not been all the way across the map, slowly killing SCVs while the Reapers were quickly killing so many of Maru's uh, it could have been a different game. Even then, though, it still looked like uh, Maru was probably going to lose. But with that push, and, you know, you don't really bank on them losing the command center. You're trying to just squeeze out damage. You're trying to really make them stop mining and repair and slow down their progress, and maybe you take a fight mm -hmm. and win it from there. But you never expect the CC to die. But sometimes you do win games, even in, like, a round of four of GSL, based off your opponent just not performing a specific action that could happen at even the lowest level of play. I mean, Maru and Kira are both so good at getting this incredible value out of small numbers of units. I think back to Kira in game number two with those handful of siege tanks and Marines on the low ground and the three Vikings in the main base of Maru. 
just able to completely turn the game upside down and deliver a win in instantaneous faction. And you no know, game number four here, Mara versus Kira, it felt like it went on a lot longer, but you know, although Kira did a miraculous job of trying to macro back up to match Maru and even actually eclipsed him in supply for a brief moment, that's because Maru was investing all these resources in these high impact units and gunning for a kill. He had the third orbital command, but he cut SCVs. He was just happy to power up as much as he could and just come in for the push. We are now ready to go into our final game here with these two players. Again, the winner is going to move on into the finals of the GSL, which is later tonight, where one of these two faces off against Dark. Club NV, Cure. Side gaming, Maru. Maru looking as calm as ever. If he wins this map, I think it's going to be his 10th GSL finals. Six first place and two second place finishes to this date. Truly the greatest of all time Terran player. And a storied history for him here in Korea. Yeah, I mean, he is a legend. And you can kind of see why he's won so many GSLs, just for <laughs> the way this has panned out. Support on either side here. <laughs> I didn't realize what the, the side on the right there was for a second. Um, yeah, but I mean, you can really see how he's actually able to, like, totally turn this around. Um, there's nothing more impressive than somebody who's, like, gotten their ass kicked at the start of a game and just mm -hmm. kind of stays alive and, and, and pushes through. Yeah, it's really impressive. You know, the tenacity that both Maru and Kira have been showing over the course of this series is... Yeah, that sign, by the way, was about the a couple that's been um, known each other for 10 years and they're finally getting married now. But they're the real GSL They're champions. the real GSL, yeah. Oh... <laughs> <laughs> uh. Mirrored builds, by the way, coming up from both Kira and Mario. Yeah, you know, m uh, most of the builds with these two have involved, like, some sneaky ingredient into the build mm -hmm. that's supposed to give you a lead if you can leverage it right. Uh, so far, we don't have anything like that this time. You know, whether it's a third barracks, a proxied barracks, investment in a Banshee tech. Um, I don't know if we're going to see something like that, some kind of, you know, curveball in the build itself that can give you a lead. Yeah, but up until this point, I mean, it's it's absolutely still exactly mirrored. I think the, the biggest difference that I could spot was Maru went for two guys on each of the gases, and Kira just had three guys on one gas, and that's about as much varieties we're getting here in game number five so far. But we'll see if they decide to mix it up a little bit. Starport now coming in for Maru. I'm sure Kira's will follow soon as well. There it is. So a little bit of a tempo advantage for Morrow. Some of this goes back to him mining gas um, a little bit more rapidly here than, than Kira. That's the 40 gas difference between these two players right now. But but truly nothing that exciting happening no. so far. And, and nothing to really say like, oh, this guy's got an edge. Or We don't even really know what kind of games are going to be played yet. We, start, we need to basically, excuse me, we need to look at the upgrades and, you know, the, the, the few units that come out of this, specifically the Starport uh, and the Factory and see what kind of opportunities can be created there. Yeah, and this is the first real difference coming in is Mara opting for the Siege Tank opening. Kira going for the Cyclone. And we'll see how they decide to navigate the early games here. We haven't really had a late game, too much of a late game TBT between these two just yet. And there have been a lot of pushes on three bases that have just straight up ended the game in this series. And I do wonder if that's going to be something that's on both of these players' minds now coming into game number five is, you know, whether they can come and find a way to sneak through, sneak with some attack, the way Kira did in game, the way Kira did in game number two and Maru did in game number four, and walk away with a win. 
All right, so he's going to come up with these Hellions. And oh my god, this is such a sick idea. He's just going to try to juggle it and increment out more damage over time. Only it seems like actually Cure is still OK. I think Cure might have actually gotten the better end of that trade. Yeah. Yeah, this is just going to get shut down. Oh, and the Siege Tank falls too. The, oh, is the Cyclone going to get the meta back? It will. And the Reaper. And the is Cyclone killed. survives. Yeah, Maru not with any okay, luck so with that first push. Basically, never have I seen Maru come out with an idea like that that has landed so much on its face. It's a 600 resource differential in terms of units lost. That is huge. And just like all these fancy attacks in TVT, when they utterly fail, it uh, prompts a counter push. Yeah, and Maru behind this is going for a third command center tasteless. Kira is just committing to the attack. He's considering to pump siege tanks, adding in a second Raven. And Maru moving forward, he sees that Kira is about to ready to knock on his door. So he's going to look for another place. Always oh, better to try to set up wherever they're not ready, especially mm -hmm. when it's two base versus two base, because you just don't have a lot. You don't have enough to cover everything. So there's going to be a, a, a soft spot, an underbelly somewhere you can hit. Yeah, unfortunately, here on Dragon Scales, there isn't too much of an angle for Cure to find value in that large main base. Sieging at the third base sometimes can net you some gain by taking down the infrastructure of your opponent, but not here on Dragon Scales. As Mario just having to sit back here on two bases and hold the high ground ramp. I don't know if you're, uh, excuse me, I don't know if Cure can actually find anything, which I, I actually respect. When you like realize you can't do anything, you don't try to force it, that's a really good player. I think with the two Ravens that he has accumulating energy like this, he's going to wait for Maru to try and secure that third base and just pounce on the position. That, yeah. that would be that's that would be my guess for how this is going like to go. It's like you almost give them a position so that you can take it back from them and they lose right. they lose time that way. Yeah, especially if Maru sieges up there at the third base because then those siege tanks also cannot run. This Kyrus is rallying everything to the center of the map right now. Keep in mind that he's building his command center here on the low ground, so that's going to be economic advantage for him as these Cyclones are just going to trade their lives. Double kill. <laughs> All right, is he going to try to go for the Disables up here? He's got to be careful sharking around like this. Yeah, I would be surprised if he went for them on the high ground there. I feel like you need such a threshold of advantage to actually end the game in that specific way. Whereas if you let Maru overextend himself into a third base and then try to break with all the Disables that you've accumulated on those two Ravens, suddenly that might be a win for you. And the way that Maru is posturing, or Maru, excuse me, Kira is continuing to posture here at the third base makes me think that that is exactly what he has on his mind. Yeah, you nailed it, State. This is exactly what he wants. He's like, try it. Try to take a third base. Because no matter what, Kira's going to be ahead if he just starts soaking up resources. Maru and knows, though. He scanned. It's kind of a tricky situation. What do you really do here as Maru? He just lands the command center back down and... <laughs> Just knows he has to bide his time. I mean, often when the early push goes so badly oh, the way that it did for Maru did in the early game, dude, this is spiral out of control. This is so good. He's gonna get both reactors, or even just, just one. one is fine. And one at a depot. Supply blocks him. Yeah. Oh, the barracks as well. Well, the funny thing is, like the tank, it's, it, there's not enough tanks. So you can just like easily push in here. But what happens if Maru does the same? He should be able to find some damage over here, but there are actually no hold that thought. Okay, so there's two oh. Vikings landing at the triangle. They're getting damage done. All the turrets come down here. Able to take take down the siege tank, my goodness. Whoa, and I, you can see Kier wasn't actually... What? What? He just killed everything. Kier never pulled the SCVs from the third base. 31 SCVs realize. go down. He lands his own, but there should be enough on the ground here. Yeah, with the disable, the siege tank, though, it's not getting focus fired until now, so we'll get at least two shots off. Many uh, Vikings falling, and once again, the main base. Oh my god! I can't believe it. I thought for sure the cure with his reinforcements would be able to clean this up. Instead, he has to retreat all the way back home. By the way, it's so funny to watch the tank that can actually kite the Viking on the ground. Yeah. Okay, 41 SCVs have been killed. Cure's heading back home. He's oh, combat shields. Dude. Well, Submarines coming in. We'll be able to clean up. Your deaths were not in vain. Wow. And now Mario's pushing across the map. I think that 
That takes so much damage. I mean, I'll tell you what, this is going to be very tough for Kira to handle. It seems like Mara was just a little bit better at, like, dribbling both attacks at once. Yeah, but let's keep in mind that Kira still does have those two Ravens. We'll see if that's going to be enough here with the Sables coming in on these Siege Tanks. And yeah, Mara's going to have to back off from this position. Not a good trade for her to start things off, but now those Ravens are out of energy. And once those Disables expire, Mara might be able to reposition and find another angle of attack. Okay, another oh. scan over here. He's going straight to the main base. There's yeah. no turrets on these Ravens. There's a lot of spots he can put this in, but he's going to go right there over the high ground area where he can hit those SCVs. Yes, yeah, C-Chain's on the low ground. It's also getting cleaned up. Oh SCVs my God. coming in. The SCVs are not enough, and so five get dropped. <laughs> Seven go down. The Marines are not enough. I think Mara might have done it. I think that there's no way to procure to recover this, and you know that there's another attack inbound already here from Maru. Oh my goodness. Dude, he is a king. Maru sum out here with a reverse sweep, gonna win, and send himself to the finals to face Dark. What a play coming out from Maru. Really cool stuff. GG, Maru survives, and so our finals is gonna be one of two players we've seen so many times before. Dark versus Morrow in a ZVT. Wow. What a comeback from Morrow. And I mean, the Starport units, absolutely the MVPs, the Banshees in yeah. the first two games, and then the Vikings here in the final match. It took us 12 years, but Dustin Browder's dream came true of Vikings <laughs> landing to then harass, only to lift back off and run away. Never again will we see a Reddit post asking why the Viking lands in the cinematic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you that, have your answer. That Viking landed in Heart of the Swarm. That was a legacy of the Void Viking. That was a GSL 2023 Viking. That's the Viking that sent Maru to the world. That's to, the to Viking the that killed all of Pure's <laughs> SCVs. Oh, wow. 10th GSL Finals here. You will either walk away with seven first place finishes or four second place finishes. Wait, no, that's not how math works. Yes, it is. Never mind, I'm right. Math is a dangerous man. It's a game. dangerous one. I should have done it. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, this is his 10th GSL Finals. It could be his GS. Seven. We can't keep doing this tasteless. You take the L, you turn it upside down. What, what's next? We're going to connect the, the S and, S and, and turn it to an it into an infinity symbol. The nine, you just connect the G. This is easy. It's when 10 just comes along, nine, that's nine, when it gets tough. The nine rotates 180 degrees. That's <laughs> it's just right. upside down. It makes the G. The 11, don't even get me started. The 11. Man. You take what? You take one of them, and it's like the first, like the upper part of the L, and then you take the other one, it's the lower part That's of right. the L. It's the, the GS1 underscore is the GS11. We were so caught up in that G5L, and then suddenly Maru started rapidly winning a bunch of these, and we just didn't have time to really make a special trophy for each one. But here we are. Um, incredible TVT series. I think that our finals is going to be crazy. It's going to be dramatic. It's going to be long. I don't think it can be one-sided. Um... Man, Maru's sick. Yeah, that was an insane comeback against Kira going for the reverse yeah. sweep. And Kira looks so good in game number one and game number two. I thought we were going to have another fast 3-0, the same Me way too. we did between Dark and Gumiho, but instead... Well, especially after those first two games, it's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, that's that's weird. And then remember <laughs> game three with the Reapers, it almost ended, right? Yeah. It got so close. We Maru were... was able to claw his way back with that one Banshee. Yeah, I mean, even then, it looked like he was still behind. Had he not killed that command center, it would have been a different story. Uh, That's one for the history books. Game. Yeah. Um, so if you're tuning in, the finals is still today. Yeah. GSL format's a little bit different. So we do the round of four, and then we go right into the finals uh, after that, after a break, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll intro our players. We'll interview them. Uh, and it's going to be hopefully seven games of madness. But if not, I can't imagine it's going to be a 4-0. Dark looks very strong. Uh, I got more to say, but we're going to go to that break, and I'll talk more about that when we return.
오즈급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 똑같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 칠성사이다 제로. 여름이 왔다. 마음껏 청량하자. 청량한 순간에 언제나 칠성사이다. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹. 교육방 소송을 좀 하기도 했었고 그래서 테라는 제가 가장 잘할 것 같고요 변님이 잘 알려줄 것 같고 빌드 하나하나의 이유가 있는 느낌? 뭐 읽고 난 말쯤 뭐 무슨 뭐 때문에 찍었다 뭐 이런 식으로 다 설명 잘 해줄 것 같고 동원이 형 눈높이로 되게 잘 가르쳐 줄것 같아요 동원이 형 아니면 성주 성주는 워낙 게임 인플레이 내에서 개념이 너무 좋기 때문에 뽑은 거고 잘 알려줄 미지수긴 한데 워낙 가지고 있는 프로세서가 좋아가지고 뽑았고 동원이 형은 개념이 뭐 성주 정도는 아니지만 좋기도 하고 이제 잘 알려줄 것 같은 동원이 형이 잘 가르쳐 주실 것 같고요 저는 저라고 생각하고 병재 형이 잘해줄 것 같아요 병재 형 저도 약간 병재 형이랑 같은 것 같거든요 테란에 대한 개념이 좋고 자세하고 설명도 잘해주고 그건 진짜 말도 안 되는 거 TY가 말하기를 성주도 의외로 응. 개념이 너무 좋다던데 응. 성주가요? 응. 그 빌드를 저한테 물어보는 거 저한테 다 가져가는 거예요 그건 절대 아닐 거 같고 저희 막 어거지 부리는 거 좋아해가지고 이따가 성주 인터뷰할 때 한번 물어보세요 누구한테 많이 영향받냐 빌드 좋은 거 많이 알려줘요 듣고 보면 좋은데 막상 해보면 질 때도 맞다 이번에 레이너한테 질 때도 저 형만 듣다가 진 거거든요 이기면 자기 덕분 지면 니팔 네 말을 해봐 신입업님 방송하는 거 보면 이제 시청자분들 잘 알려주더라고 희범이요? 희범이도 실제로 뭐 교육방송 이런 걸 되게 많이 했고 희범이가 유튜브 강의 영상도 많이 찍고 하거든요 약간 그 노하우가 있지 않을까 강의하는 컨텐츠를 많이 찍어요 그래서 전문가가 아닐까 싶습니다 명호는 너무 제과고 싹하고 <웃음> 희범이가 잘 알려줄 것 같긴 해요 아 이건 가르쳐준 건 저도 좀 자신 있긴 한데 여기 희범이가 있어서 일단 명호가 이렇게 몸 때문에 좀 이렇게 많이 인식이 그렇게 돼 있는데 되게 착해요 마음도 여리고 형들한테도 깍듯하고 동생들한테는 엄격하고 되게 엄격한 선생님 될것 같아요 오우님이 아마 잘 가르쳐 주지 않을까요? 맥스 엔젤 아니면 은 준호 형? 준호 형 준호 형? 복귀하고 게임 얘기를 좀 했었는데 되게 친절하게 잘 알려줘요 강욱 걔가 약간 나긋나긋하게 짜증 안 내고 잘 가르칠 것 같고 한우? 한우는 또 친절하기도 하고 성격도 좋고 그래서 잘 알려줄 것 같고 아니가 그래도 제일 나을 것 같네요 그러니까 약간 정석적인 진짜 정파 느낌 화만 가르치지 않으면 가장 좋은 선생님 될것 같아요 민수가 나쁠 것 같아요 무관심 그게 제일 힘든데 거기 학원에 안 있을 것 같아요 밖에, 밖에. 좀 이따가 나갈 것 같아요 컨트롤 위주로 하는 사람들? 조성주, 권현우, 김준호 설명이 심플한데 그렇게 심플하게 설명 안 돼요 제가 생각하기에는 분명히 개인 방송할 때도 마이크를 아예 안 쓰고 했단 말이죠 그런 걸 낯간지로 할것 같아요 뭔가 알려주고 이런 거를 그리고 알려줘도 뭐 사신을 쓰세요, 뭐 해병을 쓰세요 이상한 똥 개념을 알려줄 거기 때문에 경재 형 이상한 빌드 막 가르칠 것 같아요 정상 안 가르치고 조성주? 말을 잘 못하니까 설명을 잘 못할 것 같고 지금은 진짜 많이 나아진 거긴 한데 제가 그럴 것 같은데 귀찮은 거 싫어해가지고 저요? 아니 뭐저 앵그리 모드로는 안 가는데 화는 안 내지만 제자가 안 좋은 길로 빠지게 할수 있는 그런 선생님인 것 같아요 선우? 가끔 형인데도 무서울 때가 있어서 약간 그런 거 있잖아요 제가 너무 못하면 괜히 선생님 눈치 볼것 같아요 
SL Finals. Dark. Maru. Twelve years of GSL, and we're still going strong. Twelve years of revolutionary strategies, new ideas, new plays, sometimes new players. But this time, it's two faces you're all very, very familiar with. This is going to be a fight to see if Dark can once more come out on top as a GSL champion, or if Morrow's going to get his seventh victory. Coming up first, Dark, the player, one of the only Zergs in this season at GSL. Coming here once more in season two to fight and become a champion in a season full of Terran dominance. The lone hope. The lone hope for non-Terrans around the world. There's so much on the line here. He is against the most consistent GSL player of all time, repping the Zerg race. And eras before where Zerg were completely, excuse me, dominant. Uh, he's <laughs> fighting, <laughs> trying, trying to hype it up. Anyways. <laughs> this is our best finals intro ever. His opponent here, the most consistent and greatest Terran in StarCraft II, winning GSL after GSL after GSL in so many different eras is here to prove that 2023 is another one of his eras. So here he comes on the stage now. Only one will survive. Both surviving two very different round of fours. Dark 3-0-ing, Maru reverse sweeping 3-2. Dark won in convincing fashion over Gumiho. And ZVT, Maru really struggled that opening series. We'll see what he's able to do now. We're bringing Caster Park onto the stage here to interview the two players, get their thoughts, then we're going to get this best of seven finals going. An impressive semifinals. Dark, didn't you just say? Against Terrence, it's hard. It's a tough matchup. Yet you spotted both proxy barracks. You destroyed it. You crushed base. Yeah, I beat him. I beat him 3 0. It might have been an easy journey here, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy now. I'm going to give it all my energy. Maru is here now. He managed to get a reverse sweep. What is your take on him now? <laughs> when I saw him down 0-2, I thought, oh, he's not the same guy. Then I saw him come back and win three games. A lot of people are saying you didn't seem like you were the same Maro from before. How do you feel right now? I think I am with you before. Dark keeps saying if he defeats you today, he's going to shave his beard and mustache. Maro says, really? He didn't know about that. After I hear that, now I really want to beat him. Dark destroyed those Terrans earlier. Was that intimidating for you? I guess, but he's also become the number one ranked whiner about balance. I don't trust what he's saying. You said Terran has like 300 builds. 
그렇기 때문에 어, 굉장히 좀 힘들 것 같고 오. 선수가 좀 입담이 많이 늘어서 오. 약한 모습을 많이 Terrence 보고 있습니다. 보세요, 웃고 있습니다. 표정 보세요. 웃고 있습니다. Maro has thousands of builds. 아니, 선우 지금, 아니, 본연 씨가 웃음이 전혀 안 하고 사셨어요. Caster Park says, look at Maro's face, he's laughing. Your facial expressions seem like you're already ready to win the season, but it's your turn again to take the finals. Don't you feel pressure? Do you feel nervous? What do you feel? Feel not a whole lot. Is that because your opponent is dark? No, no, no. I didn't mean it like that. Zark is a great Zark. But I'm worried about his beard now. <laughs> After you've grown your beard out and your mustache out. Will you shave it today? Will today be the day? <laughs> now, I, now I was thinking maybe I'll shave it, but now I'm feeling uh, affection to my facial hair, and I know I'm going to win. Any words to your opponent? Whenever we have a best of seven matchup against Dark. We always have a full set. It's always pretty crazy. I hope I have a good performance for my fans. And what about you, Dark? <coughs> Excuse me. We have lots of fans here at the studio. I hope we have a full set. And I hope all the fans and players enjoy tonight's matchup. Uh, Caster Parks says, make some noise. Let's get this started. Shaking hands. No fist bumps. COVID's over. <laughs> That's Caster right. Caster Park tried his best to hype that one up, man. All right, guys, we're going to go into this best of seven here to find out who will be the champion in season two of the GSL Codex. All right, Tark versus Maru. Best of seven to decide who is going to merge as the second GSL champion of 2023. Maru looked very shaky. First couple of games against Cure, perhaps not in the best form right now. Whereas Dark really breezed his way into the finals with a clean 3-0. You gotta ask now, who's gonna be able to emerge victorious here at this best of seven? It is a real marathon Maru had to play through. <clears throat> Excuse me. Real marathon he had to play through here. Uh, and Dark, I mean, he made it look so easy, honestly. Um, that being said, Gumiho, the way he played, I feel like was a little bit too risky and Dark had a bit of a cakewalk to get here. Yeah, Gumiho did play, you know, quite greedy. Oftentimes he's going for proxy barracks to the fast 3cc play and Dark every single game from game one, game two, game three, always killed him with the timing attack on three bases, just absolutely powered through. I don't think Dark will be able to do the same thing here against Maru. Maru is a much more conservative player when it comes to defense. He's a lot harder to kill. He usually doesn't take those risks that Gumiho did. But we'll see. Dark, I mean, he has to be riding momentum. Keep in mind that was a very easy series for him, so he's been able to conserve a lot of energy for this final match, whereas Maru really just got put through the gauntlet against Cure. It's a good point. And also, um, Maru, uh, you know, besides putting all that work in, Dark didn't have to show his builds. All three games that he played against Gumiho really uh, came down to Dark identifying what's happening and reacting properly. Dark never had to show what his late game ideas were, what his expansion patterns were in a long game. So he's going into this pretty clean. And that comes on top of the fact that, you know, already, and it's sort of the weird advantage you get when it's one race dominating your tournament and you're not playing that race, is that you really have to prep for just one matchup. So I think there's a lot going here for Dark. Now, if Dark wins, it's going to be huge. He is one of the most accomplished, not just GSL, but overall, uh, not even just in StarCraft 2, StarCraft 1 and 2, pro gamers of all time. But if Maru wins, it once again sets another record here. Another GSL un untoppable score where it will be his seventh GSL Codex victory. Yeah, I feel like what we're seeing Maru do this year and really over the course of his career is something that will never be duplicated here at the GSL. Seven championships on the line right now here against Dark. Maru, he won the first season against Cure. He won the rematch 
against his first season opponent in the semifinals, and now he has to face off against the only Zerg to survive the Terran onslaught of season two. Zerg, the most dominant race in the GSL, but this year, Terran killing it, and of course, Maru, the only player who could ever hang on against Zergs when they were crushing it. Let's see what happens as we go into this best of seven with two of the most iconic, not just Korean, but global StarCraft II players in the entire world in the 12-year history of the game. I could not be more excited to see who's gonna come out on top. Yeah, it's hard to choose who's gonna take it. And I gotta say this one, I fully expect it to go the distance. Game five, game six, game seven, all the way here. This is Dark and Mario, two of the top players in the world. We'll see how they battle it out here. Going to set number one on ESL Dragon Scales. 2023 ESL Season 2. DKZ Gaming, Dark. <laughs> Onside Gaming, Maru. Okay, so this is a barracks on the low ground. By the way, full house here tonight in the studio. Yeah, with extra seating, too. Yeah. It's absolutely sold out. Sold out immediately, by the way. So uh, I had a lot of messages filling up my inbox about tickets to get in. But I'm telling you guys, you got to buy it like in the first five minutes of when it goes on sale. Even today, man, uh, StarCraft II finals still fill up. Um, we're getting some shots here at the audience. But in game, double racks on low ground. So playing a little bit like we've seen before. Uh, with what Bjorn would do. Yeah, Bjorn really pioneered this opening in season one of GSL this year, and it was kind of slow to ramp up. Oh, I love that drawing right there. <laughs> That's beautiful. It was slow to ramp up in popularity among the Terran players, but really here in season two, you're starting to see a lot more Terrans, such as Maru, such as Cure, utilize the two barracks play that you know Bjorn really developed over the course of this year at their top level play, and it's great. I, I honestly think this might be one of the future builds that Terran just goes back and rely on. I could even see it overtaking a one barracks expand in popularity with how reliable it seems to be. You know, when the first time we saw this here in GSL, we were wondering how is this going to defend against a Roach Allen or a Ravager Allen or a Baneling Bust. And although it can certainly be a point of vulnerability, we often do see players like Bjorn, for example, face off against those all ins and survive and go on to win the game because of it. You know, the more I cast this build that Maro's doing, and as you were mentioning, State, we've seen Beyond a lot, uh, do a lot. Um, the more I like it, I think that it, it adds a lot of flexibility while still generating the threat of two racks Reapers, which is a lot. Um, there's a lot more you could do with two racks Reaper than one racks Reaper. So, and, and the fact that you have the wall in here, you're able to, at the drop of a hat, start your command center and tech behind it. So it allows you to really interfere and toy with the Zerg in a way that one Rax Reaper really just didn't. I mean, one Rax Reaper, you know, before you were casting GSL full time, and this was kind of the big joke that Artosis and me had is like, wow, this is peak StarCraft 2 is when the one Reaper comes and maybe kills a Ling or doesn't, you know? But two Rax Reaper is a lot more dynamic. By the way, kills the um, Creep Tumor. You know, it's always good to get a little something there, but. From here, we have um, the command center nearing completion. The Terran can continue to tech up the factories inbound here. And I, I think it's a great way to play. Now, Dark did manage to get a drone over, not that the Reapers were ever giving that part of the map that much attention, um, but the third base was not impeded in its production. Yeah, third hatchery coming down here for Dark, but Mara with a very fast third command center on the high ground, actually outpacing Dark in the expansion game, so. So you can play a lot more conservative, economic-focused style here in game one against Dark is with Zergling speed completed, these Reapers are all just going to be on defensive duty for the majority of the rest of this game. And Mar doing a good job of just trying to hold back the Overlords from getting critical scouting information like that third CC. This was something that really came back to bite Gumiho in the butt in his series against Dark was Dark was so on top of his scouting 
It felt like any time that Gumiho was overextending in terms of expansions or unit composition or, you know, tech rate, it was always Dark scouting it out, recognizing that he has the potential for a kill move, going for it, and then winning the game because of it. So for Maru here in this series, I think it's going to be very important that should he go for greedy plays such as this 3cc opening, he's going to have to keep it in the dark and really not let his opponent know what is coming until he's already in a position where he can properly defend. Right. Now, Dark is generally the master of defense. He's usually very good at holding on and actually getting out more drones than I think pretty much any other Zerg that I can think of in GSL. Uh, and, you know, eventually bouncing back. But uh, he's also very ready to, at the drop of a hat, go super aggro and, and try to come in and hit hard. Now, this game looks like it's going to be one where he really wants to try to tangle with the Terran on their pushes by going 1-1 one, one right away here. I would imagine we're probably going to see a Spire no matter what with the Banelings Nest here. He's going to play basically the classical style of TVZ that we're pretty familiar with, which is going to be uh, Masslings with uh, Banes and, and, and Mutas to, to boot. Yeah, Dark seems to be going kind of half and half between Ling, Bane, Muta and, you know, Road Travager timings and such yeah. like that. And I think, that's, games. I think the fact that he can go between both makes it hard for these other players to prep. Oh. All right, let's see these connections. Six okay. drones going down. That Seven is in fact. so many more kills than I thought was going to happen. Oh, this one's also hasn't even got the shot off yet. He wants his. This is a lot oh, of lost yeah. mining time. Ooh, gamer alert. Uh, for a second, I was confused about what happened. Like, I didn't yeah. see the drone after the cancel. I'm like, wait, did he cancel it and then it died? I'm like, like can a widow mine turn into a spore crawler? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a uh, really effective That's when Blizzard drop. really ruined the main, ruined the game when the Widow Mines fired Spore Crawlers and helped the Zerg out. <laughs> this is still going on, by the way. The mining yeah. here in the main base has been pretty much non-existent. I love what Maru is doing, just burrowing and unburrowing and burrowing and unburrowing and buying as much idle time as possible. Finally does get three lings on the cleanup, and now Dark's out of position to stop this drop. So 1-1 one, one hasn't been completed yet. Ling's out of position. Drone goes down after he gets canceled. The Creep Tumor is getting pushed back a little bit here. Behind this, Maru, keep in mind, he went for that really fast third CC. Now par powering up with three more barracks at home. Okay. The Marines are going to come through here. They're continuing to shave off lanes. Oh, the Widow Mine. Oh! Wow. It was perfectly layered underneath the push itself. Easy to miss. The Medivac was heavily damaged, but it wasn't picked off. 1-1 um, one, one is about to finish here. And, you know... We're seeing Maru, by the way, uh, we were talking about Dark going for that classic style. Well, we're seeing the the Zerg, uh, sorry, the Terran equivalent of that, which is Marine Medivac coming out and sort of uh, canvassing the ground, trying to clean up as many links as possible, then picking up and pulling away. Yeah, behind all this, Maru's been able to secure his third base pretty much undisturbed because of the high pressure he's putting on his opponent right now, as Dark would really love his fourth hatchery, but once again it gets denied. The drone dies. This queen of the front might fall. Instead, it gets transfused by its buddy, able to survive for now. These banelings not able to actually morph in. And upgrades have equalized. It's 1 1. So Dar or Maru, excuse me, just decides to take the trade. Now that surface area not good enough for those lings. Yeah, um, it, it does seem like Maru is coming out slightly ahead over and over. And these little advantages do begin to compound especially when you get bigger and bigger armies. There is a Baneling ambush. Oh, oh my that goodness. Was just, dude, that was so close. Um, there is a Baneling ambush. It's going to try to hit these SCVs. We're going to get a shot of it, I hope. Uh, They're coming yeah, into the third base. Maru's focusing on micro his army, but not too many SCVs going down, 13 in total. I mean, Maru, he's happy just to focus right now on securing this position here at the natural expansion of Zerg is his army supply actually dwarfing and Dark going for a big counterattack during this. Well, I mean, the SCVs are killed, but Maro's position's pretty healthy. This counterattack isn't going to do much. Oh, this and is such a great spot. This is like a really, uh, really difficult position to try to take on because the tanks are getting so much value while never really actually being damaged. And he can even rotate those Marines in with other, or out with other Marines in. Um, another big attack, actually maybe an attempt to intercept reinforcements, and patiently so, uh, Maro's going to pick up and relocate. Now, he is going to get some Marines up here, he's going to siege up, but on the other side of the map, you can see that Maro's quietly trying to send this army up here. Dark does catch the tanks, 
but the rest of the infantry are still going to go up to the northeast. Yeah, this counterattack should get a lot more SCV damage done, but Maru really going below for glow at second and top right. Mainling's actually coming into the mix as well. They will connect with those first couple of lanes. Only three SCVs falling, but the third base right now for Maru completely thwarted from mining. And finally, the lack of transfuse energy really catching up to these queens. As the queen count falls all the way down to five. Another one here should go down momentarily. And Maru keeping the pressure up, now attacking the third base. And really bringing oh. through the main. We might be at that moment. When those tanks went down, well, hold on. Yeah, actually, this push in the main, it's a lot. Oh, no, oh, he right no. clicked. He right clicked. Yeah, those were not on attack move. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad situation right now for Maru. He had so much momentum a moment ago, but bailing connections, big ones, both on the right side and here in the main base, leads to Maru equalizing in military supply against his opponent now. He was ahead in army supply for a good bit of time coming into this, and now... A wow. little bit worse for wear. It's both of those tanks. Yeah, really nice pickup. That was pretty nice. Bailing, uh, bailing landmines here at this third base, by the way, on the ramp. Oh. I think if, if he had A moved that, yeah. I think he would have killed all the Banes. I think there's no way the Banes actually connect. Would have been close. Maybe one of them gets up there and brings the Marines oh, into the red, but I think boy. they survive. And oh, oh, no. Oh, boy. Yeah, he's just going to take it because it will kill the siege yeah. tank. <laughs> you might as well get what you can take. The, the one Dark Swarm host is out on the map now. <laughs> Behind this, by the way, Dark has been teching all the way up in a hive. Ultra this den underway. 3-3 three, three now coming. 2-2 two, two about to finish here for Maru. And Adrenal Glance also being researched by the Zerg. So he's really about to have, you know, a supremely upgraded Ling Baneling army. And with, with some Ultras added into the mix, too. I mean, should he get shit in his plating, considering how far behind Maru is in upgrades? It might just be a little bit too much. Yeah, uh, you know, when you're only on this limited number of gas, it's a little bit trickier to try to get the ultras out the number that you want, especially if the ultras can be sniped at all. It's a problem. Oh! oh. That was amazing. It was so close. So many moments we have the opposite happen where they just get in. But Maro pops that up. <laughs> I love how the one egg that survives yeah. here is going to be an ultra list someday. He's going to wake up. Yeah, he's going to wake up and be like, what happened to this place I'm from? Oh, right. I think they're going to get into the natural this time. Uh, no, he maybe it up not. In the tank. And Maru doing a good job of fighting back in the army supply. The economic damage on Dark is really starting to add, add up. You know, taking down the top right base and that fourth base over there in the center right position hinders Dark's growth quite a bit. But Dark is fighting back. Keep in mind, Maru, this entire time he has been sitting on three expansions. And this third CC keeps having to lift. The SCVs keep having to evacuate and then repopulate. You know, if. Maru can maybe take the next fight here. I think he can win this. He's going to hit the four, the new fourth base, I should say. I don't know. It's a scary oh. situation, though, Tasteless. Those ultras are heavily upgraded. Shitness plating will finish soon, as well as 3-3. Three, three. Adrenal glands is already done. Okay. These lings are going to absolutely power through. It's going to be a counter attack. Oh, my goodness. But I think he can kite this. I think he can kind of make this work. Yeah, there isn't it enough support here for the ultras. I guess that third base isn't even really mining. Both sides are, you know, really beaten up here. Zerg is going to uh, take in the base all the way in the top right. I guess it's actually finished. Yeah, the Ultilus armor upgrade ha now has finally completed. 3-3 three, three will complete soon as well, but they've already taken a ton of damage. And now you have to wonder, you know, with Dark's economy, is he actually going to be able to remax? It might be too heavy on the Ultras. All right, he's going to kill a lot of these drones over here. There's only a handful of lings on the map right now. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You can watch the Banes, you can watch the Ultras, but really you need to have like a certain amount of lings for those other units to, to do their job. Otherwise, you know, Stim Marines can just kite. Yeah, you need support. Oh, oh! it's not going to get it. So no, close. It finishes. And now these Ultras really become a problem for the Marine. The Marines without plus three ground weapons, they're just going to tickle those things. And so Marauder is probably going to be added, added into the mix here for Maru, I would expect. Although he might just focus a little bit more on Siege Tanks and Liberators, which it seems like is the plan. You know, these Marines, they, they can do so much here. And just running back and forth mm -hmm. and basically uh, over time, you know, chipping away at the hit points. Looks like he's going to set up a kind of position a little bit further back to try to continue uh, to macro up over here. 
He's switching into Marauders with those three barracks now. Yeah, if this is a smart move. He needs something that has actual sustain versus the Ultralisks. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't think that Zerg has like a lot of options. Keep in mind, if the Hive falls, it is a tech reset, which means like Ultralisks are now the game you're playing basically from here on out, unless we get you know a full tech recovery from the Zerg. And the hatchery in the main, I think it's at like maybe a fourth, a third HP. Oh, actually, maybe like a fifth of it's gone. Yeah, he keeps transfusing it. That's why the map okay. is a little bit scuffed there. As Ultra is coming in here on the low ground, able to clean up these tanks. And finally, this position is breached by Dark, but you know his economy has struggled a lot. He's only just now securing his fifth base as Amaru's been playing whack-a-mole with all these Zerg expansions across the map, but. The saturation on the top right base, it's very healthy. Mara's still sitting on only three command centers. That main base almost entirely mined out. You know, nobody is really comfortable economically here. Terran would like to have a fourth base in the works probably, you know, minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Zerg has basically been recovering fourth base over and over and over. Is now up to five, although this base, we're looking at it right now, not exactly the easiest to take. I mean, you could hold it in a drop like that, but if a push with real force comes through, it's a problem. However, what Maro seems to want to go for is really just continuing to make the main this place you got to defend. There's not a lot of creep up here. The Hive is here, and again, that's one way that Zerk can lose that is unique to uh, the way you can lose with any other race. Like, Protoss and, and Terran don't quite have the situation, so there's a tech reset. Yeah. Um, Zerk's going to have to go all the way back in the lair and then Hive if yeah. they want to build any new technology buildings from those structures. Spawning Pool falls as well. And so with that move, I think that with Ghosts and Marauders coming, it looks like it's going to be just Ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is a really tough one. I think that Dark may have one of the most difficult positions at this time of a game that we could ever imagine for a Zerg. And you're seeing it happen here. I mean, these are cheap units. He's getting so much damage. There's so much micromanaging that uh, Dark has to do where he literally gets like no value other than not losing his units. Yeah, and Mara's been doing a great job with these drops of really keeping Dark back in his base and allowing himself to you know, build the army back at home that he needs to actually start to mitigate the threat of these Ultra lists because, you know, seven fully upgraded Ultras, even if they don't have that much of an accompaniment of supporting units, if they're going against pure Marine tank, they can do a lot of damage. But now that Ghosts are added into the mix, now that Mara has a good number of Marauders as well as Liberators also assisting, it's really going to come down to counterattacks here for Dark, and it's also going to come down to the Investor usage. Okay, two Ultras fall, and I mean, you know, the, these counterattacks, it's not a bad idea. I don't know how much they're going to get done. He should be able to scan that. Does he not see it? Oh, he might not know. Yeah. There's so much going on. It, it's wild, you know, in these really hectic, chaotic games, how much Burrow actually works. Yeah, it's very tough to follow. Even with the sensor tower, some, sometimes players still get tripped up on that. Dude, and Mario is getting so much value out of those attacks. He got almost everything out. Yeah, some sea tanks did fall, but really, you know, the linchpin of the defense right now is going to be the, or the offense, I should say, is going to be the Ghost Marine Marauder composition that he's running. Hey, where is the Ultralist Cavern? Ultralist Cavern? I, I actually think don't know. It was by the third base. Because with the hive being reset, by the way, this base is about to fall. If you could kill that, Zerg just has links. Ultra is still building, or still under there construction. It is, yeah, is, it's right by is. that okay. third base. Yeah, in between uh, the second and the third. So probably a place Terran can't get to. These counterattacks are doing a lot of damage, but really the army that Maru has mustered it feels like it might just be unstoppable. And this is a fully healthy base that's getting taken down right now by Maru. So Dark, you know, he's basically going to be on one. I just I saw that ultra in the main. <laughs> you know, he's like, oh, no, I can't, I can't do it, I can't hide here. <laughs> they see me. Dark's really on only one mining base fully, that top right expansion. And Maru's army is not getting any weaker here. I mean, he's going to come forward again. I see one ultra. Uh, second one comes in now. Yeah, there's not enough transfuse energy either. Seven queens, none of them to be found here on the middle ground. And I think Dark has basically run out of steam at this point. Maru has been able to take out enough bases and buy himself enough time to get the composition that he needs, the economic advantage that he needs to take game number one here against Dark. Yeah, there it is, GG. Maru takes game one. What a hell of a game that was. I'll tell you, really cool approach from Maru. He basically identified that like, you know, Dark's going to be too stable if I try to push it here, but he did organically soften up a position in the main. 
And so it was like, you know, in House of the Dead when the boss comes out and he's like almost invincible, but then like his chest opens up and it shows his heart. So you fire <laughs> your gun in the air. That's what he did to Dark. It's a beautiful analogy. He did. He just, it was the boss fight. But you just shoot. You, it's like, and then the final part like opens up on his knee and like it doesn't show the whole time. You keep shooting your gun in there. That's what Maru did to Dark back there. And killing the Hive. I mean, suddenly all, you know, most of the time Zerg have a whole buffet of options of tech and ways they can play the game. Not anymore, my friend. You've been reset. And even though Dark played very well, Mara was ultimately able to then, with a very direct push, close that game out. Yeah, Mara was able to navigate the mid-game and late game so artfully there against Dark. And you got to wonder where Dark's going to stand here in the later stages of the game. Keep in mind, he's 3-0 against Gumiho. All of those were very early finishes. They were all timing attacks. We'll see if he's able to fight back here in game number two. 2023 GSL Season 2 DKZ Gaming Dark Side gaming, Maru. Okay, it's going to be that same build, I think, uh, from Maru. We got the first barracks there. We'll see if another SCP comes down uh, and makes a second. It almost certainly will. Yeah. We should keep in mind as well that Maru and Bion, very good friends. They share yeah, a lot of builds together. So they share their ideas together a ton. You can even see them in that fun little pre-match interview that we had where they can they can joke around with each other. And I guarantee you that Beyond helped him prepare for this eventuality here at the top four. Should Mar Maru be meet Dark in the finals, you know that Beyond has his back. You know that he helped assist him on his way in. And you can really see that starting to shine through a little bit here as Maru's almost fully adopted this style in the first couple of games. By the way, I mean, that really says a lot about Beyond and the impact he's had uh, on the whole Terran meta, that you're you're seeing something that was so explicitly his build, and now Maru's using it. Yeah, it does go to show, you know, once somebody can set the bar and really prove, like, establish a proof of concept the way that Beyond did in Season 1, and also here in right. Season 2, eventually other players are going to catch on. And for Terrans now, it's just one more tool that they have in their belt. In this matchup, where they can bust it out at any time, and there's so many different ways of opening off of this build, sometimes we'll see players go for, you know, four barracks into stim and combat shields, plus one ground weapons, and just absolutely book it with Marines, no medevacs, very early pushes. We saw that in season one. You can also tech up very quickly. You can go into three command center very quickly, as we just saw in the previous game. And it's very difficult for Zerk to scout because the wall and it's all the way down there in the natural expansion. You can't sneak any lings up into the main ramp and get a little peek inside the main base that way. And there's almost always a good number of Marines, which you can also hide very well because your wall in is just so sturdy there in the front. You don't need to build a bunker or have this supply depot that's kind of flimsy walled under the natural expansion. Yeah. You only need to show a handful of Marines, whether you're going for barracks, whether you're going for a third command center or a factory in the starport, like a two-on-one. It doesn't matter. And so for Zergs, they don't have as much information on what the Terrans are preparing to do. And for a player like Maru, who, as Dark said, basically has thousands of builds at his disposal. He can truly utilize the say, the full Terran arsenal the same way that Gumiho can. And then it becomes very tricky because Zerg is the reactive race, has to try to identify what problem it is they need to solve and then navigate the game to a solution. At any time that Terran can delay the answer for Zerg in terms of you know what the problem is they have to find, well then suddenly it becomes way more difficult for them to actually win the game. Yeah, I, very well said. Um, this game, it's going to be a third CC. So, you know, you're keeping the Zerg guessing a little bit. Um, the three Reapers, which, by the way, I mean, it, it's a, it kind of exemplifies the flexibility of the build. You could just get three. That's the norm, even, with this yeah. build, is just three Reaper opening. Mm -hmm. 
And three uh, Reapers, as opposed to the one Reaper that was popularized before in GSL, you can actually start killing tumors. You can right. actually force a ton of lings. And even if you're not getting direct damage on drones, at least you are forcing that larva to be used in military. He's going to wrap around down here, just try to be as much of a nuisance as possible. We're in the phase of the game where the Zerg is just trying to chain the, the creep together with the three bases so that you could traffic units easily back and forth. Um, and so, you know, right now it looks like there won't be too much oh. eventful stuff happening here. Um, we're basically going to see uh, Terran try to just build up steadily into that third base. This is a high-speed Ling Reaper chase we're seeing. This is crazy. Well, they get it's the like last action one. Movie. Yeah. And this seems to be pretty much the same build that we saw from Maru in game number one. Going for a four medevac, or four, uh, what am I drop, excuse me, with that medevac. Dart going for his lair, getting his baneling nest up, still droning. Very comfortable position right now is the one Reaper, the lone survivor from that earlier chase. And just to live another day. And now, Mar Maru's gonna move out on the map with this, but I think he's just gonna try and feign a little bit of pressure. He wants Dart to stop droning, he wants Dart to build some lings, because Maru back at home is trying to catch up on work account with that third command center. Yeah. Um you got to be careful, though, whenever you have the uh, uh, Widow Mine drop. I mean, let's not forget what happened in game one, where it's like, the what was it, seven drones were killed, and then one was turned into a spore crawler? Remember Might have that? been even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is, you know, he literally flies in between the overlords. Yeah, Dark much more well prepared this time. But oh, fantastic positioning right there, right behind the mineral. That's going to be a big connection. Every single Widow Mine gets out. He might have not gotten as many drones as before, but he certainly got his worth and Lings. And now the Medivac is going to count, is going to scout the Spire Tasteless. So Mario yeah. knows exactly what is coming. Yeah, this is pretty good. Um, by the way, you know, last time I was talking about how I thought he was going to go for Spire, and it didn't happen this time. Uh, he is going to go for it. Um, I think last game he, he might have gone for it if it wasn't for that Widow Mine drop. It just set him back so much that you can't really oh, afford to go into the Mutas. Yeah, I was it's wondering, because one, one started now. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I thought maybe like, oh, is there like some new thing where you never go Spire if you go 1-1? One, one? I don't think that makes sense, but now I see he's doing it again. Some players will do it, but Dark has been favoring Muta play sometimes. And uh, oh my goodness, oh. is this base unprepared. Can you get the Baneling Nest? Probably better to get the Queens and the uh, drones here. Yeah, get the guaranteed damage. Oh my goodness. How many? There's only eight lings on the map? Wait a second. I didn't realize the situation was so dire. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. You, you, you don't lose the drones, and you think, okay, great, I'm fine. Well, oh. now you can actually be hit by Marines, where before the lings always made it impossible if you don't ever hold your ground. Stay! Yeah, that Widow Mine's gonna get another one. Oh, Two it's more. A double. By the way, I, I honestly think if Mara had just sit on that natural expansion. This game might just be over right now, but he's playing it very safe. He's going back home. He doesn't know exactly where Dark's economy is at, although he knows it's not in a good place. But he didn't want to lose those two Marines to, you know, some Banelings coming in with speed and some Mutalists focusing down the Medivac. So instead, he's just going to regroup. And now that makes this push even scarier. 31 Marines on the field right now, pushing against a very low number of Lings. I mean, the Baneling connections here have to be huge. There's four Queens, 30 Lings, eight Banelings, on the map, 1-1 one, one about to finish for both players. And I don't see any world where Dark holds this base unless he gets some of the best bailing hits we're going to see. Infantry attacks about to finish. That's before a single bailing can, can connect over here. I don't think the Evos are going to be killed off. I don't know that Zerk wants to even wait for the 1-1 one, one to try oh. to hit. Oh, hold on. He is going to get it. He is transfuses. Get it. No transfuses. Oh, he saves it. He saves it. But at what cost? And the Banelings not getting the most efficient hits right there. Everything gets focused down. Dark is still going for the counterattack at Maru's third base. And now the, ba the Marines just stem forward. There's nothing to stop him. Oh, and you just see uh, Dark lurch forward in his chair. GG. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. What I mean, a great series so far. But I'm getting a little worried this might be one a one-sided one. Yeah, Maru just seemed to have the perfect read on that after the first Widow Mine drop. I mean, not only did the Widow Mines in the main base kill so many Zerglings, but then he scouts the Spire. He knows that Dark is investing these resources into upgrades for his Zerglings and to getting, you know, eventually Mulisks out on the map. And it was such a fragile time for the Zerg economy. Mar just comes in with that double medevac drop. It doesn't get spotted. It comes into the main base. The Queens are split off from each other in two separate groups. Mar is able to isolate them. And it was just one of the best trades you can get with any drop. And I legitimately think that one drop 
had the potential just to end up the game straight up, but Maru, he's very smart. He's not going to risk it. Yeah. He pulls back, he comes with one big push, and there's nothing that can stop it. Getting those links. It's a funny moment you don't normally cast is that Dark was set up to sponge the shots from the links. Mm -hmm. And instead of Maru picking up and trying to reconfigure, he just kills the links and goes, My turn. Yeah. I'm going to come in with a drop. And it really snowballed from there. Well, Maru's halfway there. Dark, by the way, he's losing in ways we don't normally see. He really is, I mean, in that case, it, uh, dying kind of before mid game really gets to where it needs to be. Uh, really unheard of for Dark. And then, of course, in game one, I mean, losing the main. Again, how many games have you ever seen, if you've watched StarCraft for a long time, like many of you have, that Dark loses his main? Maru looking so strong today. 2023 GSL Season 2. KZ Gaming, Dark. <laughs> Onside Gaming, Maru. It's looking good. The Maru Baru man. The what? Maru Mar Baru man again. <laughs> joke sucks. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on, Beyond's build, go! You know the talking points. I just completely missed that the first time that you said it. Then no, you said okay. it again, and it's just like, you know. I was like, is this funny? And then I said it out loud, I'm like, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's like most of what I say. No, um, you're a very funny guy, Tasteless. Um, yeah, it's the same opening here from Maru. Chica Barrick, Summit, Low Ground. Um, I wonder whether he's going to do the exact same opening that we saw in game number one and game number two, because those builds were identical yeah. all the way through. The four Widowmine drop, both in game one and in game two, although it accomplished a different, how, how should I say this? It accomplished, uh, I want to say like it accomplished different accomplishments, but that just sounds like so stupid. But <laughs> <laughs> it achieved different It achieved different goals. The first yeah. one was able to take down a lot of drones. The second one killed all of these lings. And in game number one, the drones Falling like that really set Dark behind tempo-wise. If he wanted to go Mutalisks, it no longer seemed like it was possible. He instead stayed on Ling Bane, played for a faster Hive, went for Adrenal Glands and Ultralisks, but Maru was just able to out-micro him and eventually whittle him down. And then in game number two, the Widowmine drops, although they didn't kill very many drones, they killed a large cluster of Lings. Yes. And that was at a critical time where the Zerg was trying to bank resources for these upgrades, for Mutalisks eventually because the Spire was coming, which the Bedevac also scouted. And so once he saw that, Mars just like, okay, I'm going to fully commit now to this drop. 16 Marines come in, and Dark is basically at death's door right from the beginning. And the fact that the build accomplished two different objectives in two different games, and it still worked so incredibly well, it makes me think that I wouldn't really mind to see Maru bring that out at least once more in this series. The exact same variant. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, uh, and sometimes that's the scariest style where it's like you kind of know what they're doing. And there's not much to it other than that it's efficient and well rounded. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets the job done. Ooh. Oh, hello. He's mixing it up, though. So, so this is a, a pretty, pretty crazy uh, variation of this build. So he makes two more barracks in the main. By the way, if you want to win a best of seven, um, sometimes this is a great way to do it, is to have one starting opener, but it actually branches into like five or seven different openers from there. Where every time you're, you think your opponent's going to adapt because they start to see the same thing, there's another twist and another turn. Especially if all the openings look the exact same way and you can't scout beyond that point. Right. Which is exactly what this Beyond build does with the two barracks on the low ground as Dark. And his vision is just abysmal. The only thing that he has close to scouting Maru's base is an overlord of the natural expansion, where Maru can basically decide how what information he wants to feed to his opponent. And so for now, the roaming continues on. I think, you know, for anybody watching, I think the idea here for what Maru is going to do couldn't be more straightforward. He's going to attack with a lot more units than you would normally expect. Just like in the last game, he got that third command center up. And, you know, by the way, last game, I don't think he ever expected for Widow Mines to connect to Lings and then he dropped with Marines. It just sort of organically went that way. And so he found the opening. 
and intuited that there was a, a, a way that he could make it work. This time, he's just going to push, and it must be because of the way the Overlords would be positioned on the map. I can only imagine that's why you would do this. Mm. That he's going to try to go around through a blind spot and then kick in the door. He's going to come through and start trying to stim down as much as possible and snowball the damage. Yeah, there's a ton of Marines on the field right now for Maru, and Dark is and going for Roach Tag. I'm assuming that you come in through the left side of the minimap outside the Terran's entrance? Yeah, I That think has so. to be it, right? Well, then he just goes right oh, through the middle, and we both look dumb. What do you think about that? <laughs> you didn't have to say anything at all. Oh, oh! he's pulling the boys. I actually Whoa. can't believe this. As CV said to Pede. Wow, okay. Well, this Dark is really the, does this work? I, there's no banelings, so those SMBs are going to take a ton oh. of damage right now. It's well, only going to be roaches coming out for a dark. He has basically yeah. no lings on the map. Oh no, he just built four more drones, and Overlord's going to fall. Yeah, this is why he doesn't go around. By the way, that answers that question. He's more interested in getting there quickly than trying to, you know, have you not see him at all. All right, Sim now coming in. SCVs are taking on the left side. Roach is connecting with Marines on the right. The transfuses, not enough energy on these queens. They're very few and far between. Run Roach does get transfused, oh but it feels like Maru, God. he might be starting to break through. Tasteless. So many drones fall. Uh, the queens, one still alive. The Roach is here to tank. But keep in mind, there are, is no medevac coming with this push. He's going to go over here to the these side. Marines. He wants drones. Yeah, he's got to kill drones to equalize right now. All these Marines basically one or two hits away from death. As Dark with his Remax on Roaches and Lynx should be able to start to clean this up. And so now Maru, he's hunting for drone kills. He's gotten 20 in total and things are starting to equalize. But really Maru back at home, his economy, it's in shambles. He's at 21 SCVs. Not only did he pull the boys, but he cut SCV production as well. This is wild, man. Um. Okay, so 40 workers for Dark, 23 for Maru. This is actually not good for Maru. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, without medevacs, keep in mind, imagine if there were medevacs there, that game would have ended. Absolutely. The Marines would have just healed up and, and the remaining units would have been killed off. But instead, the stim, um, it, it finishes, and I actually think Dark can survive this. It does feel that way now. He's yeah. happily drawing back up to 51 workers to the 27 SCVs from Maru. And in the factory and the third command center are coming down now for Maru. And you know, oftentimes we see this four barracks opening from, from Terrans and it's able to work. Yeah, um, this is, it's funny. Whenever you see the SCVs pulled like that, it's dramatic, but when it doesn't end the game, uh, development is so hard to pull off. What it looks like Maru wants to do is, is try to draw some attention on one side of the map and then run in with Marines on the other. Now the army supply and the worker supply is actually way better for Dark. So I mean, I, I would imagine Dark is fully aware that like there's only a few more things that can be done here for Maru and all he has to do is swat this down and we're gonna be in game four. Yeah, it is starting to feel that way. I mean, oftentimes we see this four barracks opening and should it not be able to get too much damage done, the Terran just walks back home with Marines. There's nothing that can really fight them off creep on the map that Zerg can have at that stage in the game. And then, you know, a factory comes in, a starport comes in, a third command center comes down. And we go into a later game. Right. Sometimes we'll go into like a truly late game TWZ from that position despite it being a four barracks opening. But because the SDVs got pulled there from Maru and he was not able to equalize the damage with drone kills there at the third base, it does kind of feel like Dark is running away with this one. Even the engineering base coming in from Maru are so late. I mean, we're soon going to have a wealth of plus one carapace roaches going up against unupgraded damage-wise marines. I think it's a matter of time before it's Dark's turn to, to have an attack over here that probably ends the game. The third CC is going to get lifted. Now, Maru's not dead. Somebody doesn't die to the next attack, but he needs to get another base up. He needs to get into a, a comfortable, safe spot. Um, but this is really Dark's game to lose, I, I think. It does feel that way. I wonder whether Dark is going to wait for Maru to try and take this third base and then come in with a max push, similar to what we saw him use to defeat Gumiho, or if he's going to try and play for a later game knowing that he already has this edge. And usually when Zerg are in the position in the game where they can actually start to make decisions like this, it's a very comfortable spot where you don't have to be quite as reactive as you would normally. So the medevacs are going to be driven out once more. I mean, Maru trying to do what he, he does. 
if you look back on those Gumiho games, um, I think Dark's victory here that is probably inevitable. I mean, we'll see what Mario can do. It is Mario after all, but I think that Dark's victory is going to look a lot like one of those Gumiho games where it's like, okay, Terran player, you had your turn. Now is mine. I'm going to max out at a 190 supply-ish and just attack you. Yeah, it really does feel that way, especially with how many roaches there are on the field right now. 40-plus, yeah. and yeah, Dark finally moving across the map. He's cutting at 67 drones, no more in production. 11 Ravagers morphing in. And just the right number of roaches back at home to deal with this. Yeah, they have plus one carapace too. Still no plus one infantry weapons on Maru, although it should finish in time for this fight. But you got to think that with a Ravager count this healthy and with this many roaches on the front line, Dark's just going to be able to pounce on these tanks. There's nothing that's yeah. going to stop him. The tank count's not high enough either to where, like, you know, uh, groups are going to get obliterated here and there. And there's still tanks uh, somewhere in the back. SCVs are going to come out. This is probably going to be Maru in his death throes right now. Yeah, I mean, he is breaking through a little bit on the left side, but there's just so many more roaches and ravagers over there in the top right. And although it might look like Maru is starting to stabilize with his force of Marines here on the left, I mean, the supply is really tough to tail. 30 SCVs dead. Another siege tank about to fall here at the natural ramp. Yeah, and it's going to be the next attack that might kill him. Assuming that uh, Maru's even going to stay in the game for that long. Maru really trying an alternative strat when the stakes couldn't be higher. Um, but it doesn't pay off. Again, so many workers going down here. So many more roaches just, uh, you know, all uh, marching across the map. Yeah, and 183 supply to 77. I think once these reinforcements come in, yeah, that's going to be a GG. Dark gets on the board, 2-1. Yeah. to one. Very cool to see. And so, um, Dark gets his first win, but it's kind of a weird win. Not all wins are created equally. I, I, I mean, obviously on the scoreboard they are, but he basically shot down Maru's crazy all-in. But Maru doesn't have to do all-ins if he doesn't want to. And the two times before this that Maru didn't do an all-in, he did just fine and won and was in that lead. Even if Maru had gone for this opening, same set of units, same set of upgrades, but conceded SCV production and not pulled the SCVs with that attack, I feel like he would have been in a playable position. You know, you right. come in, you stim forward, maybe you snipe a couple of queens, maybe you kill some roaches, and then you retreat back, and you don't stim again. And it's a playable position, you know? You're gonna be a little bit slower in terms of tempo than the Zerg, but we've seen Kerr be able to do something like this before in GSL against good opponents. And right something that's absolutely viable. All right, guys, short break. When we come back, the GSL Season 2 Finals continues on. Yeah, 
이렇게까지 극단적으로 잡아요. 네. 아, 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 정상 공진 쪽에 해방선 드디어 도착인데 그렇음에도 아, 너무 타이밍과 조합이 좋습니다. 공진 아, 아까 이제 무난하게 너무 깔끔한데요. 타이밍 해방선 네. 한 개가 더 왔고요. 이마저도 정상을 아, 그리지 못했습니다. 서양 3리지 그러니까 엄청나게 클 걸로 예상이 되죠. 네, 뒤에 지금 개별춘 하나도 그래서 이것도 막는다고 해도 이게 막을 게 맞나 싶을 정도의 피해가 예상이 되죠. 와, 이야, 이거 싸네요. 생산이 보통 네. 경쟁에서 엄청 아쉽게 느껴질 거고. 그래서 좀 손해가 발생해요. 네. 아, 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 이런 거군요. 이거의 병력이 너무 초라한데요. 자, 이 병력 수비하는 병력 숫자를 좀 줄이고 있는 상황인데요. 숫자도 아, 높고요. 네, 병력 볼게요. 아, 나열 팀이 응원해 주지만 조. 이게 결국은 조블링이 활약할 수 있거든요. 특히 공격자. 아, 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 이거. 공격자 약간 쓰였으면 불면당해서 못하는 모양을 그 찾기 위해 가는데. 아, 입금 받아요. 시네마틱은 시네마틱일 뿐! 네, 세게 박아버리는데요. 박세란에 대한 최후의 자! 지지! 또 기리키 때문에 그거 믿고 어떤 사진으로 싸움을 걷는데 뒤잡혔어요! 그렇죠. 아, 그건 놓쳐. 공정보다 하자마자! 야, 이 도강 들어가죠. 바로 언덕을 뺐습니다. 네, 뭐 방패 차이니 아 들어갑니다. 공만업이 돼서 거의 의미 없죠. 네, 자, 여기도 병력. 자, 위로 좀 들어가면서요. 아, 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 남전 차이! 아, 이거 뭐야, 남전 차이! 아니, 왜 하필 남전 차이! 아, 이거 아, 아, 비싸요, 그냥. 와, 이거 낙하. 바로 들어오고 있는 상황인데요. 어, 이미 피해 두죠. 아, 이거. 아, 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 기아상 파이널스 다크 마루 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹 같은 하루에서 답답함을 빼면 더 청량해질 거야. 제로처럼. 우리 없어도 되는 건 빼고 살자. 칠성사이다 제로. 여름이 왔다. 마음껏 청량하자. 청량한 순간에 언제나 칠성사이다. 우주급 텐션 최고의 토킹 핫식스 토킹. A weird two base all in basically that backfires and dark wins. 
I don't think this is necessarily a good sign for Dark. Yeah, that, that win does not make me much more confident in his ability to take out Mario in later games. I don't think Mario's going to go back to that strategy at all. I don't think so. I don't think it was a very good strategy, even against what Dark was doing, which seems like yeah. it wasn't the worst case scenario because there weren't Banelings, but still the bus doesn't work. It seems like it's one of those builds that Mario's had for a while, and he thought, all right, game one and game two went so well. Let's, let's try this one out. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do you ever see a build where Terran just pulls SCVs like that. A lot of times, it's like, okay, you're kind of ahead. A lot of times, it's against Protoss. Like you think you can do the damage before Splash gets there, but yeah, funny game. Yeah, it was a it was a funky one. But game one and game two, I mean, the build that he went both those times, going for the two on one with the third command center, the yeah. Widow Mind drop, both times just looked very solid. I wouldn't be surprised if he went back to that or some kind of variant on it. You know, maybe not with a Widow Mind drop, maybe with some Hallians or something else. But it's been very good for Maru thus far in this tournament. You know, it, he's been looking been. solid since those first two losses against Kira. And so uh, we're going to go into game four now. And it's essential that Dark wins this. Now, Dark is losing in games that are, um, I mean, look, game one was pretty epic. It was cool to see Mario take out the main. Game two was, was a very circumstantial game that we almost rarely ever see uh, a game quite like that in a ZVT. All the Lings are killed. He, ha he put the Lings there to absorb the uh, Widow Mine shot. Normally, you always use ideally one Ling to absorb a mm -hmm. shot. Things happen so fast, he kind of like held position his lings in, a, in an L shape. Yeah, it was like an arc around the Widow Mines. Yeah, and so I think maybe two drones were killed and all the lings were killed. But so many lings were killed that Morrow knew he could just drop now. Normally, in the early game, it's a combination of queens hitting the medevac and then the lings surrounding all the, um, the marines on the ground that force the Terran to lift up and they have to find another place to stay. Without the lings, or at least a high number of lings, the Terran just roams through the base killing stuff, and Dark died outright. Uh, and then the fact that Dark loses in game one uh, to a push, uh, you know, like, I guess all Zergs, that's how they lose, right, is to right. a push. But to lose like that, it's kind of a scary sign because what it shows is that it seems like Morrow's early game fundamentals and his late game fundamentals are fine. He doesn't have to do anything really fancy at all. And if he does, in this case, it backfires, but... We all know there's a big range of ways that Terran could play. Yeah, we haven't even seen Mara really go to the late game in TPZ2, which I think is what sets him apart from basically every other Terran player in the world, is how well he's able to navigate the late game, how he's able to build up, you know, the perfect defense and then navigate himself to the perfect army composition and just play the cost-efficient game. He hasn't needed to do that so far to go up 2-1 in this series. And considering what a shaky victory it was for Dark in game number three, although it still is a win, I wonder whether he's going to be able to come back now and continue this streak and build some momentum. This is music. It's dramatic. It is. is this the Elden Ring DLC? This is. <laughs> is this an Elden Ring boss fight? Is it Maru? Do we have to fight Maru? I, I like GSL, <laughs> but where are the organs? I need more organs. Church <laughs> organs, please. Uh, Altitude is going to be map four here as we go into this next map. Now, if it's 3-1, it's going to be extremely difficult for Dark to recover. Fingers crossed for Dark's sake. You can tie it up 2-2. Two to two. 2023 GSL Season 2 DKZ Gaming Dark Side gaming, Maru. Okay, well here it is again. We've got the barracks in the low ground. I don't think we're gonna have games without this. I think or we'll have at least one proxy racks. Sure, yeah, we need one proxy, proxy racks, racks game. But I guess if we don't have anything that's like crazy, um, I would imagine Maru just sticks with this. Yeah, it seems like it doesn't matter, you know, what the architecture of the map is really, whether it's going to be a high ground natural expansion or a low ground natural expansion. He's just comfortable going for this two barracks play. 
on the low ground. And you know, thus far in game number one and game number two, the three Reapers into Widow Mine Drop worked very effectively for him. Game number three, the all in was not that good as Dark Fan here in the audience. I know, I agree. Hashtag Dark Win. Yeah, man. Um, I am curious to see how uh, Maru decides to mix it up, though, beyond beyond, beyond the SCV pool, <laughs> which was just kind of, you know, him just yeah. going for something a little bit zany after being up 2 0. Yeah, you know, and I think there is, there's like a certain level when you're ahead, it's especially in best of sevens, because you can get so far ahead where it's like, well, I mean, it seems like you've got this. And, you know, it's not just about like trying to make that build work. It's like, well, if you win with this, it's even easier to close it out later. Um, but, you know, hey, here we are. It didn't, it didn't work. It did backfire. So, curious to see exactly what Maru is going to bring to the table this time around. Yeah, I, I wonder that. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. I don't, I, I'd be, let's see, he could even try to mech, you know, off of this build. It's that possible. would be another crazy variation. Um, oh, some nice micro there by Maru. I'm actually surprised Dark was able to throw the Spore Crawler down. Yeah, it was kind of a funny interaction that happened there. And, you know, he's just going to keep sending these uh, these three Reapers up here and trying to get done whatever he can, he can pull off. Yeah, third Reaper now rallying across the map. Tech Lab and Reactor coming down at home for Maru. So, pretty standard setup there for him. And his mineral count, I wonder if this is just be a third CC. Yeah, it's looking yeah. like it. There it is. And you know what? I mean, are we really that surprised with the success he already had in game two? Oh, and this is a really nice t timing for Dark to come in with this Overlord as well, as he actually yeah. got to confirm the third CC play. I think this is the first time in this series where Dark has been able to actually get some meaningful information from that first Overlord yeah. on the opening from our, especially this early on. I'm glad you point that out, Stake, because I think it's it's so important. Um, I mean, it, it's easy to watch these games from both perspective and kind of it, it feels like you really, you know, they both know what each other are doing and it doesn't matter. And, you know, uh, is he going to get this queen? It's going to be very yeah. close. He's going to get it. Oh, are my and it God. escapes. It escapes. That's wild. I can't believe it. It baits them off creep because he just keeps attacking the hatchery. Dark can't let that stand. And then the grenades, he just kind of pushes them where he wants them to be. That's amazing. He's gonna get a tumor uh, too. Yeah. Queen's like, you killed my friend. Dude, that's wild, man. Absolutely. How often to, how many how often do we see a queen fall to Reapers early in the well, game? Well it's like funny because we see Reapers and Queens and them interact and it's so common that I, I a lot of times don't talk about it because I'm you know I think there's value in play by playing certain things and not other things and then like that happens where it's like, wait a minute? Is he gonna get this? And he does, and doesn't even drop a Reaper. Yeah, they're able to make their way all the way back home. Looks like it's gonna be a two one one behind the three CC, so factory. About to complete. We'll see what add-ons he decides to go for with that. And Dark going for a relatively fast Roach Warren again. Sitting on 49 drones. I really want to see that production tap for Dark right now. Because I, I don't expect him. I was going to say, I wouldn't expect him to go for any kind of timing attack. This soon, even though Mara's been going for 3cc and Dark's timing attack against Gumi Ho's, three command center builds were so effective in the semifinals, but... Yeah. yeah, just going to continue droning his dark. Maru just powering up back at home, adding in his third barracks, double engineering bay, starport as well. It seems like it's just going to be some more marine medevac play from Maru, just right out of the gate. Yeah, here comes that third CC. Um, you know, right now, a couple roaches coming out here for dark. Basically enough to, to toe the line if Terran does try to do anything. Keep in mind that um, in that last game, we had, uh, not the last game, the, the second game, I should say, uh, we had kind of an unusual interaction where you know, a harass build is coming out, and you, it's always good to harass when your third base is, is landing because it keeps the Zerg defending and it makes it easier to kind of get things set up, uh, and you might get value. But he actually like kind of won the game with the harass, which is extremely rare at like the highest of levels. Um, but in, in um, you know in, in this game, I would imagine this is going to be more normal. He's going to be pushing out, poking out, and trying to get stuff done. 
Uh, he did seem to maybe go under the radar, those uh, overlords here. Yeah, but Dark is setting up here at the high ground, so he's going to be well equipped to deal with his push. The tumors will fall, but Maru not going to get very much more than that as the roach count is really high for Dark. Oh, he's not enough no. room. That's so sad. They drew straws. Oh, oh he's, he's going to make, make it. it. He's going to resent those Marines when they get back home. Um, the tank's going to come out now. We're probably not going to see anything too committed until the next set of barracks and factories. Um, you know, get get positioned in over here. Uh, sometimes on some maps, Terrans know like pretty abusive spots to put tanks, especially when they get about three of them, where it's like really hard to ever reach them. Guys, yeah, I expect we're just gonna have more drop harassment like this. I mean, any damage you can find like overlords or killing creep tubers does go a long way. It adds up over the course of a full game. Especially now in two two different locations like this. I mean, being able to completely thwart the creep spread extending out of this third base means that, you know, later on, nice picks here by Maru. He really, need, he really knows how to toe the line in these engagements and just take enough of a trade. Yeah. And it's beneficial for him, and then he, he pieces out as soon as it's as soon as it's going badly. And by the way, uh, Tasos, Nidus Canal yeah. under construction here for Dark. It's funny, you know, we had so many TVZs today, but we didn't have any Niduses. It's, sometimes it's easy to forget. They have it if you don't see it in a little bit. Um, this Nidus, I mean, there's this really easy spot right in the main that he could hit. That's going to be a 1-1 one -one timing with Nidus, too, should Dark decide to go for that. Ooh, these vials kind of connecting at least some of them. That was pretty good right there. Dark ballooning in supply right now with this incredible roach count, and you have to wonder when Maru's going to catch wind of this. Because he's not able to find any damage. So he's got some roaches out here at the entrance. He wants to try to draw uh, some defense over here, and this is right where the Nidus is going to come in. Now, does Maru realize this? He's, he's oh, pretty... He, he's stemmed. Yeah, I think go, he knows. Go, 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 go. Yeah, this isn't going to be able to do very much. Yeah, but still, the fact that he was able to force Maru all the way back is yeah. damage in and of itself, you know? That third base had to lift off. Some SUVs did fall behind it. It's a good point. And now right. he's contained, and he can just use this Nidus Canal to fully reinforce the front line here. All right, so now he's going to start to try to shell anything that he can reach up here at the entrance. Yeah, he has to start working on that wall if he really wants to try and breach this position. And, oh, I love this by Maru going, going for a huge drop with four metabacks. Yeah. Um, if he could maybe try to shell the, uh, the barracks over here, that would be pretty handy. There are four, with the four medevacs inbound here towards the southern part of the map. I'm not clear on what's actually back here to defend. We haven't had a shot of what Dark has, uh, has back here in a little bit. He's sent a couple units back home, but I don't know if it's going to be enough to handle four medevacs of units. I mean, these roaches are just going to get shredded by these Marines. That hatchery already at half HP will get taken out. And now Dark's back on a three-base economy. He's starting to transition out of this composition, adding in an infestation pit. But oh this is God. a bit of a scary position here for Dark. Yeah, I mean, Dark's played a really good mid game. He, he mustered up all of the Roaches and Ravagers. Terran's still stuck here on two bases. I mean, they're both trading blows right now, and Dark, he's still sitting at max. I guess with the bank that he's gotten, this is okay for him. Or really doesn't have the resources to break outside of his natural base just yet. So the medevac picks up here. Meanwhile, another attack in over on this side. Now this plus two infantry weapons doing work right now here for Maru. Now Maru, you know, he's he's got a pretty scary army. He just hasn't been able to move out with it. I, I do think this is more advantageous for Dark, just the whole setup here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a lot of money in the bank right now that he can remax out on as well. And he's still able to deny this third base. Maru being a little bit timid here. It feels like it's a very tough spot for Terran to try to fight back from, doesn't it? Yeah, especially, I mean, the Ravagers just being able to bile down takes makes it so much more complicated. Because should Dark be able to close distance on that, and you lose those tanks, then suddenly you're just getting overwhelmed on the ground. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Marines do well against Roaches when there's enough Marines, but considering the army supply right now for Dark, R is really going to have to rely on the siege tanks here. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a lot. And again, the supply trade out is scary. The Marines stim in. Morrow realizing he's got the upper uh, hand in that fight. A decent number of tanks stay alive. And the supplies on both sides plummet. Yeah, that was a pretty cost efficient trade there for Maru. Yeah, it was better than I thought. But these Marines are starting to make pretty quick work of these Roaches. And Zerg, you know, they, they can't be on Roaches forever. There's a reason why these units have a time and a place. I mean. Yeah, I feel like Maru is actually starting to break free of this position. Holding that third base was so critical. You know, I really thought when Dark had that set up outside of his base that maybe he was just going to, like, be able to, you know, abuse that position so much. But when the drop came in, it, it scared the Zerg off of it. Then it seems like Dark wanted to try to trade in. Only the trade kind of backfired. Mm -hmm. um, and look, I mean, Dark still has more supply, but Roach Ravager, you know, it's kind of a funny thing. Roach Ravager uh, takes up a pretty remarkable amount of supply compared to other unit comps. Oh, he's trying to catch him on Siege. Uh, Mar with a quick Siege up, though. I mean, this is close enough. You can still hit the hatchery and fish the roaches back in here. Is this going to work? Yeah, this hatchery's going to go yeah, down. Dark is going this. for a counter. I mean, I think you could just lift and keep pushing. Am I wrong about this? Yeah, he's going to yeah. have to hold the natural base. And oh, the oh! biggest fungals ever connecting right now but, on Maru. But they don't quite connect. Yeah, they didn't get the kills. Yeah. The connections were good, but there wasn't a combination with Biles to actually kill enough of those Marines. And if Maru is still able to stabilize here at his natural expansion. There's almost no energy in these medivacs. And Fester's also very low on energy. I think that Dark okay. might have one more fungal left. Now, hold on a second. It's three base versus three base. Maru is actually on four base. Now he's set up the spot. He can keep shelling here. I mean, there's so many siege tanks here. Yeah, but not many infantry on the ground to support. So the siege tanks are going to get cleaned up right now by Dark coming in on two sides. Still, this is a relatively cost-efficient trade for Maru. Yeah, you know, I, okay, so, yeah, I mean, Maru, I think, still kind of comes out ahead there. Yeah, I agree with that. And all he has to do is retreat and go back to his base. So Dark doesn't know about 12. Oh. Dark's literally not scouted that. I was wondering about this because, you know, Dark is normally pretty good, even if it's like three roaches, setting them up to that spot uh, and just making sure your workers aren't mining. So this is like uh, a back and forth, but there's this one error in Dark's play. Oh, my God. The missing turret finishes at a perfect, perfect time. I think that, the, that one of the burrowed roaches is going to sneak around and spot the uh, command center. Yeah. Although with his vision, no. it can't. No! <laughs> no! He doesn't see it. No, not yet. You have to wonder when that rush is going to... Oh, he's not moving it. This is one of these moments where he's even less likely to scout that now because when you're playing a game that's going this fast, you might look at that and be like, oh, he's like doesn't have that, so... Yeah, I mean, unless Dark... Unless the thought it crosses his mind to just send it to where the command center would be. Nice combination of vials and fungals, by the way. Send it to where the command center would be to kind of delay it from landing, which Dark finally does now looking at the mini map. So he is now at, at last aware of this 12th base, or 12 o'clock base, excuse me. All right, so he does find this, but Oof. a lot of minerals have been soaked up in the meanwhile. Yeah, the economy for Mara looking a lot better now than before. But the scary thing is Dark, although he's still sitting at this roach-based army supply, which kind of inflates the numbers a little bit here for Zerg. He's starting to get a lot of very critical pieces of the puzzle. He's adding in Infestors. He's getting Vipers now on the field. They're soon going to be very high on energy. Lurker Den just began. So he's working to eventually get off of this technology. And you got to think that some combination play with Vipers, Infestors, and Biles could get a lot of work done. But... Really, that's the only thing Dark is going for him. His economy, it's not in a fantastic shape. He's on 60 drones, only on four bases to the four base Terran, taking a fifth expansion now, and the creep spread is abysmal on his side of the map. Yeah, that's a very good point. The creep spread, I mean, it's not even connected between the bottom center base and the Zerg second base. And, you know, the creep a lot of times is what actually lets Zerg stay in the game uh, when Terran is pushing. The creep, you know, is sort of the saving grace. It's easy to miss when you watch the back and forth, but the Zerg can do so much more on that creep. Um, now, Maru, I think, has correctly decided to basically buy his time here because he knows he can max out, and the Zerg's unit comp isn't that ideal for a longer game. 
Yeah, and off creep, I mean, this composition for Dark is also really bad at breaking a Terran position. I mean, the only real attacking units that Dark can use in that kind of situation are the Vipers abducting siege tanks. Besides that, I mean, Roaches, they're going to get clogged up. They're going to be suffering from a lot of splash damage. Vipers and Infestors can get sniped. Fungal is not very good offensively. It's very good defensively or catching your opponent off guard. So Maru eventually is going to reach max supply here with a ton of ghosts on the field. Let's not forget how this started. This is Maru stuck on two bases with Anitis pressuring the main. Um, and now it's, you know, neck and neck, four base versus four base with Zerg just now having a fresh fifth, which may be picked off over here now. I mean, this is kind of ideal, uh, all things considered. The Zerg has to figure out how to uh, spend this tech uh, as well. Damn, he's so sick. <laughs> he even gets it. that, uh, yeah. yeah, Fester. It's a lot of energy used there by Dark, but it's still worth it in a bio like this. A lurker is in a macro hatch coming in. Spit base will get saturated soon. It's really an interesting composition that Zerg is working with at this point. And Roach Ravager, Infester, Viper, and now Lurker getting added in. Yeah. Not something you see that often. It's kind of a gradual tech away from the Roach Ravager here. And Dark's being smart to, to not just throw it in there because that's when Maro might have the opportunity to have a counter attack and actually come out and do a lot of damage. Yeah, but Maru is finally up to five bases and he's close to max as well. And considering the setup that he has, especially taking these final ninth and 10th gas geysers, he's gonna be feeling very comfortable with his position. I mean, now Terran really has all the resources they need secured to basically work into Ghost Mech, which, yeah, as soon as I say that, Maru throwing down three factories, switching into Liberators, vehicle, vehicle attack weapons level three. Vehicle attack upgrade level three. I don't know why that was so hard to say. Finally <laughs> completes for Terran. And, you know, Maru's just going to be content to kind of sit on this composition on his side of the map and just consume all the resources that he can. You know, and I, just try to play whack-a-mole with these auxiliary bases that Zerg's going to try to uh, establish. Yeah, after all the back and forth and all the short explosive games, and especially in TBZ, we're actually having uh, kind of the classic late game, really the longest matchup in, T in, in uh, StarCraft II, actually, is, is TBZ when we go into that macro phase. Yeah, and I don't see it ending anytime soon. Dark's composition is still very bad at actually engaging with the Terran offensively. It's good defensively if you're able to actually combination, you know, set up combos with the, the, the Lurkers and Files and Fungals and all that spellcasting jazz that Dark has at his disposal, but it's not very mobile. It's not good at breaching defensive positions. And here we're going to see uh, those Roaches and Ravagers that don't really have a lot of value try to find that value now. You're just um, trading them out. Yeah, and I mean, you could see Terran almost loses nothing. Yeah, Nuke's now being added into the mix. You can see he already had shift click down the creep tumors to come in and replace yeah. that. Uh, Terran looks like they want to both, exp they're actually both of the same idea. They're both trying to expand into the gold base. Mm -hmm. But Terran's actually going to begin that push down here. And we got to watch carefully because Roach Ravager not exactly great against what Terran has now. Yeah, and Maru can just kite off the creep. Yeah, I mean, this is probably the best possible engagement that Dark could get. So Spiles is actually going to connect with some big ghosts. Six or seven ghosts got taken out in one fell swoop right there. This yeah. is about the best engagement you could ask for. But still, you just see how much damage can be done to the Zerg, despite that great combination play with the Fungal and the Biles killing so many ghosts. At the end of the day, Dark still lost a ton of supply. It's very difficult for him to attack in. But Nidus Canals like this, they can absolutely change the game. Yeah. Uh, is is uh, Maro going to see this? You know, one problem is when you're, um, you know, I guess he's actually not maxed out. But sometimes when you are maxed out, you don't have any units to make that can kill this. I almost feel like Dark didn't expect this to get up because there's no units coming out of the Nidus yeah, Worm. Yeah, they both forgot about this. All right. There's like three roaches in there now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Maro overextending a little bit over here. At well, the right I mean, position, if Dark but... doesn't remember this, I mean, it's, it's like it never oh. happened. So I, I don't know what to say. Well, he's slowly filling it up with Lurkers and Roaches, which I'm sure are going to actually evacuate. Yeah, now yeah, finally coming go. in. 
to be a little bit problematic here for Mara to deal with. Keep in mind, Dark has a much more substantial oh, bank. Oh, this is funny. His opponent. Uh, are, are you sure about that? I don't. Hold on. Are you sure about that? That's the plan? Nuking the Nidus. Uh, I've never seen a Terran I've nuke their own base happen. like this yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> well, your depots die faster now. Do it again. Maybe, maybe we'll get this time. Yeah. More nukes. I mean, these vials are absolutely shredding the infrastructure right now for Maru. And I think, yeah, Dark's just like, yeah, that's that's enough damage. I'm happy with that. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm gonna I, go home. He could start to hit these other spots on the map. The lurkers come around in such an angle where the SCVs can never repair this if they do. Which he tries, they all die out. Yeah, mitigating the splash damage for the planetary fortress as well, so. Dark with some really nice plays there, and Maru's slipping a little bit on defense against that Nidus War. Now, like I say in every really long TVZ, we eventually got to start counting the bases left on the map. Dark has been, along with um, uh, Maru, you know, soaking up a lot of the resources on his side of the map. Uh, it is going to be a position where Dark is eventually going to have to be reaching pretty far to hold this. So, you know, it's not over till it's over. And if Zark, is it Zork? If, uh, <laughs> If Zerg doesn't do the job of finishing the Terran off, the Terran just sort of uh, eventually gets a few more resources and shuts the Zerg down. This is why this gold base is so important that we see being scanned here. He could just probably kill this outright before he can cancel. He does. Yeah, that gold base has gotten killed without canceling a couple times now. And Maru is just content to sit at home and remax yet again. It's still very difficult for Dark to actually find a way to attack in this, and his bank also isn't really healthy enough to just absolutely throw away units. You know, his army is so gas intensive that if you want to repop on a composition of similar level to this in terms of complexity, that's basically the entire gas bank that Dark has, if not more. Okay, so, I mean, <laughs> no home for this Liberator. He'll just keep going to the next spot. That's such a funny little dance they're doing over there. Now, another attack comes down here. And this one's going to, once more, kill that uh, important hatchery. I'd love to do a mineral check of what's remaining on, on both sides here. Another Nidus, by the way, I believe starts inside the main of Terran. Yeah, it has. I don't know if... Oh, he's not aware of this again. Okay, the tanks are turning around. Yeah, I don't think he can stop this, though, in time. Yeah, but I think it's empty. Okay, it doesn't matter. And still, it is opening up this avenue for Dark to continue denying this fifth base over down in the, the bottom right, but Mars also double expanding behind this. He's taking the expansion on the top left, and if that one goes up, it's going to be hard for Dark to actually take Maru off of a sixth base economy. Yeah, I mean, tension's going to keep building over here at the, the bottom right. Um, Terran Max is out again. It doesn't seem like there's a real Nidus threat that can be created. Uh, it looks like he, uh, Dark rather, is going to try to come up towards 12. I'm not clear. I think with a plan. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's oh, there's a, there, I'm sorry. There is a planetary. It's just not where the actual uh, minerals are. Now he does deny this, but like, look, there's actually not a lot of resources there. Whereas yeah. I think this place at the bottom right is, is much more important. So I think the counterattack that Dark wanted to use, it kind of didn't work because Terran could just ignore it or, or, or give it up. Yeah, the damage isn't that substan substantial, especially if Maru is able to... Oh, my God. Control Snipes. Yeah, that's so many ghosts. If Maru is able to completely control the bottom right quadrant of this map, that's three bases with basically one or two choke points that Zerg can attack into. And that's a ton of gas, a ton of minerals, because these are relatively fresh bases that Maru will basically have at his disposal. And if it goes to a truly split map situation, between Maru and Dark, I don't know if Maru's going to be, or Dark's going to be able to hold on, but... Well, hold up. He's going to try to push with these Lurkers. Oh, the snipes are so good, yeah, though. Yeah, the snipes, I mean, it, it feels like it's a fool's errand to try to come in at this moment, right? And now Dark has no gas. Yeah, that was a mistake. He's building four Hydralisks right now, and he has 500 more gas in the bank. That's yeah, basically that, it. That, that I think, is... is it's going to be a very, very, very typical now for, for um, Maru to be stopped as he tries to advance here. He's already denied the gold, and it looks like Terran might be able to take that. But it's the position just south of the screenshot here. I want to see if um, uh, Dark can defend that. I don't think he'll be able to. He has to basically remax on Lings, and that's also very lar very larvae. 
intensive. And Dark right now, he's at 300 gas per minute, basically. He's not going to be able to repopulate his army in any meaningful way anytime soon. So Maru just continuing to, to take down these bases with a composition that he has. I mean, almost pure siege tank ghosts. 15 siege tanks, 20 ghosts on the field. I don't see any way Dark's going to be able to break through this. He has to go for some big counterattack with these lings. And this is the story of late game ZVT and how Terrence kind of solved the matchup in, in creating or recreating what the paradigms of the matchup were really about. Um, and so 12 o'clock, I mean, Terrence is going to try to soak whatever he can from there. Here comes a big counterattack up into, I guess what we could call the mouth of all of the, you know, where the, the Terrence base is, right? All, all the reinforcements come out here, but it seems like easily so Maro just slides up here. And look at the gas right now that's banked up here for Dark. I mean, it's 200 gas. He's got 3,000 minerals, but like, you know, the Zerglings only go so far. Yeah, I feel like Dark is basically in his death throes. He's not even really repopulating these gas geysers at the top left or You're the right. bottom right. So that gas income, it's not getting better anytime soon. And I mean, he, he's stalling for time right now with these Lurkers, but it's such a tough position because the composition that Maru is running just absolutely shreds what Dark has. And if Maru, if he could see what we could see right now, he would just push for the win and there would be yeah. nothing Dark could do to stop it, him. And I think he's actually beginning to understand how broke Dark is because he just keeps seeing Lings repopulating from these auxiliary bases. And I think this counterattack is really gonna let Maru know exactly where Dark is at, which you know, is basically funny. desperation mode. It's hard to tell, and you know, you're like, are they done? Are they, are they not maxed out anymore? And we see this big counterattack coming up here. Now, this is a pretty scary counterattack. By the way, 12, uh, I'm sorry, 6 o'clock is gone. And this so, counterattack, yeah. It's getting infrastructure and it's getting some units, but there's just no way to kill this army. Even the cloak coming in here, yeah. adding insult to injury. And now Terran can basically roam all the way back up to the uh, top left and clean that out. Yeah, it's basically just Lings coming out from Dark yet again. There's 15 Hydras on the field, two Ravagers. And Maru is doing the smart thing. He's playing this very slow. He's not taking any risks. He knows that he's only two map wins away from another GSL championship. But he is in complete control of this game, I think, probably even beyond what he thinks his position is. Okay, I mean, another attack comes up over here. And again, look, yes, the Terran would like to keep the gold base, but the Terran can kind of function off less. Look at the Zerg supply here, 120. And... He doesn't even really have the, the Larva to remax. He has That's five Larva right now, four. Are well, you going to make eight Lings with that? You're going to make four Hydralisks? Um, Dark is just running out of time. Yeah, this is going to be it. This base goes down, and it, it really, uh, Dark taps out here. That's it, GG. Maru's up 3-1. to one. That was one hell of a TVZ, kind of the TVZ I think you and I are used to seeing, the long, dramatic uh, exhaust play from the Terran. Um, it seemed like there were moments where Dark had it, but he got, he got kind of stuck on Roach Ravager after, after the action calmed down, and he didn't really have anything to... to to do with those units, no way to extract value. And Maru was not gonna give it to him. Maru stayed back, stayed confident, and just let Dark sit on this, you know, obsolete unit composition. When Dark tried to trade it out, it was too late. Yeah, Dark not able to get the cost-efficient trades that he needed to set Maru back and then remax on something better. Dark instead just, as you said, bogged down with the Roaches and Ravagers for, you know, the, the majority of the mid game there. Yeah. And those units, coupled with Infestors, are very good at taking fights close to the Zerg's base. Very bad at actually breaching a Terran. And so once Maru was able to secure, you know, his fourth base and then eventually the fifth base, if you think back on how long that 12 o'clock expansion went unscouted from Dark. You know, maybe if he finds that as soon as it goes down, it's a different game. But Maru just able to establish a chokehold on his corner of the map, never let it go, and basically work his way up to a supreme composition. Here it is, guys. We're going to go to game five now. Dark needs to start the reversal. So far, unless Mono does a crazy strat that backfires, Dark manage, or sorry, Mono manages to crush it out. 
Let's hope for Dark Sea to start that comeback. Otherwise, tomorrow will be the seventh time GSL Code as champion. KZ Gaming, Dark. Onside Gaming, Maru. Yeah, man, I'm worried for Dark. I mean, he's looked strong, right? He's had his moments of real resilience, uh, of real ingenuity, but the issue is that at the end of the day, the Terran wins with the push. Unless Maro does that wacky, uh, you know, a worker pull. Ooh. I like that. It's a nice one. Didn't Dark say he's going to shave his beard if yeah. he wins? Yeah, he's going to look like that after this He's got to raise the blade higher. <laughs> those Ultralisk, uh, uh, I don't know what you call them. Blades? Yeah. What do you call those? They're like, it's like a crab. It's like a claw almost, but it's not. Mandibles? Man, that's probably it. Yeah. It's the best word. It is a good word. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Hard to play the game with mandibles. Yeah. This. Oh, my God. I forgot about this. Yeah, we talked about this in the interview. Dark said he would shave his beard. I think he said it if he won. Oh, it if he won? I thought that's what he said. I was kind of confused by that. I'm like, why would you shave? Oh, okay. Production corrects me if you won. Yeah, if you won. See, which now is you like... guys know where the pride in my beard is. I would never, if I won, <laughs> yeah. shave my beard. I'd be like, no, only in defeat. Yeah. Like something out of Game of Thrones, like cutting cutting your ponytail after a defeat That's in battle. That's my power is. It's like Samson's hair. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like with, with Dark, it's like he's going to shave his mustache. I'm like, what would that look like? And I just take my finger and cover up the screen. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I got it. It's also funny to me that he, he he said like he wants to he's gonna shave it if he wins, but he doesn't want to shave his beard. It's like, well, just then just like shave it if you lose. Yeah, bro. You gotta, yeah, yeah. Like you gotta motivate yourself. It has to make sense. It can't be a lose lose yeah. situation for yeah. you where like either you lose the GSL or yeah. you lose your beard. It's like, well, if I win this GSL, I'll take a shot of beer out of a shoe. It's like, well, that's an odd <laughs> that's an odd thing to do it's in like, victory. But okay. it's like, yeah, I really don't want to do it. I don't hope I don't win. Don't you have to like lose a bet to do that? <laughs> you know. Uh. Uh. Part of his championship ceremony, apparently, as production says. With. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just so. It's just an odd ceremony, right? Yeah, it, it certainly is. You give something up. Well, the way this game is shaping up, it seems like Mara going back to basically his tried and true. It's not exactly the same build that he had in game number one and game number two. Something maybe a little bit more akin to game number three in terms of de development, with the exception of the lack of a really fast third CC. Yeah, this is a, a pretty middle of the road build here. Wait, is that okay? That's a starport coming in. All right, for a yeah, second yeah, I was yeah. confused. I was like, "Wait, you're getting like is that two more barracks under construction? Yeah, like, what I'm is like, this oh, build?" Oh, this time Maru? it's gonna work, state. <laughs> we have a factory this yeah, time. Yeah, It'll yeah, work. Yeah. We'll have two hellions. This time he's gonna have, yeah, he's gonna have hellions there with the SCs, and he pulls them. No, this is um. Ah, uh, that's why I'm confused. Truly, the most middle of the road. Although he is gonna get a banshee with the tech lab. Okay, yeah. I thought he might get like um, a Viking to kill, clear overlords and, and then get a medevac or something. Yeah, this is a two-on-one. I was perplexed a little bit because normally we have two barracks on the low ground here for Terran, but Mar actually with a bunker here, sealing up the the ramp. Huh. I mean, bailing bust is a real possibility on this kind of map. Although it, you'd be hard pressed to find Dark doing that in like. Match point here, down 3 1 against right. Mario against a build that, you know, even if you go for a bailing bust, you'll get damaged up, but you won't end the game. Because the infrastructure is so powerful there for Terran. And we'll see exactly how this one's going to go. Dark is building nine roaches right now, a little bit more than I would expect to see at this stage in the game before adding on additional drones. We're just trying to play this a little bit safe. Yeah, so he's going to swap that out. We're going to have the double medivax on the way here. Um, like so many of the different openings Mario's had, I mean, there's so many different branches in the build. This is uh, more of a, a kind of generalized middle of the road uh, style. Now, the roaches are going to come across the map. Normally, the Banshee can help defend that. But as we already see, the Banshee's on this side of the map getting drone kills. So what exactly is going to be here to defend? 
uh, for Mario's sake. Yeah, no spore crawler. So four drones are going to fall. Some depots and add-ons almost definitely are going to be taken out here. Is that the play to let them in? Kind of an odd interaction. Yeah. It's like, you are trapped in here with me. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it, you know, it turns out to be fairly inconsequential. I guess the Banshee went down. I didn't see. Oh, did it? I think that's why, that's why the Observer's showing us that. Yeah, I'm not seeing it on the... I'm not seeing it on the minimap. It hasn't gone down. Yeah, yeah it's no, taken it's on out. the Units Lost tab, so... Um, now this drop's gonna come in after the Zerg has basically been pushed away. Five more roaches here for uh, the Zerg, and um, we're gonna have Ravagers come in here pretty soon. No way this drop's gonna work. And yeah, Dark's playing on a relatively low economy and quite safe at home with Roach Ravagers against these unupgraded Marine drops. Meanwhile, Maru going for a third command center back at home. Seems like only one engineering bay for Terran. So just plus one infantry weapons coming in. Dark, I believe, is going for double evolution chamber yet again. So his upgrades should be able to eclipse Maru at least a little bit in the mid game. Okay, a big um, push up here at the top. Keep in mind that, you know, with the third command center coming out late, Terran creates more opportunities to basically start to push and try to attack in early on. Um, Dark is really good in these kind of positions. I mean, this is sort of what Dark and, and Rogue out here basically figured out how to not die to, but Maro's going to go with that wow. style this time around. Nice snipe on the Ravager, dude. That was pretty sick. Yeah, you got the tumor as well. Some really nice picks there by Maro. This is one thing that the very top Terran players are just world class at doing is. Seeing engagements like that, knowing, okay, I can get exactly these units and then get out. And Maru's just been doing that all series. That's a pretty big drop, actually. Four, oh, that's a lot of Marines. Is this going to have plus one? It has plus one. Yeah, if Dark is out of position for this, these Roaches are not going to be able to defend. That hatchery is 100% going to cancel. Yeah, beautifully done. Quick snap uh, of the fourth base. I mean, really... Getting that value, that's a reset on the Zerg. Mm -hmm. Now the idea from the Terran's perspective is you, you keep roaming. You've got your third base up, you're looking. Okay, where's your fourth base gonna go next? I see a drone going to the top right, uh, and he's gonna expand there. The creep spread is pretty good, but also I think Terran could get up there and try to take that on. Yeah, Mara's been doing a good job of keeping creep spread under control here, but Dark has been able to recover to the best of his ability and Seems like Dark all the way across the map with most of his units. These four medevacs at the main base actually might get a lot oh, of damage done. He actually can unload even more over here. Yeah, he can. I'm surprised he I hasn't, actually. Yeah. Well, he's going to pick up anyways. Oh, Ooh. my God. I think he wasn't anticipating Dark being so far out of position that he yeah. thought he had to just evacuate earlier than otherwise. It, and Dark it, is really committing to the attack right now, Tasteless. You, you see the way these depots are set up? It's, it's a really cool A-move battery where the Roaches will hit that before they hit anything of consequence, and it allows free shots from the tanks. Rabbit is really coming in on both sides right now. These huge tank lines, they don't have a lot of support on the ground as the top two do get taken out by Biles. Bottom forces for Dark are pushed back. Third command center is yet to land again as Mario's gonna have to work his way back down. Dark's still sitting on only 65 workers. Only just now adding in more. Yeah, he, he's looking for more than what he got here. Yeah, a little wow, bit more. Look at this. Maro just backs up. Says, whatever, your fourth is late. He can go somewhere else. He's going to load back up. Yeah, he's going to drop in, try and defend here. And This is a cool style against this. The idea is you just turtle hard and, and, and accept the fact that, okay, you've got their fourth. It's. Almost impossible on Road Travager to break into a high ground natural with a bunch of tanks and Marines. Yeah. And he's going to try and kill at the top right. If he kills the top right, and in the meanwhile, he just like throws the command center somewhere, tries to um, mine up. Now, look at this. Yeah, this is going to go down. Yeah, this is really good. Not only is he going to get this hat through, but he's also forcing Dark back home with a lot of units, and that means that the pressure is going to be freeing up a little bit on Maru's side of the map. That should allow him oh to retake God. that third base. Maru is so good. He's just going to keep force canceling or killing these hatches. Dude! Dude! Yeah, Dark back on three bases. And now he's like, anyways, going to set back up again. I love the way that Maru's playing. This is so smart. That's yeah, really good. It forces the Zerg to go back. 
You know that they're overextending by trying to keep you contained in your base. And yes, you're sitting only on two, but you can stop them from taking a fourth expansion. And eventually, by doing that, secure your third base as well. Because Dark's already pushing back up this ramp, but now that Siege Tank count, it's a lot higher. Maru is aware of the threat that Dark is poising. And he should be able to hold on. With the Siege Tanks as far back as they are, it's a little bit difficult to keep this command center landed all the time. I wouldn't be surprised if we had a couple more lifts here with Dark continuing to pressure it, but overall, not a bad position for Maru. Yeah, you know, Maru, I, I, this is a little bit novel to me. I mean, I've seen a lot of TVZs, especially with, you know, the, the success of, you know, Zergs at GSL and the fact that Maru, like, has won so many finals, but this is kind of a new approach, is to just pull out, pull out of the third and sort of let the Zerg, as long as you've killed their fourth, you, you, you can kind of uh, milk this position for everything that it's worth. And you get the Zerg, the Zerg is just running around trying to catch up, trying to just find some kind of a location where they can maybe um, expand and start to, to um, you know, get the fruits of that expansion. Um, you know, and, and normally when the Zerg goes for a road Ravager, you get this massive supply advantage so that you know, Terran has to respect you. But if you turtle the way that Maru does, the Zerg is stuck on road Ravager, and eventually the Terran, look, Terran's almost maxed out. I think Terran basically has a better army. Yeah, absolutely, especially off creep like this. There's no creep spread really over here by the fourth base. The play that Dark is looking for right now is fungals paired with either, either Biles or Connections from those banelings, Dude, Vipers I, are on the field. I bet you he drops in the main here in a second if he wins this fight. Now again, just ditch the natural. Mm -hmm. Dark, it's so difficult for him to actually breach this position with the army that he's got. Oh he's my gonna god, go there's just no Whoa. way. It's a meat grinder to go through there. Yeah. Oh. oh no! Oh, that's a mistake. Taking a page from Cure, I see. <laughs> I, w I was getting flashbacks to MMA versus Indra yeah. with a oh, yeah, command yeah. center just not lifting up. All right, he's going to come out once more. All right, attack coming in on both sides here for Dark. Oh, Mainly connections, not very good. In fact, the Siege Tanks focused almost all of them down, and now Dark is going to have to re-max. I wonder what the energy levels are right now on the Vipers, on the Infestors. Infestors almost full on energy, but this is such a difficult position to break. Maru basically all in with this push. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, a moment where Dark, he's just, it's like he's running into a brick wall. He just can't quite get anything done. Keep in mind, if Terran gets control of right where the scan is, I mean, you can hit all of the Evo chambers. You oh. can cut off the, the uh, reinforcements. We see the Biles come down, but I see too many tanks remaining. Yeah, the tank count, it's so high. Dark is trying to remax to break out of this position right now. Tank count. Back down to about five over here at this position. Maru needs to break through. Dark's gonna come in yet again. Not a lot of support here for these Ravagers, just walking in to try and bile. And waiting for more reinforcements to come. The issue is the rallies out of the main. It's it's really difficult to try to get any, any setup. Now, one thing that Dark is doing a good job of is he's setting these Ravagers up here and he's sniping the tanks. Mm. By the way, Maru, you know, since he lost that command center, it's really all about just trying to uh, end the game right here, right now. I feel like Mark Dark might have just enough to defend, though, oh! Tasteless. I think Dark's done it. Yeah, the Fungals and Biles coming in. Whoa! So no matter how you do it, those Biles are not going to connect to those Metamax, <laughs> but yeah. Only AlphaGo can do that. I know, it's, it's wild. Um, okay, I think that actually Dark can have the kill here. GG, there it is. Wow. Gonna go to a game six. Damn, man. What a, what a game. What a, what a wild game. And we're starting to see this idea at play here um, where because Dark goes for that powering Ra Ravager Roach play, all that, uh, you know, Mara wants to do is basically, if Dark's gonna hit, he lifts the third base up, he pulls back. And he says, go ahead, try to hit me. I'm still macroing. I've still got a third command center for mules. I'm, I might try to land it somewhere else. And then he tries to take a fight. Now, it looked like he was going to win that, uh, or at least be close to it. But I don't know what's going on today. Terrans are, are losing command centers when they're taking damage. 
Yeah, the counter attack from Dark was really good. I feel like if he doesn't go for that counter attack, then Mars push absolutely just pulls him apart. But right. It slowed Mars' economy down enough that Dark was able to just kind of recollect his army back at home and slowly whittle down the Terran with Biles on those siege tanks. And you know, that really bought himself enough time to allow his superior economy to actually be able to overcome the reinforcements there from Terran. And once that siege tank count got low enough, then suddenly Dark could actually just breach that position, break through, and Mara was dead to rights. Yeah, it was, um, it was actually, I think, in some ways, our most interesting game out of this back and forth here. Uh, it's funny how it ended. Uh, you know, it's possible Zerg still wins there, by the way, um, you know, even if the command center lives. But because the command center died uh, or was destroyed, if command centers have souls, that, that debate is still in the air. <laughs> um, you just sort of have to go all in. If, if the third base is, is uh, still around, you can pull back and, and maybe drop in the main. You, you can send tanks somewhere else. Um, but losing the only resource location that's going to be uh, about anything in the future of the game, suddenly uh, <laughs> Maru uh, dies out. Now, it still looks like it's a series um, uh, Maru can take, but Dark is getting closer. Yeah, three to two now. Only two map wins away from... Not completing a reverse sweep, but getting close to it. Although, yeah. I got to say, I still am a little bit scared for Dark because Maru, his late game, is still so good. I don't see a way that Dark is going to be able to beat him in the late game. I feel like Dark needs to keep finding advantages in the mid game, like he did on that previous map, and just use that momentum to carry him to a win. Because Maru, as he showed earlier on in this series, if you let him get to five bases, he just feels unstoppable. And it does depend map to map. Some maps, it's easier for Terran. Uh, to turtle and then, you know, let the Zerg run out of resources and then just kind of poke the few exterior bases until Zerg that can't do anything. I mean, that was the game before the one that we just saw. Uh, other games, it's a little bit easier uh, and there's more distance. Um, but you don't have to play like that. I mean, that's what uh, is so great about StarCraft and RTS in, in general is that there are many different approaches you can take. We haven't seen Dark do a cheese yet. We haven't seen Maru do a proxy racks yet. There's a lot of other uh, things at play. Yeah. Um, the gap is really closing right now for Maru uh, as far as risks go, but he does seem to be a player that will not waver to do a proxy racks even when everything's on the line. Yeah, with two games left to play with, I wonder whether he comes through with a proxy racks right now here in game six because Could this be. is... If you go to it in game seven, you're really putting everything on the line when you're the superior late game player. And that's a risk I don't see Maru taking. It's something that we have had in GSL happen before. I'm thinking back to MVP versus Squirtle and my favorite yeah. ever GSL finals. The, the way it ended was GSL just finals. phenomenal. I mean, like, I was a Protoss player watching that playing full time and I got chills it with was the way nuts. MVP won it. But, you know, I don't think that Maru would do that same play given how good he is in the late game. TBZ. Well, also, Dark is pretty solid at dealing with right. rushes. I feel like, I maybe I'm wrong. I mean, this is just off the top of my head. I don't really remember Dark losing to too many rushes in, in years of casting him. He's one of the best players in the world at defending against them. I feel like he's one of the reasons why Terrans don't do that as much anymore. Uh, anyways, we're ready now to go into our next game. Could be the last, could be the second to last. Fingers crossed it is the second to last. Uh, as the finals of season two continue on, Dark versus Maru. Let's go. KZ Gaming, Dark. <laughs> Onside Gaming, Maru. All those medals on his shirt. Mm -hmm. Looking like a dictator in a banana republic. <laughs> GSL medals there. How many more does he need? Look at that. What is that? It's a lot. It's a lot. With that many wings on, you go right to the front of the airplane. <laughs> Talk to the captain. <laughs> you get to fly the plane. Oh, you get this yeah. for like for piloting a ship? What, 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 what do you do? Yeah, I don't know. Like, no, I just went Star Leagues. Yeah. Those are way harder than piloting ships. Here, take the wheel. Yeah, how many how many airline pilots are there in the world? How many GSL champions do we have? Yeah. That's a good point. 
Yeah, it's something to think about. And how many people have basically metaphorically crashed the plane trying to get to a GSL Finals? It's a lot. That's it's a, a lot, lot of plane crashes. It's a lot. Can the audience here so hype? So good to see some of you again. Uh, you know, season one, we didn't have an audience, which is, I, frankly, especially for me, really weird. It was kind um, of heartbreaking, honestly. Yeah, it was a bummer. I was... I was trying to use my world-class acting abilities to not act sad in we season sad, one. Though. Yeah, we were sad, <laughs> we, were we were crying depressed. inside. Um, but yeah, it's good to have an audience again and see you guys come down. Some of the, some people here for the whole season, you know. Um, and so it warms my heart to have GSL back here in the studio again. Yeah, and again, I just want to comment that it was the foreign community, especially their support of oh, the yeah. GSL that motivated Apreka TV to bring us back here into the studio. Yes. You know, that, that prize money, it's not, it's not, or the, the funds from Patreon and from Afrika TV with the balloons, they're not going to supporting the endeavors here. They're going directly into the players, but Player prize that pool. Yeah. outbreak of support that the foreign community showed onto the GSL That's is right. a big reason why we're back here in the studio. It's why we have a live audience. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you guys so much. We it's love been a fantastic you Fantastic season. We appreciate you guys. And Maru's going for, for a second, I got really far ahead of myself. I'm like, that's a third command center taste. We know it's oh natural my expansion. God. Fastest ever third CC. <laughs> He's going mad. No, sorry, sorry. That hasn't even started yet. No, I am. Um, my perception of time, I feel like is getting warped here. <laughs> well, that'll happen in a long day of GSL. I'll tell you from my own experience. Uh, by the way, the three Reaper uh, pressure's coming out here. We have a mm. queen coming down as well. Don't forget, we did see Maru actually get a kill on a queen. Not saying that's going to happen this time, but... You know, be ready for anything when Maro's uh, doing these kind of builds. Yeah, and I love the grenades just kind of zoning these queens away. By the way, that ramp. I think the fact that you can damage the hatchery like this with the Reapers is one of the reasons why this is actually a powerful build, is it fishes the queens back out. Mm -hmm. And yep. it's very easy to push queens away with grenades. Yeah, especially on oh. Creed. Go for plays like this one, too. He's going to come in, maybe get Drone or two. At least one's going to go down. Oh, nothing's going to die here. I think one did fall in natural. Oh, but did it? Okay. Yeah. Gonna get a second one. He's trying for it. Yep. Uh, three drones. This has been pretty good. I mean, I don't think you even mind Four losing drones, out the Reapers. As Maru, those Reapers, they did their job. That's their most. That's the most important stage of the game for them is getting the scouting information, damaging the third hatchery. Keeping the creeps right in check yeah. and killing four drones. Keep, wow. Keeping the queens from planting tumors there as well, in yeah. line with what you said with the, with the creeps spread in check. And um, this was third command center uh, pretty early on. It was spotted right away by the Overlord, but this is the uh, branch of the build that's had the most success here for Maru. Yeah, third CC. Game one and game two, we saw it with a Wood of Mine drop coming in. They did a ton of damage in both games. But here in game number six, Maru just playing a little bit more conservatively, going back to the Banshee tech again. Yeah, well, the Banshee's, you know, it's had its moments here. And um, I'm kind of excited to see how Dark's going to respond this time around. He's definitely been able to test uh, the waters with this build here. The Overlord's going to spot this, and it's going to get right back away. I don't think he can actually get the kill. Yeah, he has to pull out. Yeah, that dead airspace benefiting the Overlord. And Dark really in these last two games, especially getting so much intel from these Overlords. And the first couple of games of this series, game one, game two, game three, Dark had basically no meaningful information gleaned from his scouting Overlords on any of those maps. But in game number five, he got a little bit of extra info, was able to make some more intelligent, more informed decisions as a result of that, eventually work his way up into a victory. Here in game six, now he knows exactly what Maru is going for. Same story. Yeah, the question is, how exactly does Dark want to uh, deal with it? So far, his approach has been to ramp up uh, into Roach Ravager. And Maru's response to that has basically been to disengage right when it's at the climax or, or, or the supply peak, I guess you could say, um, of the Roach Ravager, as he says, oh, you're going to come at me? That's fine. We're going to pull away. I'm going to invest in the you know real late game comps like uh, Medivac Marine Tank, and I'll see you in endgame. And I think to Dark's frustration at times, he's not able to take the fight. I mean, think about this, guys. How many times do you see a Terran on three base that sees the Roach Ravager that just lifts off and backs up? Not very often. Normally, they stay and fight and trade out. 
Mario goes, oh, no, I don't even do that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the genius here. That's a lot of patience and a lot of smarts, too, because every single time that has happened, he's been able to pull the circle apart a little bit on their side of the map with drops and buy himself the space that he needs and the time that he needs to actually secure that third base position permanently. And we'll see if Dark decides to go for the same kind of play here. You know, it's kind of been his uh, modus operandi going for roaches and ravagers and then just trying to break down that third base. But already in this game, a higher drone count for Zerg, 74 in total. Maru's already going up to a fourth command center as well. Might be gearing up for a later game again, Tasteless. I think this is going to be a long one. I mean, I guess first and foremost, we got to see, you know, because it, it seems like um, a Dark's strategy is going to uh, activate itself earlier on the map, right? Maru's just continuing to sweep. He's trying to control these uh, periphery parts of the map, like this place right north of here. And if, he, if there's no hatch, he just kills, um, you know, uh, creep tumors. If he can't get in the main, he'll try. Um, but, you know, right at this moment in the game, it's where the supplies look even until it's just suddenly not, assuming that Zerk commits to Roach Ravager. Really early high for Dark, by the way. Actually got the high part started before mainling speed, which is not something you see very often in yeah. ZBT. And, you know, he is going for Roaches here at the beginning, but that is not, I think, the end game plan. He's getting plus one melee attack. I think the Roaches are just kind of a stopgap to handle this kind of defense and maybe get Maru playing a little bit more conservatively because he has been greed checked in a way by these Roach Ravager max attacks over the course of the series. Whereas Dark, I feel like this game, he's focusing a little bit more on Ling Bang Ling. He just hasn't gotten there yet. And so I like the, uh, the play to basically create tension on either side of the map. Mm -hmm. This forces Zerg to basically have enough at the top, enough at the bottom, that you can't really attack in, into the actual direct expansion over here that Maro's, that Maro's third base that we were talking about here. And you're going to find opportunities like this, because on this map, you know, after the bases Zerg already has, everything else kind of sucks to take. There's yeah. the base in the middle, and it's like, that's the most outward-facing base. Could he get closure and kill this hatchery? No. Not with so many roaches and ravagers chasing. But. Yeah, it's like we find out there were just two more Reaper hits on that hatchery from earlier. <laughs> this one finally goes down. Yeah, it is very difficult for Dark to actually take an additional base here. In the bottom left, yeah, the top. I mean, the top one, you might think that it looks safe because of the proximity to the main base and the third base. But it's a position that's very difficult for Zerg to actually establish creep because it's usually such a high focal point for Terran and controlling creep spread. And you know, it's also a path where Medivac's going for a drop there can also work their way into the main base. So Zerg needs to prepare for both those eventualities, which means you know, if a drop comes into the bottom left, Zerg can just kind of send everything that's in that vicinity to deal with that drop. But then to the top left, it's a little bit more complicated because Terran has those other options. So, I mean, we, we just wait. We're at that moment, Zerg is maxed out, but Terran is really in a healthy supply position. <clears throat> this is going to be a lot more of a different game. A lot more, by the way, of a passive game in general, just basically the uh, the Zerg expanding or trying to expand more and more, and the Terran kind of stopping it. The Nidus network is on the way, although I don't see... Oh, no, I do... I'm sorry. I see an Overlord actually just below the Terran's main that could make a Nidus network there. Yeah, I feel like the aggression is about to really ramp up here for Dark. He went for this extremely fast hive timing to get Adrenal Glands, and now that 2-2 is about to finish for melee attack and ground carapace, it's going to be one of the biggest power spikes in the game for Zerg, plus that Nidus Canal. So, are we coming in here to the oh, triangle third? He's going to target down this hatchery. That's a big catch. That's sort of a hatchery we just don't ever imagine will be killed off. Terran can easily remake that. And remake that actually a lot faster than that hatchery can can be rebuilt and start to to do its job again. Yeah, I think uh, Maru is starting to respect the adrenal lings coming in right now, researching blue flame as he recognizes he needs some more sustained AOE damage on the ground. But Tasteless's attack coming in will be enough to break. Uh, this is a lot, and I see Banelings continuing to spill down here. But the further we pan out, the more tanks I spot at the same time. And it seems like right before it looks like Zerg is going to bust in, the Terran has enough sustain that Zerg has to run back out as a command center 
lands, Morrow continues to grow. Double Spire now in production. 80 Lings just finished morphing on the Remax here for Dark. Seems like he might be eventually gunning his way towards Broodlords here as a way of trying to bust it out. And he really has to make something happen while Maru is only on five bases. If he can try and break through either in the center or in the top right, that'd Dude, be a big win for him. And here comes the Ninus he again. He doesn't see it. He doesn't see it. Oh, the Stim Marauders. I thought they were going to go Marauders to the Ninus, but no. They're like, oh, no, a Ninus run. Yeah, they're panicking. I mean, this is exactly how you get pulled out of your position here. It's just Lings. It's actually, honestly, the bare minimum. <laughs> yeah. The draw tearing out, but he has to then use this imbalance to hit somewhere else. And so it's going to be over here just through the sensor tower. Dark is on 90 drones, though, so not a lot of room for army supply. Also, not yet maxed, as he is banking a considerable amount of resources for this double spire. Yeah. And so, I mean, Terran isn't really destabilized by this. No. That being said, Zerg is getting to get Zerg side of the map. In fact, literally every base on the Zerg side of the map, if we were to draw a line right from the 12 o'clock spot directly down through 6 o'clock, Zerg's got. Doesn't mean they're going to keep it, but Zerg kind of uh, reached the, the, the zenith of map control on their side. And so, you know, it's funny, these Ninus networks and the dozen links that come out that seem so inconsequential, in fact, have massive implications for the position now that Terran's in. Now, that being said, we kind of know the song and dance of what Terran want to do. They want to just poke these bases, like this one out here, while expanding to their side of the map. And since Zerg always are expanding, um, and, and consuming, you know, they have to be expanding ahead of the, the Terran, ahead of the Protoss, too. They end up mining out their resources first. And a lot of times, as Terran, you know, get their one to two last bases, they happen to also be the one to two last uh, resource nodes in the entire map. Uh, and so we're going to see this play out again, it looks like. Yeah, Maru is gunning for that. And efficiency, cost efficiency with your army really reigns supreme in the late game. And Terran players have gotten so good at navigating it perfectly with Ghost Mech and, you know, some accompaniment of bioplay with Medivax to try and snipe down these bases on the periphery sides of Zerg. Now, Neural Parasite is coming in here for Dark. I got to say, he's in a much better position going for this ga late game than he was earlier on in the series. He's got a considerable bank. He's already secured most of the map. His creep spread is fantastic. And it feels like he has a lot of options. Does one Marauder beat this, by the way? I actually don't know the math. I don't know either. We're going to find out. I think if it stemmed fully, it would have. That's kind of a funny thought, where it's like, maybe you should just leave a Marauder on each side of your main, and you'll never have this happen to you. Yeah, you got to stem him, so you still have to keep your eye out. But yeah. It didn't like seem like that one, one did, though. Did, it did I think it stemmed, and then it ran out of the stem. OK. I think. I think we're just going crazy. So, um. You know, here it is once more. We had 12 o'clock po uh, poked out. Now the, the fight's over at 6. The Banes come in. The Terran kiting is real. I can't always tell what's underneath all these medevacs. It looks like there's actually um, just enough for Terran to continue the fight onward. Yeah, most of the units that Terran lost there are the easily replaceable Marine Marauder. Right. And it, really, you're o it's weird to say. You, you never want to lose anything needlessly, but you're OK trading out Marines for Banes. Absolutely. I mean, gas is the more valuable resource almost always in StarCraft. Um, and just, you know, if you trade out one Marine for one Bane, you know, or, or two Marines for one Bane, but ideally the number's low, over time, the Zerg has not gotten the value they need out of the gas. Despite, you know, it's funny, despite the Baneling being the best unit pretty much in the game for early on value. Yeah, I mean, it all, it all comes back to cost efficiency. And Dark, is that give me enough families? No, he's going to go for the, for the SCVs. And Lings, maybe with Adrenal, will be able to finish this one off or at least get it close to burning down. And I like that move from Dark coming into the 12 o'clock position, knowing that Maru is out of position at 6 o'clock. And now this is where all of the bank for Dark went. A lot of Broodlords morphing in, eight in total, four more Corruptors also underway. And, you know, it, it's not it's obvious why you know, Broodlords are strong units, but it can be in this uh, this type of game, the weaknesses also become extremely 
uh, you know, outline. Because while the Broodlords, you know, create more material on the board for the Zerg to fight with, uh, they're not mobile. I mean, by design, they're actually fairly immobile. And so this is where drops and counterattacks uh, come into play. Now, with all that in mind, um, Terran hasn't really claimed their side of the map. Here's exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, never mind. I thought the Broodlords were still on the move here. Yeah, we'll be able to intercept this drop. The idea is there, but you got to wait for the Broodlords to not be there. But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Terran's got plenty of gas, plenty of minerals in the bank. Zerg's yep. trying to expand into these uh, locations. Yeah, Thor is now coming in. Um, Dark is investing so many resources, by the way, into these Broodlords that you know, he really has all of his eggs in one basket, so to speak. Four Infestors, two Vipers, 11 Broodlords on the field. With more Broodlords and more Infestors joining as well. So for Dark, he basically needs to win with a composition that he's running right now. He doesn't have the gas needed to remax on an effective army should he lose these key units. We saw that happen earlier on in this series where Dark wasn't able to trade cost efficiently. Eventually he only had minerals and although his mineral bank was quite large, I mean, Zerglings with Adrenal Glands and 3-3 upgrades do not stand a chance against Ghost Mech, not by any means. So it's gonna be paramount that Dark navigates this as cost efficiently as possible. He has to start matching the Terran in terms of that efficiency. And a lot of games up to this point when the Zerg doesn't do this perfectly, it looks like Zerg's winning until you look down and you go, oh, they don't have any more minerals or gas, or they just right. have only one of them. Um, and a lot of times it's just minerals. And, you know, it's funny, that idea that we saw earlier where Terran Turtles on two bases, it's kind of the same idea only in Endgame, where the Terrans just, you know, it, you know, the advantage Terran has is that they can flow buildings, right? Yeah. And so, and you know, the other alternative thing is a planetary, which just also is a lot to kill off outright in a fight. Yeah, but you're right, the, the logic is very much the same there for yeah. Terran. Scar Scarlet calls it camping. Camping, yeah. <laughs> which is truly what it is. You're just playing defense back at home and trying to work your way up to basically a perfect army composition, although Mara getting a little bit ambitious, trying to abuse yeah. the immobility that you highlighted earlier of the Broodlords. Well, he's able doing to pull it. Him apart. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is just as you predicted. Two hatcheries now going down. Or maybe I not. I think you said excuses. for a second, Team Hatchery. I'm like, no. well, I don't, I'm like, I don't know who's on Team Hatchery right now. But, <laughs> uh, can oh, actually, the snipes. Woo. Oh, he's still chasing the Broods. Yeah. Wow. Surprised he hasn't shot that hatch yet. All right, there we go. Closure at last. Yeah. And this is a lot of immobility coming back to haunt Dark here. EMPs over here. Now, remember that we were talking about Terran trying to get their periphery bases. Well, now Zerg has to reclaim theirs. Yeah, Dark's in a lot of trouble. Also, normally when Zerg wins games like this, it's because they've won something like three fights in a row. They've smashed a position. Terran was badly weakened. They, they came in again and crushed it. And then right when Terran would try to come out once more to reclaim the periphery bases, the final killing blow is there. That requires a stacking of resources that's probably the most dramatic stacking you see in StarCraft. And when you kill these periphery bases, you can't quite stack the resources like that. Yeah, what Dark needs to win this game is a massive fungal on clumped ghosts followed by Banelings just crashing into them because if the Ghosts are taken out of the equation, Zerg can actually stand a chance against this army, but should one more fight go Terran's way in a meaningful manner, I feel like this game is pretty much done, despite both players still being maxed, despite Dark having a considerable gas bank. No, I mean, this is... You can look at the fights, but really it's like you have to look at the board, right? Right. And, and the okay. position is too hard. Zerg coming in right now. Infestor is trying to get connections there on the Ghost. You can see Mar really prioritizing defending the Ghost above all else right now. All of the Infestors get EMP'd, and although the mech from the Ghost mech was destroyed, the Ghost count remains high at 14. I think no Ghost actually going down in that engagement, so... Mar now going to add in more command centers. And keep in mind that the economy right now for Terran, not only is it ahead in workers, but it's ahead in bases that yeah. can mine efficiently, so... Even though that trade was, you know, just visually, it seemed like it was relatively break even in terms of efficiency, Maru does have the better repop potential. That's right. That's exactly right. 
uh, you know, some games end really fast, others uh, end extremely quickly. This one seems to be like one that could end in a kind of uh, very drawn out death from the Zerg. Not saying that Dark can't win, by the way, but Zerg needs a win. And when I say a win, I mean a win in one of these battles, one of these positions. Zerg has basically lost four or five fights in a row. And the only time that Zerg has, in air quotes, won is when he killed off what Terran had already, a, a, a group of units that had already uh -oh. accomplished the mission. Worst time's coming in. The space once again getting denied. Dark, as you look at the minimap, is gunning for a counterattack here. At the 12 o'clock, I'm sure we'll get a shot of that in a moment, but Maru for now just continuing to push this position. Not a lot of accompaniment for the Broodlords. And Dark actually getting good damage done, but that means that Maru can continue to push. He is not going home. Okay, another attack comes up here. This one could actually hit both the bottom left and the base north of this. Now, at the same time, in a yin and yang of position, we see Dark at the top right. He's gonna demolish that position. I'm actually, we gotta do a big check on what is actually a place that can be mined from. They might be even on spots that can mine. Although the pockets are, oh, oh. my God, the Broodlords almost went in that. Oh my God, it would've been insane. Yeah, that was very close. Solar would have lost those brood lords. <laughs> 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 All right, so Mara's gonna have to repopulate the top right section of the map. Now Zerg's got 270 minerals. Yeah, Zerg. Basically, what you see is what you get on the board right now. Zerg uh, has 47 drones. You know, any tradeouts you can get are gonna be worth it if you're Terran. Yeah. He's gonna wrap back around now. Remember, Terran can kind of bide their time and wait for a safe moment to take the command center. And I think we're going to see uh, in the next few minutes here, Maru not just throw a command center at every spot that, that he can. I think he's going to be very conservative with doling out the next few command centers. Yeah, I think Almost he like knows. their extra lives in a video Ooh. game. Mr. Burrow here, that scan does catch it. Oh, damn. The, good, the instinct is there. By yeah. the way, you probably don't need mules right now. Scans are probably more of a valuable tool than mules. Absolutely. Con confirm the safety of your positions as you sweep. Pick him yeah, up. He's doing the exact thing that you described, continuously scanning these positions every time he moves forward. And the counterattacks for Dark, they're, they're good, but he has to beat this army. He just has to. Yeah, now, this is an overextension. Broodlord's going down. Go. Only Lots eight of, of them are left. There's, There's so, many so many ghosts. ghosts. Oh, the ghosts just do too much. The snipes come down. It is a massacre, and I think that may very well be game. Dark has fallen. Maru has finally broken through and is on his way to a monumental oh. seventh GSL championship. GG! Maru has won his seventh GSL. My goodness, Mar just playing out of his mind right now. There really is no better Terran player in the world. You can see the grin on his face. I choked. <laughs> I choked on the GG. It's the GG that almost killed Tasteless. My God. What a series. Maru proves again. Nobody understands the Terran race, especially against Zerg, quite like he does. Fantastic performance from start to finish here from Maru. I mean, thinking back to the semifinal, he was so close to being eliminated in the top four, but at the end of the day, he emerges victorious yet again here at the GSL. I gotta say, really an inspiration the way he played today. Not only did he recover in such a crazy fashion, uh, oh, hold on, we're gonna go to the interview right now. He's announcing the champion once more. I personally am wondering how how it's possible Caster Park got down there that fast. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> so, you've done it. You were on the verge of elimination. But you made it to the finals. And now you're the champion. The seventh time champion.
You now have gotten three consecutive titles. How do you do it? How do you feel? I thought today was going to be very difficult. I just tried to focus and zero in on game to game. It paid off. From 2010 and over the 13 years, you've been consistently been improving. What is the motivation behind your success? Was it the fans? Last season was online, and we only had offline matches. But from season two, the audiences are back, and that really inspired me. And so that helped me greatly. Any words to the fans and the people that helped you? I'm very touched uh, by the fans that came down to the studio and all the people around the world who supported me. It was packed in the studio today. Throughout the season, there are so many fans that have donated and supported the GSL. It's almost close to 30K. Is there anything you'd like to say to them, the people that have supported this prize pool? I never thought that number would go so high. I want to say just thank you so much. Express my gratitude. Let's get dark out here. You put up a great fight, Dark. It looks like your beard lives to see another day. How are you feeling? It was a close matchup. I'm glad my facial hair stays another day. So, I guess I prepped, but my execution wasn't quite there. But uh, I struggled in this matchup. I'm optimistic for season three. I hope I can come back and, and return in better form. Uh, things are going fast. He's saying, can, can, they, can you keep destroying the Terrans in your way? And she says, yes. Um, but this final was, was obviously very tough for me. All right. Congratulations to both players. It's time for the award ceremony. And that can only mean one thing, State. Big checks. Oh, yeah. Sometimes big, but you know, I think this season's kind of average size trophies. And sometimes flowers. The flowers are a must. The flowers are a must. We all know that, you know, men don't receive a lot of flowers. Gamers love flowers. And there's really not many appropriate moments to just give a gamer a bunch of flowers. But when you win a GSL, it's like. Get the pots out. Absolutely. Get the water out. And open the curtains because we got to keep these plants alive. So I want to see. Do we have plants this time? All right, runner up first. Now I just want to keep be clear. I don't know if the runner up usually gets plants. Yeah, right? no plants for the runner up. It, this is, you know, some people say that you know all tournaments, it's like everybody gets a trophy and plants. It can't be like that. <laughs> this is uh, Mr. Che, the head of esports here at Freaky TV. Uh, Caster Parks, he says, do you have any words you want to share? He says, this is what a GSL Finals is all about, showing amazing matches. So GSL has been here for so long, almost 13 years now. I've been here since G with GSL since day one. I believe many of you guys have been there since uh, day one as well. I feel like now it's 
it's like it's not just the fans uh, i'm sorry not just the production staff and the players it's really it's family it's like we're all a big family we've all been through this together all right we're going to announce the season two champion uh, what is really like what season like I don't know 48 now I don't even know we've had so many seasons it's crazy and he gets the flowers he gets plants and a big check he'll go to the bank he'll try to cash it they'll say that's not a real check oh we don't see what kind of flowers it is but we gotta trust yeah, you gotta rotate the flowers yeah that's okay it really is about that check and so, for this season, it's the trophy. Get ready, get your trophies out. Get your trophies, get your trophies out. ready. Oh, that's right, none of you guys have them. Yeah, I guess not that many people went GSL. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, so, where's Mario? Oh, he's on the other side of the stage. All right, so we've got another special guest who will help us in this award ceremony. The co-CEO of Africa TV. He was uh, responsible for the big surprise that we had the audience back in the studio. Oh, thank goodness. <clears throat> Ryan does, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so you brought this back to the studio. Do you have any words to share? I'm so happy to see all of you again. It was that other finals before in the Coliseum at Jamshil Station. I was really happy to see all your faces uh, and see you react. I believe there's uh, two or three months off till season three. Uh oh, spoilers. <laughs> uh, there's a big tournament coming up in Saudi Arabia. I want to wish you guys the best of luck down there. And I hope uh, maybe some of our GSL players can bring home the trophy. Thank you for your support. All right, well, would you guys come to my uh, my stream and ask me when the next season is? Watch the end of this VOD. <laughs> All right, guys, it's time to bring Maru out and give him the GS7 trophy. GS7. Just a normal trophy. We sat on the G5L for a long time. All right. Another pin. Another pin. You know, you're going to have to get that tailor-made so that it doesn't, you know, sag on one side. Yeah, you're going to need, like, a patch or something, too, to support the fabric. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. heavy. Or maybe we need to start putting pins, dare I say, on the other side of the shirt. Oh, no. Oh, my. You're a real banana republic. We're going to start getting armbands on there, you know? <laughs> oh. Oh. Every time it scares me. I never learn, state. Oh, what a great tournament. Yeah. And really oh. a great finals, too. Confetti in the lights, too. Did you see that? Glad I don't clean up the studio. Mario. Like, yep, I know what this is like. <laughs> Mario, are you going to cry in the finals? Mm, probably not. Another day in the office. Yep. As Maru stares out into the audience and says in his mind, this is normal to me. <laughs> All right. Uh, the trophy. Here we go. Now, there's one thing Maru has also done more of. It's Kiss GSL trophies. And so that's going to be it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for another season. It makes me so happy to have um, the audience back here in person and, you know, the support online. Uh, I think if I don't know, I don't believe ASL has been announced yet, but that is around the corner, the official dates for that. So uh, during the off period, we encourage you to tune in for that. The sister tournament uh, for the StarCraft 2 tournament, ASL, the StarCraft 1 tournament. So do check that out. Excellent work, Casting State. You have killed it.
Yeah, my throat was a little bit uh, shot. As He's I, a it's, it's much, it's much worse now than it was at the start of the no, day. He but was crying when Mario won. That's why he's all choked up. Oh, exactly. He's he's like, like, why are you gonna out me like seven. that, tasteless yes. man? I can't. Um, GSL season three starts October third. Okay, looking forward to it. Yeah, mark your calendar. See you there, guys. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Check out ASL, and we'll see you on October third for GSL season three of 2023. Bye bye. time.